Recording in progress. David, if you're speaking, you're muted. Al, can you hear me? I'm going to try my microphone. Sure. Now I can. Yeah, the, the Zoom user room was muted for a, a bit. Okay. Al, you hear me now? I can, thank you. Okay, very good. So, Helen, you have a question regarding the consent agenda? I do. Um, the question, um, I'm in favor of it, but I'd just like to understand how they're going to do the student trip to both the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Whitney Museum in one day, unless they're going to see one thing in each. There's, I don't know if anybody knows the answer to that, but I just sort of question that they're on two different sides of New York. I think it would be kind of hard. Well, it's happening in may maybe you can come back to us with an answer All right. thank you <laughs> so would someone like to move the consent agenda helen moves it suzanne seconds steven your vote epstein suzanne yes andy yes helen yes sarah yes valerie yes natalia yes mariah and i also vote yes that brings us to the student report with Ms. Clevis. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Perlman, and uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Laura Clevis, and I'm your uh, school committee student representative, and I hope folks are doing well. Um, I'd just like to get ahead of myself by saying that the support will uh, sadly not feature a video. I'm just as dismayed as you all are. Unfortunately, the topic of my report, student attitudes towards ninth grade deleveling, doesn't lend as well. It doesn't lend itself as well to a video format, so we'll be going old school for this one. Um, in any case, I guess I should provide context as to why I picked this very particular, very contentious topic. Uh, it's fair to say that the discourse surrounding ninth grade deleveling is largely dominated by parents. And while I have nothing against the role that parents play in their children's education, I think it's very important. I think that teachers and students should have their viewpoints adequately represented as well. And so I sought them out for the sake of this presentation. So I'd like to preface the bulk of my findings by commenting on how I gauge student attitudes towards deleveling. This Monday, I sent out a survey to the Canvas pages of all four grades at BHS. And at time of writing this report, I have received 362 responses. Of the total number of respondents, 30.9% of them were freshmen, 25.4% 25 25 of them sophomores, 23.8% of them juniors, and 19.9% of them seniors. I'd also like to acknowledge the limitations of my survey. For one, my data set was skewed. I did not ask all respondents what level English they took, just freshmen. Of ninth graders, 74.5% were current honor students. And as for the rest of the student survey, I do not know what their ninth grade experience was. Based on the open responses, I believe that a significant number of students, roughly a third, also took honors. All this to say that what I gathered from the survey does seem to represent the feelings of students who may have taken or who are currently taking honors English, which is not a perfect representation of the entire school body. Secondly, the equity component behind the shift is also important to address, and while I think doing a race breakdown would have provided very valuable data, um, I don't think it's prudent of me to be asking my peers how they identify racially to then draw a conclusion that may or may not be accurate. In any case, I will be addressing the equity aspect behind deleveling further on in the presentation. Despite the limitations of my survey, I still think there are some valuable insights to be found within my data. A concern I think many have is that in an unleveled course where students can opt to complete assignments of varying levels or difficulty, students will be less likely to push themselves and to take a harder option. My data says otherwise, with an overwhelming majority of students saying that they would choose either a just right option or a challenging assignment over an easier assignment. I also learned that many students found unlevel course options appealing primarily because they accommodate more diverse learning styles, reduce pressure from parents and peers to take all honors or AP courses, and allow students to get to know other peers they wouldn't have otherwise had they taken a leveled course. 
This, of course, didn't mean that students had no issues with potential deleveling. Many cited boredom, slow course pacing as a detriment associated with taking an unlevel course, saying that taking away the liberty to choose your own course level is contradictory to, to one of the school's core values, which is um, freedom to, to choose and, and to, um, you know, take initiative over your own education. Certainly, students surveyed had mixed feelings of their own regarding the reimagining ninth grade initiative. And while this is the case, and I completely respect the opinions of other students at my school, I also feel the need to highlight the intent behind these courses, as well as how students gauge their students' attitudes towards unlevel courses like WISP. So for this, I talked to social studies teachers Stephanie McAllister Poon and Sarah Schuster, who were behind the effort to de-level ninth grade world history in 2019. The idea came about after a series of discussions with elementary school teachers over concerns with the eighth to ninth grade transition process, recommendations, and racial breakdowns of certain course levels. Schuster McAllister, alongside many other teachers, visited different school districts like Lexington that have unleveled ninth grade history programs and read scholarship on unleveling. And after determining that unleveling is quote unquote pedagogically sound, they wrote a grant to do summer training with a project based learning institute to design curriculum, besides getting a time release plan to build and plan what would become the WISP course. Then, after spreading the word to parents at an eighth to ninth grade transition parents' night, they rolled out the course during the 2019 to 2020 school year. This, of course, I'm sure the school committee knows, but just for parents who are watching, I think it's important context. The course utilizes differentiated instruction, is project based, and core texts are tiered as mild, medium, and spicy, and are built in with supports like glossaries. Teachers determine who is recommended for a standard or honor 10th grade course through conversations with students who self-report the course they want to take in conjunction with teacher feedback. Having anticipated criticisms about the course, McAllister and Schuster rejected the insinuation that an unleveled history course wouldn't challenge advanced learners and that students quote unquote tread water for a year doing nothing in WISP. In years past, Schuster said 70% of the freshman class was enrolled in honors history, which made for a heterogeneous learning environment. And as a result, course concert was, as they put it, watered down. Now, McAllister asserts the course is, quote, designed to find all the different places where kids can climb. And so there's a lot more challenge built in because it's designed to reach more different types of learners. Schuster adds that when surveyed, the bulk of her WISP students report feeling appropriately challenged by the course, satisfaction with the course, and that the course doesn't feel different compared to other level classes. This may, however, not be enough to assuage parents' concern about the potential impacts of deleveling as it pertains to their children's futures, which is a valid concern. And to that end, I will be providing my own anecdotal experiences, having been enrolled in WISP alongside many other ninth graders four years ago, all ninth graders for that matter. I recall liking that there were students in my class with different academic strengths, and I felt as if I could learn from everyone in my course. I also recall liking that I could push myself to complete assignments at a level that challenged me. Halfway through the year, I was recommended for Honors World History, a course I would go on to do well in. I was recommended for APUSH, a course I would similarly succeed in for the half year I was in it. And I currently take AP Human Geography, and while I might have not done as well on my last test on agriculture, I think I've done a solid job in the course. And to parents who are concerned about deleveling impact in college transcripts, uh, transcripts and college applications, I'm fortunate to say that I will be going to what is considered by many to be a pretty good college in the fall. And I know that many peers and friends of mine who are majoring in the humanities are also going to really great schools. My personal experience is that WISC gave me the freedom to pursue and accrue knowledge in a subject area I was passionate about, and that that passion translated to success in history courses over the course of my high school career. It's fair to say that we're all here because we care a lot about our school district and our students and their futures, but from where I stand, I think that teachers and department heads do as well. This is not some sort of wanton, impulsive effort meant to hurt ninth graders. If anything, it's intended to benefit them. Our educational system, as I'm sure we are all aware, is already afflicted by massive inequities, making it harder for students of color, low-income students, students with disabilities, ELL learners, and the data is out there. And it asserts that the public school of Brookline are, are not serving all their students to the fullest extent possible. This effort is years in the making and is attempting to remedy this issue. And faculty at BHS have given this move immense thought. All of this to say that having the right information is incredibly important in conversations like these. And instead of resorting to mudslinging, we need to consider the perspectives of multiple stakeholders who will be impacted by this decision. I can only hope that my report manages to provide the school committee with more perspectives to highlight these a bit better and will contribute to a more nuanced understanding of deleveling. Thank you all and good night. Thank you, Ms. Clevis. Any questions, comments? All right, we'll, oh, Natalia. 
I just wanted to say a, a real huge thank you. This was really helpful, but I did have a question. You said you had 300 plus respondents, which is fantastic. Did you ask the very simple, like, are you in support or not in support of deleveling? Because in your, your beginning, you get you said the majority, or I think you said the majority of students sort of expressed positive um, thoughts around. Um, I, I don't know. I just want I, don't, I just want to make sure that did you do any quantitative analysis or was it all qualitative of the responses? So I did think about trying to include a question that would gauge whether or not students were pro or, or against this move, but ultimately I decided against it, and I'll tell you why. It's because um, I think that already presents a bias in and of itself. I wanted to gauge attitudes, and I wanted to gauge um, levels of satisfaction in, in an objective manner. Um, I, I know that from talking to other people, um, many other school districts find that um, students may not report feeling um, like directly in favor of this move, but that they, they are doing better and that it's better for equity results. So um, it, like this person said, um, it was actually uh, Mr. Ehrenberg. Uh, it's kind of like a big vegetable, you know? Um, and I kind of wanted to gauge that as opposed to, um, you know, just, just asking outright whether or not students were against this move or not. Perfect, yeah. thank you so much. And just really huge thank you for, your, for doing this work uh, for us. It's really helpful, thank you. Of course, yeah, I try my best. <laughs> Anyone else? All right, thank you, Ms. Clevis. Oh, go ahead, Helen. So when you sent it out, you said you sent it out to how many students? Um, roughly the entire student body that are on Canvas pages. All, all enrolled students are on the Canvas pages, um, but it's up to them to decide whether or not they want to take the survey after all. And they would have to look at it at a certain time too, right? Um, yes, I think it was sent out. Um, it, it, it was sent out very late. Monday evening on, on the Canvas pages. <laughs> yes. Uh, this Monday. This Monday, yes. Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes. Of course. Thank you. Of course. All right. We will now move to the superintendent's report. Good evening. Great to see all of you here with us, as well as those that are watching us virtually. Our superintendent's update for February 29th, 2024. So we're going to start off with a leaping good year. Students and staff at Pierce had a froggy good time <laughs> acknowledging leap year today. Principal Yadoff shared that 200 itty bitty baby frogs, the unofficial mascot of Leap Day, were hidden around the school buildings. Classes, students, staff were tasked with collecting the frogs throughout the school day. And just prior to uh, the meeting, uh, Principal Yadoff called me back and said um, 140 frogs were actually found. So there are still 60 that are missing. And so if you, I'm not sure how well you can see this, but in the screen here, there's one hidden here on the clipboard, one hidden on the light switch, one hidden in a plant. And my favorite is this one that's in the jar of marbles uh, that are, that's hidden there. Facing History and Ourselves Partnership, we wanted to give an update on the work that's happening with this organization in school year 22-23. Facing History in Ourselves work with grades six through eight, modeling Facing History's pedagogical approach, then specifically with grade eight teachers to explore curriculum materials related to the teaching of civics. In 23-24, our current year, Facing History is facilitating PD for our social studies teachers in grades six through 12 on civil discourse. And then in 24-25, we have applied for the Genocide Education Grant to work with Facing History and ourselves to teach young people a sense of agency to stand up to bigotry and hate and to make choices for a more just and equitable world. Genocide education provides us with a crucial opportunity to do just that, weaving together historical case studies and ongoing current events. So more to come there. Literacy study update. Hill for Literacy is conducting classroom walkthroughs over the next few weeks to collect trend data specific to literacy in our classrooms. Hill is an educational, Hill for Literacy is an education nonprofit that helps teachers better translate literacy research and assessment data into highly effective instruction. 
that results in long-term success. And so the calendar uh, uh, is laid out there for those particular visits. Holocaust education, there was also a question that came up at a previous uh, committee meeting. Holocaust education is taught in grade 10 as part of the interwar and or World War II units. This topic was moved from the eighth grade uh, when the 2018 standards were adopted. Eighth grade now focuses on civic education. In teaching the Holocaust, teachers cover the rise of anti-Semitism during the interwar era, the steps that led to the Holocaust and the final solution, the experiences of Jewish people and others who were targeted during this time period, and a resistance by Jewish people and others. Our Black History Month recognition, as we all know, February is Black History Month, and students complete, competed, completed various research projects, readings, and in some schools shared important information on the morning announcements. Students and staff also uh, decorated classroom doors and walls to honor and celebrate important Black artists, scientists, and activists. In addition, students uh, completed various research projects and readings. Uh, and you can see some examples of various doors that were decorated in and around the district. Um, and then at the high school, the Tap and Green um, shifted its menu uh, for Taste of the African Diaspora. And the menu was designed by Jesse Thompson and Tap and Green in honor of Black History Month. Hayes Young Scholars Celebration, the Roland Hayes uh, Young Scholars Program held student celebration at the Brookline Public Library, Tuesday, February 27th. The event included an art exhibit put together by the students on the life of the school's namesake, Roland Hayes. Thank you to fourth grade teacher Tatiana Beckwith for her work with the scholars. Special recognition to second grade teacher Karen Shashore who organized a game of bingo based on Hayes's life. And then thank you to Barbara Brown for coordinating the event. And here are some images of the posters that the students created. Teach like, inspire like, challenge like, succeed like. And all of those were about, of course, Roland Hayes. BHS tap challenge. The BHS Climate and Food Justice Club and Global Leadership Class is organizing its annual TAP Together Against Plastics Challenge, which aims to reduce unnecessary single-use plastic bottles where tap water is secure and to improve access to tap water where it is needed. The idea is to sign up for a two-week challenge and pledge to refrain from purchasing single-use plastic water bottles between March 20th through 31st and contribute the money saved towards improving the infrastructure in Quezal Guacue, Nicaragua, via the Brookline Quezal Guacue Sister City Project. Participants can also boost support by purchasing a tap reusable metal water bottle. And there is a um, QR code there for folks to uh, capture an image of. Brookline Pride Apparel is now available for purchase online. Apparel includes t-shirts and hoodies. Proceeds from sales will go towards queer student programming throughout the district. A shout out to middle school Laura Spitz-Sauza for coming up with the design along with Marnie, Kate, Julia, Sabine, and Leah who helped throughout the process. And that looks like very nice Brookline gear to, uh, to sport. Flowers in Focus at Beep. After reading the book, Have You Ever Seen a Flower by Sean Harris, Beep pre-K students viewed and discussed Georgia O'Keeffe's close-up flower paintings with our artist and art therapist Aaron Loparo. This mindful process and collaborative artwork began with students using magnifying glasses to observe and draw the center of living flowers, parts, lines, colors, and shapes using markers. Using pastels and art blending sticks, they then experimented with blending warm and cool colors to create petals. Finally, these young artists brought their seed circles and petals together, finding joy in forming large flower murals with their class. 
some amazing artwork there that our beat our earliest learners are engaging in. Runkle's Middle School Winter Dance. The Runkle PTO sponsored the school's second annual middle school winter dance for grades six through eight, Wednesday, February 14th. Students had a great time dancing to the music of DJ Mike Price. Runkle also took a, a field trip to Wheelock Theater on Thursday, February 15th. Runkle's first and second graders caught a show of Mr. Popper's Penguins at the Wheelock Family Theater at Boston University after having read the book and learned all about penguins. The students rode the tea to the theater accompanied by parent chaperones. And thank you to all that made that uh, visit a success. And tonight we will shine the spotlight again actually on Runkle School. And so with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to Oh, Don is on. Ms. Finnegan, I'm going to turn the mic over to you to then introduce your team and we'll take it from there. So I'll stop sharing and then reshare. Good evening, everybody. I just want to quickly introduce and thank Ms. Haley Shinnenhauer, who's one of our Learning Center teachers at Runkle. We feel very fortunate to have Haley, who reached out to all the students in fourth and fifth grade to put this presentation together for the classes in which she works in. So I'm going to let them do the talking and I'm going to bow out because we're very proud of them. Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. Um, the school committee for inviting us to present tonight, um, quite an honor. Excited to see students here. Um, I think the idea of presenting Lunar New Year to some of the Runkle, class, Runkle School classrooms I serve in um, started with just thinking about um, and I do apologize if I'm stumbling across my words. I'm not used to presenting to um, strangers, to people I don't know well. Um, I'm used to presenting to students. And I'm here tonight because I think when we think about where I come from, what my background is, I'm used to not speaking out. Um, as an Asian American, I was told to assimilate, to be like my white majority um, to be quiet um, and just to move along, to go along with how everything else is going along. Um, however, um, I'm here today um, in Brookline um, trying to raise my own children and to raise students I serve to be proud Asian Americans. And I can't, I, I realize that I can't support my students or my own kids to be proud of our background, of our culture, if I don't stand up and talk about the things that were challenging and to talk about um, the beauty of our culture. So in January, I had an idea of presenting to the fourth and fifth, fourth and fifth grade classes and to one of the RISE classes um, a Luna New Year presentation. Um, I'm going to share the slide with you. Let me see. Apologies. Haley, I have them up for you. Excuse me, sir. I have the slides up for oh, you. you. Um, so then I had an idea to share with students about Luna New Year. Um, we started with just, if you go to the next slide, what is Lunar New Year? Um, I went over the general idea of what it is, how many countries celebrate it, what are the traditions, what, what are the habits um, in preparation for Lunar New Year. Um, then I incorporated, if you go to um, one more page, to this page, um, I incorporated one of the things that we're teaching in fifth grade science, Students in fifth grade have been learning about the moon cycle. So we talked about how that relates to Lunar New Year and how, when we celebrate it. Um, I shared a couple of slides of what I do as with my family to celebrate. Um, and then once I was done sharing out, 
I invited my students to share about what they do for Lunar New Year. I think it was uh, important for students at Runkle, um, students I see every day to see other students speak out about what their traditions are um, because it provides an opportunity for authentic experience um, to talk about and to um, share what some of our similarities and differences are. Um, in some classes I had students um, share a symbol out to say that they also have some of these customs or they're aware of these traditions. Um, so tonight I have Bianca Silverman and Timmy Suhu, and I have Anara Muller, who are going to be sharing about what they do for Lunar New Year. Um, Bianca, do you want to start out? So thank you so much for having us. If you go to one more um, slide, I apologize. Okay. So my name is Bianca. My name is Timmy. And we are in fourth grade and we go to Runkle School. And recently we had this presentation about sharing what we do for Lunar New Year because we both celebrate Lunar New Year. And it was a really amazing opportunity. So I just thought it was amazing for you to kind of make this slide for us. I'm really happy about that. So Timmy, do you want to share what you do? <clears throat> yeah, so... During Lunar New Year, I hang out with friends and family members, and we make Chinese food uh, during that. And also, I go to uh, Chinese uh, restaurants and celebrate with, my, with other relatives. And my brother does the lion dance, so I help the lion dance group out with, uh, like, doing the instruments, like, the symbols and the gong, but also uh, this is the same thing as the restaurant. Uh, when I go to restaurants, uh, people hang out these uh, red envelopes that have money in it, and it's called home bows. So what I do is I normally go to restaurants with families and friends, and I eat a lot of yummy food, like noodles, which represents long life, longevity, and then dumplings are really tasty, and they kind of represent like little pockets of wealth. So make sure you eat those dumplings and noodles. And I also wear the color red because in Lunar New Year, most uh, most of the time, it's, you know, it's lucky to wear the color red. And this year, I actually went with Timmy to a Chinese restaurant, and there was these, we watched um, a lion dance performance. It was really cool. There was some lions that were dancing, some people playing the drums and cymbals, and it was just a great experience. And I just want to thank my teacher, Mishinohara, for doing this. I'm so happy to share what I do. Lunar New Year. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you, Timmy. Um, Dr. Gillery, if you could go down a couple more slides, you could see some of um, Timmy's slides. That kind of shows you what he and his family do. Um, they're part of a lion dance club. And then if you go down a couple more slides, oh, if you pause, actually, I am going to share out. Um, may I share my screen, Dr. Gillery? First, I'd like to show this. This is Timmy practicing um, with his lion dance club. And then I have one more screen to share. It is, a, it is quite an honor to actually have a student who participates in a lion dance club, um, very dedicated. I know that Timmy works hard at it um, and it 
it's really neat to be able to share that experience. I also have one more picture from Bianca that didn't make it um, onto the other thing, but here's one of the pictures. So that's me at the restaurant when I was explaining me at the restaurant with all the lions dancing. That was me at the restaurant. So it's very cool. And Bianca, I do want to say that mom shared the other picture with me, but I don't know why it's not coming out. Okay. The other picture uh, but in my view, is just some yummy food. Yeah. <laughs> and Dr. Guillory, if you will start back at the slideshow, um, I have our fifth grader, Inarg Moeller, who will be sharing. Inara? Sorry. Difficulties. So it actually is quite an honor to like um to share today because like like Lunar New Year like well Lunar New Year wasn't mo the most like And I think it's like really, really cool. And I'm all, and I'm and I'm also thanking the Shinohara for giving us the opportunity to do this share. So thank you, Shinohara. So basically what I do for Korean Lunar New Year is that oh well, Lunar New Year is that I do Sebe. It's like a bow to like like your like your elders. Like it's basically so, it's basically saying like, like have like, may like I wish you like a good year, and well, yeah, and you and then you get money for it because well it's you're thanking thank you right and then um and then I also make doku which is like, which is uh, it's rice cake soup with dumplings inside. I'm honestly not sure why we eat it, but it doesn't matter. And then, and like, and you will see in the photo, young me in a hanbok. It's what usually what you wear for the. Thank you, Nara. Yeah, <laughs> about it on my on my end. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so, and... the, so that is it for our presentation. Um, I think for the most part, it was really nice to be able to give students voice um when typically they don't have voice um and they always feel like they're a minority kind of mo moving along with the majority um and i'm glad that students had this opportunity to share out so that they felt that they had more voice in this all right thank you very much uh I, I see the students have a hand raised. Is that a fresh hand? Yes, I just want to say this is an amazing opportunity. I love it because when I when I told everybody that I was, you know, Chinese, everybody's like, I don't believe you because normally I don't look Chinese. And so I feel like after the presentation, people got to like know more that, you know, I am Chinese and I'm really proud of that I'm Chinese and I think it's very important for me to speak up and tell my and tell the people around me saying like I am Chinese and I think I'm very proud of it and I love the opportunity that was amazing to share the whole fourth grade I was like this is so cool but yeah I really loved it yeah thank you very much any comments or questions from school committee members all right 
All right, Ms. Shinohara, the Public Schools of Brookline Spotlight on Excellence is awarded to Ms. Shinohara with much gratitude and appreciation for spearheading Lunar New Year celebrations this year at Runkle School and to the Runkle School students who proudly shared Lunar New Year traditions and customs with their classmates, a project which serves to strengthen Brookline's core value for the celebration of diversity and inclusivity. Congratulations to you all. Thank you very much for coming. You're welcome to stay for the rest of our meeting if you like, but we understand if you want to go on with your day. And are there any questions for Dr. Guillory regarding the superintendent's report? Helen. So I just wanted to comment. I don't know, Dr. Guillory, if you mentioned I couldn't see you, what you were doing, but uh, Barbara Brown is actually yes. here in the yep. audience. So I wanted to acknowledge uh, her role in uh, the Heath School and the Roland Hayes. She was also a school committee member with me many moons ago. <laughs> anyway. Thank you, Helen. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> All right, and with that, we will. David, oh, I have my hand up, and I had okay, it up before, ahead. too. OK. Go ahead, Mariah. Um, first off, I, didn't, I had raised my hand to just mention to, or to say to Ms. Shinohara, how touched I was by her comments about the importance of representation and her own role in showcasing that for students. And I just wanted to thank her for being brave and coming here tonight. As she said, you know, it's a different presentation in front of adults. And I'm so grateful she came to talk to us and that she was um, modeling that kind of um, behavior for her students. And so I just wanted to say that as a thank you. Um, going to Linus's presentation, um, I had three questions. The first one was about the slide you had on literacy, Linus. Could you clarify what the hill, or it's called the hill, right? I'm sorry, I forget the name. But what are what are they looking for? What are they doing? What is, is this part of our larger literacy initiative? I, I missed the context of that activity. No worries, Dr. Fortuna will get us all caught up. Thank you. Hi, Mariah. Hi. This, the Hill is the organization that is conducting our full literacy review. So the part of the project that we're moving into now is the classroom visits, which was the schedule that Dr. Guillory was showing. We've completed the survey and the facilitated conversations portion of the review. Mm -hmm. And now they're observing classrooms to look at the materials and methodology that we're using. Thank you. Um, my second question is also curriculum related, so you might want to stay there, Jody, um, <laughs> or not. Um, my question was on the slides that were um, about, or the slide that was on facing history and ourselves. Um, and I was wondering if they were contributing to the education that is happening, or if they previously contributed to the 10th grade curriculum. Um, and if there was any further planning related to sort of integration of this all this curriculum across ages or across grade spans? One of the partnerships that we're really proud of and is really strong is our grade 6 through 12 a partnership with Greg Porter and Jen Martin. They work really well together to bridge the middle school and high school curriculum so that students do have that sense of continuity. Um, so what originally had started off um, in the first year of the grant that had originally started off as something that was just for eighth grade and it expanded to 6 through 8 and now has expanded to 6 through 12. What, what, is, what is this that you'd like genocide education? Oh, the professional or? development that Facing History is doing on civil discourse and um, civic education. Okay, so it's not necessarily on genocide or Holocaust education specifically. That's only in 10th grade, but that's part of a larger... That's part of the larger grant that we've applied for um, for next year that hopefully we'll get that will be um, also a multi-grade experience. Thank you. Linus, um, my final question is, um, and this is sort of a big picture question for you, what are, other than what's on the agenda tonight, what are the big issues that are going on in the district that you're most interested in, concerned on, concerned about, focused on? 
That's a big one, Mariah. <laughs> it is a big one, but I, 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 I feel like it's great to hear all the stories that we hear about the students and the different things going on. Um, but one of the things I think I, I feel like I would love to understand is the like knitting it all together from your perspective as superintendent. And so, you know, maybe I'll just ask it next time or um, we can come back to it, but I would love to have that. Um, you know, you're seeing everything and doing everything. I'd love to have that view. So. Well, and I mean, I think your, your question is well positioned. And I think after we do our, after I go through my update on the goals is where I'll do some of that tonight. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. All right, so with that, we will go to public comment. And just as a reminder, because we have limited time and a lengthy agenda, and we do want to get to important discussions, uh, please respect the time constraints. And if someone before you has said something that you would say as well, uh, feel free to say, I agree with that person, and then kind of move along. That would be helpful, because we do have uh, 17 people signed up for public comment. And we were supposed to start on our uh, discussion on ninth grade English course changes five minutes ago. So just be mindful of the time, please. Now, the, our first speaker, Mr. Josh Paradise. Oh, sorry, Helen. If I could, um, I would like to request if people have written to us, we read your, your comments. And I think unless you have something new to say to add to it, then certainly feel free to, to talk to us. But otherwise, know that we've read it and you can cede your time to the next person because we do want to get to the, the actual presentation. Thank you, I appreciate that. All right, Mr. Paradise. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you. Good evening, uh, my name is Joshua Paradise. Uh, I'm the parent of a rising ninth grader who's been in the Brookline Public Schools since kindergarten. I really appreciate all the hard work that everyone is doing. Um, and you taking the time to hear public comments, I will do my best to keep it brief. <clears throat> um, I'm speaking tonight to urge you to preserve the choices that have contributed so much to the excellence of Brookline High School, and specifically to ask you to include D-leveled ninth grade English as an option alongside leveled ninth grade English classes. I think we all know that students learn in different ways. Um, given the district's vision to, and this is from the district, provide every student with an extraordinary education so they may develop to their fullest potential. It's essential that we meet students where they are and provide the resources that they need. And it, while it is true that some students benefit from the heterogeneity of unleveled classes, studies are also clear that other students are more comfortable and more successful when classes are separated by level. That doesn't mean we can ignore the racial disparities that are so clear in the data and so problematic. As a school system and as a community, we are failing. The unfortunate irony of the plan to eliminate leveled classes is that it will do the most harm to our least advantaged students. Parents with means and privilege provide outside resources when Brookline schools do not. Because Brookline K through eight schools do not offer advanced classes, access to advanced programs is effectively restricted based on existing structural inequities. And the data on this is clear. In grades K through eight, there are no leveled classes. There are resources for students who are struggling, but there are few opportunities to challenge and develop stronger students. The students, the schools are not enabling students to develop to their fullest potential. As a result, parents supplement in ways that the schools may not even be aware of. So as an example, I, I, my child is not in Russian School of Math, but I called up Russian School of Math and looked at their website, there are over 15 sections in Russian School of Math at each grade level in elementary school. Um, and you know how many of those are for remedial or, or help? None, zero. Those are all extra challenge levels. Um, and th that when you do that math, more than one in three children in the Brookline schools is taking outside advanced math enrichment to supplement the offering that the public schools are not providing. And these classes are not cheap. So access is restricted to those who can afford it and for parents who are actively engaged. I, I mentioned the importance of eliminating racial disparities. Um, when you look at the data from MCAS, it's stark. 
um, white and Asian students significantly outperform black and Hispanic students um, by a, a pretty wide margin, anywhere from 10 to 40 percent. Two more sentences. Um, and, and that's a problem. But MCAS now of Massachusetts also provides a cut of the data by income level. And students from, um, from, non, from, from low income households underperform by an even greater amount. This is not a racial issue, um, or it's not just a racial issue. Um, at, at almost every level, low-income students underperform. So I, I really appreciate your time, um, and, and I hope we can make progress on this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Par Mr. Paradise. Next, we have Ms. Barbara Brown. Uh, thank you, Barbara Brown, um, former member of this committee, and especially appreciative as a former member of this committee for all the work you do. Um, I will, at um, Ms. Charlupski's recommendation, which I ma think makes a lot of sense, leave out most of what I would say. Um, but there was, there was one thing I particularly wanted to bring to your attention. A number of years ago, we had to move part of the high school into the old Lincoln. And um, what happened there was very interesting. The teachers discovered that the students did better, the ninth grade students did better when they were at the old Lincoln than they did at the high school. So the high school thought, aha. And then the opportunity became available to have a ninth grade school building. And we went, oh, yes. And so what that is saying to me is that when you get ninth graders together, you begin to develop a community. You have your own teachers, you have students artwork and science work on the walls of the building, nobody else's. You have your own library, you have your own cafeteria, you have your own places where people can talk to each other, and you're developing a community. And then what do you do? You say, you're not good enough. That undermines community and that undermines trust in each other, and that undermines all kinds of other things. And research, research um, I differ with the previous speaker, has shown that people do well in heterogeneous classrooms. As Lexington High School has shown, they've gone from ninth grade unleveled to 10th and 11th grade unleveled, and it requires support and time for the teachers, and I'd like to listen to the English teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Next, we have Ms. Masha Kogan. Good evening. Um, my name is Masha Kogan, and I am the mother of an eighth grade student. And I'd like to speak to you tonight about community building, as it's one of the key reasons given by the BHS administration for mandating unleveled English for all students is to foster a sense of community and collaborative culture. And while I don't disagree this is a worthy goal, it's unclear why an English class is the correct vehicle for fostering community when BHS offers many better opportunities, such as the advisory hub, unleveled electives that bring together students with common interests, extracurricular activities, after school clubs, again, based on common interests, and of course, sports teams, which we accept that students are leveled by their playing ability in order to form cohesive and functional teams. Mixing together stronger and weaker athletes on the same team would not under, only undermine the functioning of that team, but it would destroy the, school, the team spirit very rapidly, as the better athletes would feel resentful, the less skilled would feel inadequate, <laughs> and the players may become contemptuous or even hostile toward one another. And I would argue that the same is true in a class where students are forced together Students who don't want to be in the same class are forced together would prevent the class from functioning as a group, just as it would on a sports team. And that far from fostering community, what would be fostered is mutual frustration as some feel held back, rushed, and others feel rushed and overwhelmed. And please remember that the students in the unleveled ELA pilot chose to be there together. So of course they felt kinship with one another, of course they felt community, because they are part of a select experiment. The same would not be true in an ELA class where the students did not have a choice to be together, but were herded there by a mandate. 
community can't be created by mandate. It has to happen organically, and it has to be based on something real, some commonality. So if we're in fact committed to collaborative culture in Brookline, I'd like to point out that up until now, nothing about the process of deleveling ELA has involved the community or collaboration of parents or students. And I'd like to ask that the school committee rectify that and allow those students who want an unleveled English class to pursue that option. We're not opposed to unleveled English, but what we are, we are opposed to is forcing all students into unleveled English. We like to allow those students who want to choose the level of academic rigor that's correct for them to be able to do so, rather than forcing all the students to conform to an idea that many of them disagree with profoundly. And it's not just the parents, it's the students who disagree. And that this idea to put all students together into one single ELA class without any choice in the matter doesn't feel collaborative. It feels like something imposed on us from above, like a fiat that the rest of us have to follow, and that those of us who are opposed to this idea are also the community. And I would urge the school committee to keep this in mind when making your decision. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kogan. Next, we have Mr. Toby Paradise. Hello, my name is Toby Paradise, and I'm going to be a ninth grader at BHS next year. I'm here to speak about why BHS should continue to offer leveled ELA classes. This is based on my experience from K to eight in an unleveled classroom. First, it is simply impossible to have one teacher teaching all levels at the same time, let alone offering advice and insights for each student. Lessons always end up benefiting either slower learners or faster learners, but never both together. Not one of my previous or current teachers has been able to provide for each student. The, the class always goes at the level of slower students, leaving faster students bored, frustrated, and irritated that their slower peers are holding them back. This holds true for ELA. If you have students in varying levels in one classroom, then you have to do one of three things. The first is to read a book that everybody understands, which leads to less complex discussions and less mental growth for faster students. A second option is to read books that some, perhaps some kids may not understand, which leaves uh, some behind. If the teacher does not want to exclude these learners, the class must spend more time discussing what's even happening in the book and less time on deeper analysis. An alternative is to have separate cohorts reading separate books suited to their learning level, but this is just halfway to leveled English, so what's the point in that? This really shows that unleveled English with everybody in, um, everybody of all levels in it is not an option. While it is not for everybody, uh, although the students in the unleveled ELA pilot reported liking it, we should continue with it as a separate option. BHS should offer, offer leveled classes for those who would benefit from them. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Paradise. Next, we have Mr. Elliot Wayne. Hi, my name is uh, Elliot Wayne. I'm the parent of a ninth grader at, I'm gonna sit down, at uh, Brookline High School here. And uh, he's well-spoken and um, I'm not gonna repeat anything. I think I offer a fresh perspective. My child is in both WISP and the pilot program and you know if the school says what they say that they're not going to touch the grades above then selfishly i don't really care what you're going to do okay but as a parent and as an educator i have a master's in education i have an undergraduate degree in history and i don't uh, i don't look um, how can i say it for parents who are looking at the unlevel classes, I've personally benefited, I think, but I don't think my child really has benefited from it. And what I mean is that he's in an unleveled English class. Um, in all through Pierce, he had to go to remedial, I can't remember, he had a, whatever the number is, you know, he had extra help in reading and now he's in an unlevel class and he chooses the easiest book and then he gets an A so how does that really compare to his colleague who read the hardest book because there's three levels. And so is that the same A 
or just want to give an A these days. Okay, again, he gets an A. And then his teacher recommends that maybe he could be in honors because he's really he has he's really progressed. He doesn't need help anymore, but he'd still be in the lower level. He should not be in an honors class. And this is my child. I wouldn't put him in there. And he knows that even though he debated, he asked if he should, if he could be in there, but he knows. Um, and so there's three levels of books. And so there's no pedagogy going on here in the classroom. There's little groups. How can like he said, how can they teach the three different levels? Kids are reading different books. So there, there really is no pedagogy. There's no interaction. He tries to explain it to me. You can't understand what's going on. It's not like that. So um, as for the curriculum, that's another story. It's, it's really, uh, I have a real problem with the WIS curriculum. I also have a real problem with the books they've been reading. But I don't see the benefit. Again, my child, he's, in, he's got a solid A in history, but he chooses the, the easiest one. So can he possibly be? in honors next year? I don't know if he can. Um, he doesn't know if he can because he took home a packet of the hardest one and it was radically different. That was challenging. So is that the same? Lastly, conversely, if you're planning in the future to do math, my son has an A plus in advanced geometry. So why would he want to be in any class that's going to hold him back that way? So by this deleveling that you're considering, he's not really benefiting in a learning manner, he's getting good grades. He is, he is being helped by being, but there is no, I think there's a benefit, maybe I'm traditionalist, there is a benefit to being in different levels because how could he, for example, they're gonna read the Odyssey. Now, I studied Greek history, I've read it five or six times. How can my child possibly read the Odyssey? Possibly, even any other ninth grader, if you're gonna read a serious translation, okay? but. What are they going to have three different levels of the Homer's Odyssey? So, I mean, that's kind of absurd. So I don't want to keep up your time, but as a parent of someone whose child has actually maybe benefited, it's not a benefit to the students who are coming in the future. You're not doing them any benefit because you're looking for a certain statistic at the end of the day, because that's really what this is all about. And again, you're focused on certain percentages of certain people's fitting into certain, whether they're underrepresented or overrepresented, okay? As opposed to the pedagogy and the curriculum. And I didn't have time to discuss the curriculum. So the history curriculum is terrible and the English one is not so great either. All right, our next speaker is Jody Calabro. Hi. First of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity that I have in choosing this challenge for me of being able to put myself in a public speaking role. I don't like it, but I have that choice to be able to do that. Um, I'm also a parent of a student at Brookline High School currently, and I'm also a parent of a student at Lincoln. Um, Brookline High has been great for my older child who needed a larger place to really be able to nurture her own interests and develop both academically and socially and has thrived was that because BHS has so many pathways that she can choose, that she has been able to look at the IMP program, look at the iBio program, look at AP classes, look at honors programs, look at standard programs, and really craft a program that works for her so she can grow socially, emotionally, both with academic skills and also with soft skills and habits of work that will help her along the past the high school years. Um, I'm also, an, I'm also an urban high school educator. I witnessed in my own school and my own district the removal of honors programming um, in favor of heterogeneous um, classes right during the pandemic. I watched teachers struggle with dis, um, developing the honors distinction work to be able to give students the option to be able to do that work while they were in a heterogeneous class. Um, I watched them struggle with engaging them. I watched them struggle with the attempt to differentiate the work with large classes that they had. Differentiation, which I do all the time in my small classes, requires few students, maybe 10, maybe 14 to be effective, or have that supplemented with paid support staff to help the teacher be able to do that so it doesn't end up being asynchronous work facilitated by the teacher instead of 
actually collaboration group work that is meaningful and discussions that they have. My final thoughts are that WISP, um, which my daughter also did, um, did not enable her to get more choice in um, history. As she is, she was a strong history student. I had to still intervene with her to even get her to consider the AP um, track when she got into junior year, just because she was afraid of the test. So she was not able to do that. And that is telling um, that that was probably the one thing that she had. I find that unleveled programs, both within my own district and also that it prevents students from really being able to engage in whatever their productive struggle is. That looks different for every single child. If you have a heterogeneous class, you have a standard class, you have an honors class, then every single child can choose with the support of their teachers, their families, their um, selves to be able to figure out what class is going to help them productively struggle so that they can get what they need to get. Um, and just like you gave me the chance for the opportunity to meet my challenge of fear and my choice to be able to present here instead of on Zoom, please don't rob any of our children from choosing whatever their best path is um, to get their education that they need. Thank you. Our next speaker, Mr. Yuri Mariash. Hey, everybody. So um, speaking here again, and I always like starting by thanking everybody um, on the school committee and the superintendent um, and everybody who joined on Zoom for taking the time to invest in our children's education, put the time and the effort, you know, it doesn't, um, it's, we're not taking it for granted. I mean, and I know that you're facing difficult decisions. I, I do want to keep my um, speech short because a lot of the stuff that's been said before against the leveling, um, I completely agree with. And I can just give you an example of my kids, like I have three kids in the school system and people just develop at different rates. People are good at different things like i have a daughter that is good with letters i have a son that is good with numbers and it's okay like the world is just like that some people are good at some things some people are not so good at those things and i think we also need to make sure that we challenge people in different ways i think shame on us as a society if to for us to feel accomplished that everybody reach a center level we have to de level I mean, let's invest in those students. Let's get them to the level they want to be and let's give them that option. I mean, what is the message that we're sending? The message that I'm hearing as a parent, as a taxpayer in this town is that like DEI is incompatible with academic excellence because I have to choose one or the other. Why can't we do both? Like, why can't we offer people the opportunity to meet them at their level and also promote people that feel that they should be at a different level, regardless of their... Um, background to achieve what they need to achieve. I mean, I think that's the crux of the issue. And I think, you know, I look to you to uh, to support that. It's an important issue for me as an immigrant. It's an important issue for many immigrant parents uh, from various countries um, in this town. And that's what, you know, in my mind, the election that is coming up is going to be all about. So thank you so much for taking the time. And again, thank you so much for all the time and the effort and the hard decisions that you have to make. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mariash. Next, we have Mr. Quentin Cruel. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Quentin Cruel. Um, I'm a parent of a current eighth grader uh, at the Runkle School and a 10th grader at uh, Brookline High School. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, and thank you again for your time and your dedication to this. Um, I won't repeat a lot of what was said um, before. A about the deleveling or unleveling, um, but I would raise a couple of questions in how we think about um, <clears throat> are we using the best practices for selecting students for levels, right? If we're getting a very um, undiverse set or, or, you know, we're having very different sort of um, diversity standard or results in the two different groups, how are we choosing the students? Um, a book that I recently completed uh, or read was uh, Adam Grant's book called Hidden Potential. And then looking at, um, he says, oftentimes in schools and workplaces, we select 
um, selection systems are usually designed to detect excellence. That means people who are on their way to excellence rarely make the cut. So perhaps there are ways that we can use um, other standards to try to pull out from students the right character traits that they have, where they have that sort of desire to, to move to the next level. Um, which then brings me to the second point, which is, are we creating pathways to from one level to the next? Right. Um, and from some of my experience, at least with my son um, in BHS, I think it is really challenging once you've selected a level to be able to move to the next. And it's not always clear what those prerequisites are besides the prior class, which doesn't tell you what you need to have mastered. So it doesn't give you the opportunity to, I think, make your way to the next level. Um, so I, I really would like that to be considered if possible in, in creating the solution. So thank you again for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Kroll. Next, we have Mr. Sid Srivastava. Hi there. Thank you so much. My name is Sid Srivastava. I um, uh, thank you to the school committee for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My wife and I are, wa are raising three kids in Brookline. I spoke in the November school committee meeting about the importance of maintaining challenging learning opportunities um, to really maximize each and everyone's uh, potential. And at that meeting, I talked about my father who grew up in poverty in India and how his family touted the value of education to really try to escape poverty. My father became a scientist, a professor of engineering, and one of the valuable lessons he taught me was, number one, when making important decisions, try to use rigorous data. And number two, look and understand the data itself carefully. So I was eager to see some of the data presented, some of the slides presented, um, that have taken the spirit of the first notion, which is to use data to support one's decision. However, I do have some concerns about the interpretation of the data. So I've read Hattie's Visible Learning, the sequel from which the data from some of the slides is being presented today. And Hattie presents an effect size for both uh, leveling as a factor and deleveling as a factor. It turns out they're the exact same effect size of 0.09, both classified as likely to have a small positive impact. By Hattie's own methodology, leveling has as much benefit as deleveling. Now, I was reading the data and I was surprised to see that the effect size, just to repeat, the effect size for deleveling is the same as the effect size for leveling. Per the study, both have had a good impact. Therefore, any change in the future has to be based on an intervention that improves upon what already exists. I, I also looked at the data behind the, the leveling learning factor, which is based on one meta-analysis by Dr. Ning Rui, who nicely mentions the limitations of his own study. Quote, this review is limited by the fact that there have been few published experimental studies on heterogeneous grouping in recent years. In many reviewed studies, it is impossible to determine the specific impact of grouping based on the data presented. And this is his own, his own words in this paper that's, that's being cited. In other words, any time you make a change, you have to take a step back and analyze what the actual effect was before implementing it further. Um, so again, thank you to the school committee for laboriously putting together these data, these slides, which show us the results right now are equivocal, that is, we cannot make concrete conclusions either way. So thank you for taking an analytical and thoughtful approach to making this decision. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Srivastava. Next, we have Ms. Jen Roberts. Thank you, school committee members and superintendent and school community for allowing me to speak. Um, I'm a reluctant public speaker, but I felt that as there, as is happening, there would be a lot of negative pushback on the introduction of the unleveled English course, and I wanted to voice my support of the adoption of this course. I wanted to start by sharing my enthusiasm, enthusiasm for the wonderful welcoming orientation to BHS that the school leaders provided to us earlier this month. I'm here tonight because I walked away from that orientation particularly excited to learn about WISP and the addition of the Responding to Literature Humanities course. 
The department leaders did a wonderful job articulating the whys of the introduction of these unleveled and differentiated courses to the BHS ninth grade curriculum. What I took away was the emphasis on community building and increased access to rigorous content, two goals I applaud. I must admit that I'm here as a very enthusiastic mom of an eighth grader, but also as a high school social worker in a neighboring community. I believe so. We live in Brookline because I believe so strongly in the protective mental health benefits of the K to H model, which is a model supported by science, not just my social worker instincts. And that research has shown there are significant protective factors in keeping our middle school youth connected to their community of teachers and peers at a time in their lives that they are at their most vulnerable and insecure. However, this makes the transition to high school for many of our students their only school transition, and it's an enormous one socially and academically. I was thrilled then to hear our Brookline school leaders talk about the unleveled classes as a place to intentionally focus on building community for ninth graders. This is so important with the adolescent mental health crisis seemingly running unchecked in our country. This feels like a thoughtful and intentional effort to attempt to mitigate these impacts, impacts I see daily. As you are well aware, our students come from high achieving families who want the best for their children. I can well imagine that they may see these unleveled classes and worry about the impact on their children's future. But what I as a high school social worker see is the negative impact of stressed out and overwhelmed ninth graders who feel that they have to take the most rigorous classes or fear that they're, they won't truly succeed in life. Our kids who feel connected to their school community, their teachers, and their peers tend to be more likely to manage the challenges of high school with success and better mental health. My school counselor colleagues who I shared this unleveled, um, this new proposed unleveled classes with, were super excited to hear about it as well. They highlighted that they thought benefits of learning to, that for students learning to select the appropriate level of challenge given what is going on in their lives, to sample different levels, and that the differentiation might allow them to be more involved in activities in school, knowing that they can flex their work, workload with particular benefits. I hope, school committee, that you'll be strong in the face of parent concerns and challenges and take a step to support our students and vote to support the expansion of the unleveled ninth grade curriculum to, to include the English class. I feel strongly that our kids will benefit from this academically, socially, and psychologically. Woo, right on time. Thank you for allowing me this time. Thank you, Ms. Roberts. Next, we have Dr. Gary Schiffman. Just want to be clear, I didn't say the doctor part, you did. Um, I'm Gary Schiffman. Um, I am a civilian now, but uh, I was until June 30th, the social studies curriculum coordinator at Brookline High School. And I was the administrator when we introduced WISP. I went on those site visits to Lexington and many other schools to see how they did it. I looked at the data and I worked with the team for years to create the course that is now our ninth grade unleveled history class. Uh, I wanna just share some data uh, briefly from my experience. Um, I taught WISP, by the way. My last teaching experience at the high school was three years teaching the WISP class. So we used to have honors and standard, two levels in ninth grade world history. And 70% of Brookline students took honors, 30% took standard. And the demographics of those classes are well known to you. And they became well known to us over time. I taught both ninth grade honors. I taught ninth grade standard many times each. And I will tell you that I met very bright students in all of those classes. And I will tell you that I met struggling students in all of those classes. And what I came to believe with great conviction is that in a system in which parents and children get to choose which level they take, they decide. And in that same district where teachers feel very differently at the eight feeding schools about our levels, so that in some schools, 50% of the kids get recommended, and some schools, 0% of the kids get recommended for standard class, those feeder schools and that system of opting in lead to social sorting. And that's what I saw in the classes I taught. And I was in all the classes as an observer and supervisor. What I saw was that for sure, kids who do a lot of homework are very bright and are keenly interested in history took the honors class. There is no question about that. But there were many students in the honors classes who are not equipped to do honors work by any reasonable definition of what that is. And the 70-30 split meant that we had social sorting. And I am a doctor. I like smart kids. I really like smart kids who love history. And I always sought them out whether I was teaching them or not. 
And I respect their abilities and I respect how important it is to challenge students who have a keen interest and ability in something. We were not doing that in our ninth grade honors class. And so we chose a different path. We chose to put all the students together in one room. It was a very deliberative process. We, um, as I said, we talked to many people in other schools. We looked at data. We spent a long time building the course before we ever taught it. And we've, we spent a lot of time revising the course. And as far as I can see, the course is still um, a work in progress as it should be. What's the effect? Here's a piece of data. Nothing, trans nothing world shattering, nothing uh, massively transformative. But when I taught standard classes, sometimes the behavior in those classes was excellent, easy. And sometimes it was not. Uniformly in my honors classes, behavior was not an issue. But intermittently in my standard classes, it was absolutely an issue. I think that's for a variety of reasons. There are more boys than girls in standard classes typically. That's enough to explain it. But there's more. I came to believe that people, young people who have been designated standard, live down to their reputation, particularly boys, not all of them but I saw it happen. And so one of the things I can report, in fact, the only firm piece of data, unless Gabe has more for you later, is that we don't have behavior problems in the unleveled heterogeneous WISP class of the sort we had in the standard class. That is, pre-pressure works. It really does raise the average behavior so that in any class you go to, and I brought outside people in to see, any class you go to, they all look like our honors classes used to look. That doesn't mean that very bright students are more challenged. In fact, I, I suspect they're not. The reality is, I'm not gonna tell you, Toby, it's more challenging in a WISP class. It's not. But the behavior is better across the board. And we have worked very deliberately in that class, as I know they have in the English class, to meet the needs of many different students in a way we had never done when we pretended to teach an honors class. The reality is that, here's another piece of data, we wrote a new course for a new challenge. And we knew that when we have all students in there, we don't pretend anymore that these are honor students who can't actually read the Odyssey and we pretend. But instead, we actually designed a curriculum so that everyone could do something that was challenging and enriching. So what was the outcome? The outcome was a new course. The outcome was better behavior. The outcome for us was also a new 10th grade course. We have three kinds of, three options now in 10th grade in social studies, honors, global studies, which is mixed level, and a traditional standard class. I don't know if it'll stay that way, but there are more options, not fewer. And the 10th grade honors class in, in world history now actually looks more like an honors class. Um, so, yeah, but this is going longer by quite a bit. Yeah, 30 seconds. He's in a privileged position here. This is a I am. Quite 30 seconds. 30 seconds. The world is not transformed by the advent of an, of an unleveled class. Um, the world is not transformed by the advent of, a, of an unleveled class. One of the things that I hear in the frustration of parents who've waited for their kids to be challenged for a long time, and I understand that, and I, I relate to it in my own education. English and social studies are where people discuss human questions. What we believed in social studies and what I believe or my colleagues in English believe is that it is possible for ninth graders to gather together and discuss questions like who should rule? What does it mean to be a friend? What does it mean to be a human? They can discuss those questions productively in common one of the things that clearly is going on in this debate. I, I really don't like to interrupt in public comment, but you, you have gone significantly. If you say it's not math, I think a lot of this anxiety goes away. Thank you. All right, our, our next speaker will be Danielle Lentz. School is a social experiment. Just pedagogy. Just pedagogy. I feel like this will be challenging to follow. Um, I, I will be brief since I, I think most of my points have been made. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is Danielle. I have two sons um, in elementary and middle school in, in Driscoll. Um, and I'm, I'm here to voice another, another voice in favor of keeping the option of the leveled option um, for, for high school. And I, I think the reason is that in part we're, we're missing the point. 
when we think about equality and excellence together, we should be focused on equal opportunities and providing and supporting equal opportunities is providing access. And this access to better education and encouragement of growth and development, but also pushing the kids. The truth is that some kids need pushing. Um, encouragement in a, is a, maybe a better word for it, but, but some, some kids, we will miss them if they, they are not provided the opportunity. Um, and some kids need more support. To me, the example that was given before for ninth graders um, appreciating being separated from the rest is actually not an example of community so much as an example of how ninth graders first time um, feeling intimidated potentially in going into high school have a better experience when separated from the rest of the high school. Um, and similarly, some kids that are having a difficult time actually would appreciate being in a class where they can be supported without maybe feeling their peers are are more advanced than them and so the opportunity to have that separation to have the support that each um, each student needs according to their level um, would be highly valuable by by a lot of a lot of students um, and so I, I think this is what we should be focused on this this choice. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Lentz. We will now turn to uh, several speakers who are on Zoom. And first up will be Ms. Miriam Enos. Can you hear me? We can, right. yes. Go okay, right ahead. Great. I can't seem to turn on the video. I don't know why, so I'll just keep, um, it seems to, hang on. Um, it's not working. Okay, just for the sake of time, I'm sorry, I'm gonna spare you my, oh, here you go, I think I'm there. Uh, well, good evening, everyone, and I appreciate this opportunity to speak and share my viewpoint on the issue at hand. First, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm a longtime Brookline resident, and I'm also a parent of three boys, uh, Brookline High Junior, uh, Runkle, eighth grader, and fourth graders. And myself, I'm a BHS alumna, class of 1997. So woo. Uh, normally, I, I don't speak in public forums or come forward to express my opinion. Um, in such a way because I'm, I don't ever feel that strongly about subject matter, but this is not the case now. So uh, I know that all of us here, because we care deeply about education and the children and we want them to thrive and we want them to be prepared for a bigger world and out there. And uh, when I say the children, I mean all the children, not just our own. Um, and Brookline High has held a, repu a reputation of excellence. and. When I first arrived here as an immigrant in uh, as a high school sophomore, I was incredibly, incredibly grateful for the opportunity to tailor the curriculum around my interests and strengths and doubling down in the areas where the challenge was needed and also taking it easy where I couldn't challenge myself um, that much. And as far as my socioeconomic situation went, I was at, at the very bottom or near the very bottom of the ladder. And believe me when I say that uh, the opportunities for challenge and academic stretch that I received at Brookline High, they are the ones that have prepared me for college. And I'm not talking about getting into college. I know everyone is concerned about getting into college. I'm actually more concerned about thriving in college. And I think I was set up for success. And if not for this rigorous environment that I was exposed to at Brookline High, I really firmly believe that my path would be dramatically different in part because mm -hmm. I simply would not have access to an outside enrichment because my single mother working two part-time jobs would not be able to pay for it. So, and I think there are a lot of folks now here that, you know, would feel the same way. And I realized that my story, however heartfelt, is still just one story of one person. And there are many other people with the stories of their own. And I appreciate that while the system has worked wonders for many, like myself, it has let down some people as well and some kids. And as such, I really fully support and understand uh, any effort that aims to ameliorate this disparity and that's uh, staring us at the in the face. So 
Uh, but as many of the folks in this community have articulated an important and highly consequential decision, decision such as this cannot be, uh, needs to be taken very carefully and thoroughly. And I know you guys will work really long and hard on this, but I do believe that it has to be data-driven and it has to be hard data and, and needs to be collected and clearly and ambiguously stating the results. And as of now, I don't believe there is any data put forth thus far that satisfies this criteria. The studies that are being referenced and will be referenced in the, like shortly in the presentations uh, are not done on the same system as ours. So there will be some sample or examples of tracking of being successful. Tracking is really different from what we have here. It's not leveling because it offers no freedom of choice, which I think is crucial here. Uh, one of many reasons Brookline High is such an amazing school is because you can customize your education to fit around your personal strengths and weaknesses and interests. And it's up to you to decide. And when only one option is offered, it effectively forces everybody into the same track, however dead leveled it is. So I know that there are plans to um, have co-teaching and extension assignments, and they're all wonderful, but unlike Evanston High School that will be referenced today, that is uh, sort of a success story. I checked out their website. They have 14 to one student to teacher ratio. Unless we plan to do the same thing, I don't know how we can successfully implement the same strategy. So to sum it up, I just want to say um, that uh, we certainly should evolve and do better and serve every student to the best of our abilities, but let's exercise extreme thoughtfulness and caution and let's be rigorous and unbiased about the data that we ought to have to inform the big decisions here. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Enos. Next we have Tal Kennett. And I think I'm on. So I'll also be speaking about the leveling. Uh, first, I'd like to express my surprise, actually, that all of the stakeholders seem to be taken by surprise over the past two weeks. The Office of Teaching and Learning and the high school presented the D-leveled ninth grade English as a done deal at the eighth grade open house and seem to have been taken by surprise by the fact that the school committee still has to vote on this. I can only assume that the teachers involved were also equally surprised. The school committee seemed to be taken by surprise that this was declared a done deal by the high school, and in fact, they hadn't voted on it. And parents were surprised to find out about the leveling plans altogether, not just for English, but also for physics and math down the road. So there's something very broken in a process where all the stakeholders are taken by surprise at the bottom of the ninth inning of such an important policy change. Now, as for the leveling itself, the research is at best mixed. The Ning Rui study that will be cited later tonight as evidence of only positive impacts is a 15-year-old meta-analysis of highly heterogeneous results, spanning data from 1972 to 2006, so data from between one to four generations ago, from places very different from Brookline. The leveling sounds great, but it is not a risk-free proposition. A very recent 2023 study found that mixed level classes actually led to lower self-concept in the initially weaker students, the very same students we want to help. And another example, parents in a district in Rhode Island that deleveled uh, in 2020 were dismayed to realize recently that merit aid in college was tied to the total number of honors classes taken by students and reducing the availability of the honors in ninth grade resulted in lower merit aid and we would potentially be harming the very students who would need it most. That district, by the way, is now bringing back honors in ninth grade. We should therefore proceed with caution. And I'm a scientist, and like many others here, I believe in data. I am absolutely confident that the teachers in the pilot designed an outstanding curriculum, and I, for one, would love to see it through and find out if it will indeed lead to the more equitable enrollments and honors in AP classes in 10th grade. That is a noble and worthwhile goal. But if we don't have the data about, but we won't have the data about 10th grade English enrollment until four weeks into the next school years, and we won't have the data about success in those enrollments until the end of the next school year. And as far as I know, thus far, parents at least haven't even been sh uh, shown the data of the equivalent matrix from the ninth grade WISP, and that's been going on since 2019. So that said, while I'd love to see WISP data, I personally believe that data from one subject won't necessarily inform another, and each class should be evaluated independently. So therefore, I strongly urge the school committee to vote to continue the mixed 
English class as a pilot for at least one more year until we can gather the data needed to know if this pilot is indeed accomplishing what we expect and hope that it would for Brookline students. That time frame would then also allow us to carefully study the potential impacts on merit aid and on self-concept and potential other unintended consequences. We must watch out for these consequences. First, let's do no harm. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kennett. Next, we have Ms. Catherine Dugan. Hi, my name is Catherine Dugan. I am a 10th grader at BHS. I'd like to start out by saying I completely agree with everything Mr. Paradise and Toby said earlier this night. I am an honors level student, so I would like to acknowledge that I don't speak for all my peers, but I took the unleveled history class last year, and although I do support the idea behind unleveled courses, I think equality is very important. I don't think that those claims have been met, and I think it does more harm than good for a significant percentage of students. I think the school has definitely been making claims that students can challenge themselves, can choose different levels, which I just didn't see were true in my class. It was often considered the easiest class among honors level students. It was actually like a free period for most students. I know most of my honors and advanced classmates end up doing homework from other classes during the class. I never had classwork that challenged me. Even when I got to choose my classwork, the spicy level was never challenging. And that was actually provided less often than I think people are implying. It was maybe once a week and it could be for classwork and it could be for homework. I think that another issue with the leveled assignments that I saw, at least in my class, but also heard about from other classes, was students would choose an easier level because the challenge work option was often significantly longer. And I'm talking like five pages of reading compared to two. And whenever this was given in class, that would make a significant enough time difference that students would just choose the shorter option. I think that the survey given out was a very good idea by the school. I'm very grateful that they were trying to take students' opinions. At the same time, I'd like to acknowledge that it was flawed. Um, one question I would like to point to is it asked students whether they chose a level that was just right for them, challenging or easy. And at least in my experience, and I know in several of my friends who took the survey, I wasn't sure how to answer that question because I always chose the supposed challenge option, but it was always easy work for me. And I think the question that really should have been asked was what level did you choose and wasn't challenging for you? Because I think you'd see a very different group of answers. I also think when asking students what they liked about the course. I liked the diversity of the course. I liked meeting other students. I wish I saw more of that this year. I unfortunately don't. But they also don't really leave room for all the challenges with the course. I, I don't think it helped me learn. I think it hurt my learning. I'm looking to take AP next year and I am terrified because like, I've never gotten a chance to actually do a hard reading for me or take notes or learn basic history skills that I really should have learned in ninth grade, but didn't because most of my class time was spent with the teacher trying to give a lecture while half the class wasn't paying attention. And then classwork was a mess because again, students weren't paying attention. And even if a student tried to do something that was challenging, it often didn't lead to the teacher giving them the support because if you were an honors level student doing the challenging level, like the teacher would choose to help the students taking the easier levels first. So I know that was also 
something that held some of my other classmates back from doing something that would realistically challenge them. I think when making your decision tonight about whether to keep the pilot course for English going as a pilot or implementing it full scale, I really think you should consider the whole group of students. I think there's a lot of emphasis on like the students that benefit from the course. And I think there are students that benefit from the course. And I think it's important that we look at those students and care about those students too, because their education matters, but mine does also. And so does my peers and they really need support in school and they really need challenging work to do. I know like when I take classes that I don't find interesting, I'm bored out of my mind. It's, it's hard for me. I see my brothers experiencing the same thing and I have two younger brothers and I'm really worried about high school for them because I felt like I could say high school is going to be better. Like it's going to be challenging. It's going to be hard. And I'm worried that I won't be able to say that anymore to them. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dugan. Next, we have Mr. Marco Bitran. Hi, can you hear me now? We can, yes, go ahead. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, I'm a proud uh, graduate of the Baker School uh, in Brookline High School in 1993. I have a son who's a junior at Brookline High School and a daughter transitioning from, uh, will we'll be transitioning from the eighth grade to uh, to ninth grade at uh, Brookline High School next year. Uh, and I'm here to uh, relay concerns regarding the deleveling initiatives uh, that's part of the reimagining uh, ninth grade proposal. Uh, the Brookline school system is a jewel of our town, uh, much thanks to the work uh, that you do as part of this um, school board, which we greatly appreciate it. Um, and I know that you strive continuously to improve our schools for all students. Uh, I'm part of a group of parents and students uh, that have serious concerns about deleveling initiatives. Um, the ultimate goal of deleveling and detracking is to close the achievement gap, hopefully by raising up the performance of lower scoring students. And this is a, a noble goal, which we all share. There is not a single parent or student among uh, my peers and that I've talked to who do not appreciate this goal and want to advance it. It's the specific teaching method of deleveling, which you are proposing to uh, uh, use to achieve this goal, which, what, which is what concerns us. The data we have reviewed does not make it clear that deleveling of any subject, including ELA, increases the achievement level of any group of students, including those at the lower ends of the spectrum. In fact, much of the data suggests that all students fare worse. Recent pilots in various school systems, including San Francisco, have resulted in lower performance across all scoring levels, low and high. For example, an analysis of the San Francisco results by Education Next stated that the evidence that detracking promotes equity is sparse, mostly drawing on case studies that are restricted in terms of generalizability of findings to other settings and with research designs that do not support causal inferences. <clears throat> um, and uh, and these, these results, unfortunately, have been true not only in ELA, but also in math and science pilots of detracking and uh, deleveling. And it's my understanding that the Reimagining Ninth Grade Plan eventually does want to delevel math and science. Other studies uh, suggest that detracking causes negative, uh, negative effects to um, students' self-image of the lower performing students. Before initi initiating any deleveling initiative, including the one in the reimagining ninth grade proposal, it's imperative that we wait until more data is available. And, and I mean concrete data. I'm an engineer. Um, concrete data that is published on a Brookline School's website made widely available, scrutinized through a reasonable comment period, and which shows a material improvement in the performance across all levels. Uh, I strongly urge you not to do this on what... Uh, uh, relying on ambiguous improvements shown in data, which may potentially be cherry picked, anecdotal stories or opinions. It's not fair to ask that our children become test pilots, risking the quality of their education. 
At this time, uh, I do not feel as a parent who is deeply invested in the success of Brookline's educational school system, I've lived here most of my life, um, that we have spent enough time as a group um, engaging with parents and stakeholders on this issue. This proposal constitutes a major change. It is very significant. And more conversation, uh, or at least I feel that more conversation and sharing of information is necessary, including a transparent and holistic analysis of various uh, pools of data and results. Look, true progress lies in closing achievement gaps, expanding access to courses for all, providing comprehensive support system and options, encouraging students to challenge them, themselves to the fullest potential, and fostering a culture of inclusivity that celebrates diverse talents and backgrounds. The data suggests that your proposals may run counter to these goals. Said another way, trying to achieve, uh, trying to drive equal outcomes may be different than providing equal opportunity. We all have the same love for our schools and desire to provide cutting edge uh, teaching methods and education to our community. I therefore urge you to hear and respect the concerns that are being expressed tonight. Thank you so much for your time and all your hard work. Thank you, Mr. Bitran. Next we have Mr. Ruby Kitov. Hi, I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Ruby Kitov. I'm the parent of a senior at BHS, and I've had all three of my children go through the Brookline Public Schools. I'd like to start by thanking the school committee members for all of their work. I've been listening carefully to the debate around deleveling in the ninth grade. Uh, I've come to the conclusion personally that Brookline should reconsider the deleveling experiment that's currently being run. And I'll only raise two points today that have not been raised so far. Uh, first, such deleveling experiments have been run before and they simply do not work. Uh, people are trying time after time to try deleveling, and there are many examples. The story of Cambridge High Latin School is one that's actually been written about and published in their student newsletter, newspaper. And I quote, in the early 2000s, Cambridge High and Latin School experimented with deleveled classrooms for the ninth and 10th grade students. The goal was to achieve as much equity in the school as possible. However, in practice, it was difficult for the school to make heterogeneous classes work. According to a Boston Globe magazine article from 2003, both high achieving students and low achieving students didn't do as well as they had before. Some teachers felt as though their classes were chaotic and disorganized, and some teachers had trouble teaching students at so many different abilities in one class. If there are clear examples of deleveling not working in various places, why do the Brookline schools believe that we'll be able to succeed where so many others have failed? My second point is that beyond the lacking efficacy of deleveling, the policy in itself is very risky as the Seattle Public Schools have recently found out. Seattle has been deleveling classes for a few years. The result has been that many affluent families have moved their children to private schools. And while the population of Seattle has grown by 1% annually over the past few years, the enrollment in public schools in Seattle has dropped at a rate that is double that of the rest of Washington State public schools. The enrollment drop caused the Seattle schools to receive less funding due to lower enrollment, and they now have a major deficit problem, which is causing the school board to cancel programs. Are we really looking for Brookline to become a community that is segregated by income? I'm afraid that deleveling has the potential to drive many families into private schools, which will have a major impact on Brookline as a community over time. I hope that you will reach the right conclusion and reconsider the deleveling initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you to Mr. Kutoff and to all who participated in public comment, regardless as to your perspectives. We appreciate the passion you bring, and clearly this is a very important issue. With that, we will now move to a presentation, discussion, and possible vote on the Brookline High School ninth grade English course changes. And presenting will be Anthony Meyer, John Andrews, and Gabe McCormick. All right.
Last spring, the school committee charged us with disrupting the systems and structures resulting in the underrepresentation of historically marginalized groups in our honors and advanced classes at Brookline High School. Our approach to this work has been multi-layered, including reimagining ninth grade. This week, the entire ninth grade English team wrote a letter to the school committee, a portion of which I would like to share publicly. In the words of the ninth grade teaching professionals, the English pilot has brought together a set of best practices and uses protocols and pedagogies that are well established on our team. It uses the National Writing Project's peer response protocol for revision, the Folger Library's protocols for teaching Shakespeare, Socratic and small group seminars, and a robust writing cycle that includes 12 drafted writing pieces per year. The pilot has retained canonical texts, including Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing and Homer's The Odyssey, that have always been taught in our honors classes. And it adds a wide range of challenge options, including Min Jen Lee's Pachinko, Isabella Allende's House of Spirits, and Fedor, Fedor Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. The pilot team has developed a curriculum that draws on units, lessons, and materials that were developed by members of the team over the past 10 years, from lessons on craft analysis that challenge our strongest students to scaffolds developed to support our most struggling. The pilot has also adopted many of the assessments which have been developed and refined by the ninth grade team, including a common mid-year exam. We have been anticipating and planning for this change for 18 months since the Office of Teaching and Learning set reimagining ninth grade as a priority for the department. We are ready to engage in the work necessary to make a heterogeneous model a success through ongoing evaluation and revision." End quote. This well thought out pilot was, has highlighted the strength and excellence of the Brookline Public Schools. Through this heterogeneously grouped class, each PSB ninth grader will be able to access excellence without the influence of limiting labels that segregate our students from each other. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Anthony Meyer to introduce our team who's here presenting for you tonight. Thank you, Dr. Fortuna. Thank you, school committee, for the opportunity to present tonight on our unlevel, unleveled ninth grade pilot. Thank you to parents, guardians, community members, uh, current and future students here in person and at home um, for sharing how much you care about uh, Brookline High School education. We might not agree on everything, and I really appreciate um, uh, the passion with which people spoke. Uh, so my name is Anthony Meyer. I'm the head of school at Brookline High School. I came to BHS as an English teacher uh, in responding to literature, the ninth grade course uh, in 2004. So this is my 20th year at Brookline High School. Um, I'm gonna, yes, great. Hi folks, I'm Gabe McCormick, Senior Director of Teaching and Learning. I use he, him pronouns, and this is my 10th year as an administrator in Brookline, and I previously taught middle school and high school social studies in the Bellevue School District outside of Seattle. Hello, I'm John Andrews. Uh, I'm the English Curriculum Coordinator at Brookline High School. I've been at Brookline since 2001, uh, and I've taught all grade levels and all levels uh, in that time, and I taught for 10 years before that. So this is my 34th year teaching. Yeesh. I feel so young. Um, this is Allison Whitebone, and I am in my 29th year teaching at Brookline High School. I've taught at-risk teens in the Opportunity for Change program, ELL students for 15 years, and then mostly honors in college prep. And then now this year, teaching the pilot has been, and one course of honors, has been one of the most invigorating years of my career. Um, my name is Talmadge Nardi. Uh, I am an English teacher at the high school. Um, I, oh my goodness, she, her, hers. Um, so I, this is my fifth year at Brookline. Um, I have taught all four grade levels and I've taught mixed level, unleveled uh, honors and college prep, all of them. <laughs> um, and uh, I, this is my, after, Prior to coming to Brookline, I taught for 13 years in three different other schools, um, which were all in a heterogeneous model. Um, I am also a parent of two children at Baker School, a kindergartner and a third grader. Thanks, folks. And so we, as 
you all saw in the previews, um, we have quite a lot. Um, we are going to move through some of it very quickly because really the intent of that is to be more of like a document and, and a record. So we won't dwell deeply on every single slide we have. Um, and we're going to, Anthony and I are going to kind of lead off and try to move quickly so that then we have the, the teachers talk about the course itself. Right. Um, so um, kind of where we're going to be and just to give you a little bit of a path and preview where we're going is we're going to talk about and define the challenge, which we've heard multiple times, but we want to make sure we reiterate it. We're going to think about why reimagining ninth grade, why a new English course in specifics, um, dig into some details of the course itself, and then um, talk about some next steps. Um, there are a number of slides with a lot of data. Um, again, some of them are going to go through quickly. Some of them we will linger on a little bit more. Um, so essentially the challenge, as we have talked about and as many people have already voiced, is this issue that we've described as ongoing and persistent disparities in course level enrollment by race and IEP status. Um, part of what I'm going to lead off with is some historical data. Um, while this may feel new to some folks, this is not new. Um, like I said, this is my 10th year as an administrator in this district, and literally every year I've been here, folks have talked about this issue and described it. Um, I am specifically using some data from a school committee meeting on June 2017, um, partially because that has already been part of the public record. It was already presented in front of the school committee, even though I know many school committee members have changed, of course. Um, but in sort of intentionally, and uh, this is pre-COVID, this is pre the creation of the WISP course, and just to kind of set some context. So like we've heard, um, even in 2017, uh, most of our students were taking um, honors level classes. The data I'm going to present is for English. Um, at this presentation in 2017, math and science and social studies and other subjects were also presented at that time. So this data is all available um, in more detail. But at the time, it was about a two-third, one-third split. There is 1% listed here as English 1, which is a substantially separate special education class that we tend to refer to as small group now. Um, at that time, right, as we've talked about, the um, student participation in the different leveled courses is highly differentiated by race. Um, we can see it here, um, you know, the tall red line for black and African American students shows us that two thirds of black students were in the, what was that at the time called points of view, we would now call that college prep. Um, whereas for white, Asian, multiracial students, right, the vast majority of them are taking the honors class. Um, I added the end sizes in there later um, because they weren't in the original presentation. So we can see how many students we're talking about at each level. Um, this is also the recommendations. Um, so this was the recommendations from eighth grade to ninth grade at that time um, by disability status. And so we can see that students with disabilities are overwhelmingly recommended for the college prep or standard level class, whereas um, students without disabilities were far more likely to be recommended for honors. Um, at that time, only 11% of students with disabilities or students with an IEP were being recommended for the honors level class. Um, this is enrollment in Brookline High courses 9 through 12, or Brookline High English courses. Um, so this was all four grade levels at once. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this slide, but um, suffice to say that we saw similar disparities um, that we see now. So we're going to shift to the current course and where we are now. Um, so last year, right, ninth grade English, two options, college prep and honors. 75% um, of our students in ninth grade took the honors course last year, and 24% took college prep. So part of our hope here is to, um, again, show that really at 75% of our student body, the honors course is a wide range of students um, already. And so this year, right, um, kind of just adding this extra bit to the slide, um, you can see that this year, 112 students are engaged in the pilot course. And we really appreciate the folks who opted in and thought this was a good idea. Um, so that's taking about 21% of our students. Um, but we still have about 60% of our students in honors and 16% of our students in college prep. Um, so the next two slides are going to look at some of the racial breakdown. Um, and I'm going to spend a little time on them because they look similar, but they are quite different, and it's important. Um, so this, show, this slide shows how students are of a particular racial group are distributed across the courses. So just using Asian students because they're the 
top line alphabetically, right? Of the 104 ninth graders who identify as Asian, 16 of them are in college prep, 69 of them are in honors, and 19 of them are in the pilot course, right? The unleveled course. Um, so again, you can kind of review this down, um, but I think the um, next slide is sort of more relevant. We just wanted to make sure both were available. So again, this is the same students, the current ninth grade cohort. Um, they are down kind of the left-hand side. Um, and then this is the racial breakdown of enrollment in the current classes. So as we've seen in the past, um, Black and Latina students are sort of overrepresented in our college prep sections. Um, whereas they are underrepresented in our college sec coll our honors sections. Um, but notably for the pilot course, um, it's closer to our overall student population racially, right? So we have 19% of our Asian and white students are a little bit underrepresented in the, in the pilot course. And um, our black students are a little bit overrepresented, but our multiracial and Latina students are pretty much in the ratios they are for the ninth grade class overall. Um, I just want to kind of give a sense of who has chosen these different courses. Gabe, okay, quick question. For the, um, for the pilot class, do you happen to know the, or the rough breakdown of the recommendations for uh, college prep and honors for the pilot class? Yeah, thank you. Um, so every student who opted in for the pilot had to show a backup option in case we couldn't put them in that course. Um, and it's essentially 50-50. Uh, so it's actually not quite representative of the total district, right? Um, but it's about half and half. Um, where do I go here? Um, and then this is the current enrolled ninth grade class um, and just kind of the percentage of students who have an IEP in these different courses. So um, overall, Brookline High has about 18% students with an IEP. Um, so the unleveled course, again, is pretty close to representative of the number of students with disabilities, whereas in college prep, about 41% of the students in those classes have IEPs, and honors, only 1.5% of students in the current ninth grade class enrolled in honors have active IEPs. Gabe, I, did you not show something that said that 11% of students with disabilities were taking honors in that 2017 data? Correct. That was, yes. In 2017, it was higher. Do you know what accounts for the discrepancy? I do not. I don't think we've done the level of detailed data look to, to figure that out. It's a very good question, though. All right, so, um, so we have decided instead of layering a bunch of research in, we're going to embed a few pieces. But um, as has been referenced by some of the public commenters, um, uh, part of John Hattie's work, uh, he in his analysis um, identifies that tracking has had minimal effects on learning outcomes, and in his words, no one profits, and that the effect on equity outcomes are more profound and negative. Um, so uh, we're gonna shift to talking about reimagining ninth grade. Thank you, Gabe, thank you, everybody. Um, great, you're gonna trust me with this. Um, uh, so I think um, we want to talk about reimagining ninth grade most broadly, and I think in the context of tonight, we're focused on English, we're focused on the work that we're doing in the core academics. I would say more broadly, reimagining ninth grade um, is about the use of our facilities, the use of our campus, the use of the 22 building, it's about hub advisory, it's about deans and guidance counselors and student support. So so when I talk about reimagining ninth grade and we think about reimagining ninth grade, it's much broader than in some ways we're talking about it in response to this uh, ninth grade English pilot and expanding it. Um, as we have communicated to parents, guardians, and caregivers, um, reimagining ninth grade has two central uh, areas of focus that we want to expand access to our most rigorous course content. I don't think anyone doubts the number of wonderful and hard courses and the beauty and the diversity of our offerings. I think we all know 
that the numbers, um, how our demographics in those higher end, most rigorous courses do not reflect the demographic diversity of Brookline High School. I also think we all believe that that's an issue that needs attention. The other piece um, within both WISP and English is the notion of fostering a sense of community. That's community within a classroom. That's community among a ninth grade cohort. Um, and that's a part of a larger Brookline High School community. So, um, we began this work, um, and, and we'll give you somewhat of a timeline here, um, but as we were working with the core academic curriculum coordinators, teachers, and our eighth grade counterparts uh, in fall of 22, fall of 2022, we wanted to be clear what the whys were that drove and are driving this work. Um, the first uh, one I will not read verbatim, it's what you just heard. The idea that we want to ensure access to the full, the riches of Brookline High School, um, and that we believe all kids deserve high quality, engaging courses, rigorous courses, um, that drives this work. Um, we believe it's key um, that there is a healthy and integrated BHS community in students' first year. We have deep concerns. I have deep concern as a parent and as an educator about eighth grade students making decisions that declare, I am an honors student, I am a standard student. We believe much more strongly in the notion that young people can do honors level work and need our support to access that work. Um, so, and, in, and I, I think Jen also spoke, one of our um, public commenters spoke about stress and anxiety and the space for courses like WISP and responding to LIT um, as places where kids might feel some level of stress in a larger high school experience that as much as I would love to say otherwise is oftentimes a stressful one um, given pressures in school and pressures around post-secondary planning. Um, I've, no, I've noted this before, we want, and we, I've heard this for 20 years since I've been at Brookline High School, we want our classrooms to reflect our demographic diversity. They do not. And so reimagining ninth grade is about offering our eighth grade students as they transition to the high school opportunities to have that access to honors level courses and advanced level courses. Um, and then finally, and I, I want to be very clear, this is not a shot at our eighth grade and middle school colleagues, um, but we want to wherever possible, help support students in making leveling decisions. It has been well documented that we have very different programs uh, in our middle schools, time on learning, um, very different processes around recommending um, courses uh, for eighth graders as they transition into ninth grade courses, and varied understanding of our really strong eighth grade teachers and colleagues about what the high school program uh, is, what are the requirements of courses, and as much as we've shared that over time and collaborated around that, we think that where possible, it makes sense to inherit kids from the eighth grade, support them in hard classes in ninth grade, and then help them make decisions. Because this is about reimagining ninth grade, and I feel strongly um, that we have many different levels, advanced, honors, multi-leveled, unleveled throughout the high school, and that is part, uh, one of the real beauties of Brookline High School. So those are some whys, I don't know, you, okay. Um, I'm going to, I'm not going to dwell on this, but again, um, a bit of a timeline of how at different times where discussions of course levels or discussions of racial disparities have come uh, before the school committee in different ways, right? So sometimes at curriculum subcommittee, sometimes in front of the school committee. So there's a number of examples from 2017. Um, and again, I think it's important to highlight that this was a regular discussion before the pandemic. I think in some ways we lost track of things during the pandemic, and this is um, in many ways a reconnection to that um, and kind of all the way from 2017 to his most recently last June, right? The final school committee meeting of the last year, um, Alice McGarvey Thompson, who was the, the student rep at the time, um, made a very strong presentation on the subject. 
um, with some focus on course recommendations. So um, again, kind of the, this will be the last thing that kind of reconnects us to 2017. But at the time, um, we had been sending students to the MSAN Student Conference, and it's now it's called the Multicultural Student Achievement Network. It was before the um, Minority Student Achievement Network. Um, they changed their name. But um, what you'll see is a, just a short um, minute and 20 second video of students reacting after they had come back from that conference. And we had brought, um, I was cha actually chaperoned that conference in North Carolina with them, um, along with a couple of teachers from the high school. And um, they had responded to data. We were asked to bring data about um, student discipline, student performance on standardized exams, student enrollment in AP and advanced classes disaggregated by race so that the students in attendance could analyze it. And so this is some of their reactions, um, and then we'll keep going. This was a student-created video. It's sad that people in your community who are just like you are failing you and and like you just don't know what to do. You feel like you're stuck, you feel like you're just lost and you don't know how to address that situation. You don't know how or where to start. I was surprised by the number of minority students in AP classes. I expected it to be a lot higher. When I saw the data, um, I was really disheartened and it was really sad to see that this was our own school. And I want to use the opportunity to use the data to fix BHS, help BHS, and improve our school and make it a better place so we could change the data and make a difference in the school. The way I felt about the data that we learned on MSAN was really surprising to me because like the majority of black students or students of color in general didn't have the resources that they needed and I thought it was really crazy and I just felt so disappointed in the school system. So in addition, um, we want to highlight how we believe this work is also aligned with our district vision and goals. Um, Again, this is not coming out of nowhere. Um, and as Jody referenced in her opening, um, we really did feel tasked by, by all of you to address some of these issues. And this is our plan. So uh, the district vision, right, as many people may or may not have read recently, um, Brookline provides every student with an extraordinary education through enriching learning experiences and a supportive community so that they may develop to our, their fullest potential. And I believe as you hear from the, the teachers about the course itself and the experiences students have, and I know all nine of you school committee members were able to attend the course, right? I walked all of you through the course. I believe that's what you saw in this course, in this new course. Um, you all recently revised the district goals, right? Uh, turned our core values into goals. This is new this year, right? So this is your language. And in many ways, um, I had some questions about it during the process. And as I've reflected on it, I'm inspired by a lot of it. Um, and so the idea that we are emphasizing joy in learning, right? And allowing students to find and succeed at what they love, right? Ninth grade is a perfect time for that. And we're excited about bringing students to a course that will allow them to do that. Um, you asked about excellence in teaching, right? You set a goal about excellence in teaching. And I think you will see passionate, knowledgeable, and skillful teachers who have developed innovative instruction that addresses some of the concerns that folks have raised. Um, the course itself celebrates difference, the choices that students have. Um, a couple of years ago, a number of students presented about feeling unrepresented in the curriculum. They presented to high school staff. I was there. I believe Dr. Guillory was there. I don't know if it was before your time. Um, and we've made some choices embedded in the curriculum, some of the books. We added the Asian American literature course that you all approved last, last year um, that is running very well. Um, so that is core in this course. And then most importantly, and I think most relevant for this situation, the first line of this goal is we, we are committed to eliminating barriers to educational achievement in our schools. And because we know that students who start in standard classes tend to stay in standard classes all four years, I think it's reasonable to say that starting in a standard class is a barrier. And our belief, and I think you will see this in some of the data because we do have student course selection data for next year, we didn't necessarily have it at the time of the preview, but we've been able to collect it, is that this is a way to help eliminate barriers. 
right? And you said, to this end, we create policies and practices so that every student, regardless of all of these identities, receives the resources and support they need to take fullest advantage of the opportunities a Brookline education offers. Right? The course catalog at Brookline High is incredibly thick, and we want students to have a lot of good choices. And a lot of what we've heard today and in previous comments is about choice, right? And I think you will see that students will have a lot of choices in this class, and there's a lot of really good, strong opportunities in this class, and that will set them up for really good choices in grades 10, 11, and 12. Uh, lastly, right, we have a new strategic plan, um, and I would be, be a, a remiss if I did not reference that as well. And strategic plan goal one, right, is about teaching and learning and increasing the achievement for all students by establishing, implementing, and regularly assessing a consistent, high quality, and challenging curriculum delivered using evidence-based practices. I think that's what you'll see when you hear about this class. Um, the data has been, or some of this research has been talked about, um, and um, I appreciate the folks who took the time to read this very thoughtfully. Um, and this particular quote that I pulled is, is, was very compelling to me, that creating a learning environment in which all students feel valued and treated as capable learners is the first step in institutionalizing a commitment to both high academic standards and equal educational opportunities. All right, so now you're going to hear about the course. Um, hopefully, we move through that quick enough. Um, the kind of the pathway for this is they're going to the the team is going to talk about the course the core. Okay. Um, the team will talk about the core concept and the design of the course, the instructional approach, um, some examples of texts and assignments. Um, we'll have a lot of data on results so far, and we've had some unexpected benefits as well that we did not necessarily predict they weren't necessarily goals and we we're realizing those benefits as well all right um we just want to take one minute we know we are an hour over time here um but we want to just take one minute i think uh before we share some exciting news about the pilot, uh, to pause and just thank our 112 pilot families who volunteered for this program. Um, your support has been critical, and we're so grateful to you for supporting this vision. Um, and to our 112 pilot students, um, many of whom are watching tonight, one of whom is in the room with us, um, we are super proud of you. Um, because of you, the pilot has proven that equity and rigor are not mutually exclusive. And you inspire us every day. Here, why we come to work. Let me do this. Do this first one. I'll do the first one. Okay. So, um, some of the goals for the pilot. The goals for the pilot were established by a group of educators, uh, English teachers, and special ed teachers um, who met to just sort of develop the initial plan. Um, so, our goal is to establish a new course, uh, not a halfway point between college prep and honors, but like an actually new course. Um, we're trying to set up students for success at BHS. Oh, sorry. You can help me with that. Um, and create a strong entry point for all students. This is one of only two entry points that most students have into the system. Uh, we wanted to build ninth grade community and extend learning time beyond the school walls through visitors and field trips and extensions to the greater Boston area. Um, and we also wanted to increase parent and caretaker involvement. This is a great age to involve parents in. A lot of parents are very nervous about this transition. Um, so we also did that. Hi. So we use a combination of whole class texts, choice texts, whole class writing assignments, and some writing assignments that have choice. Um, we all participated in the New York Times Tiny Memoir Contest, and we had an honorable mention. Um, the closest other honorable mention was from Dana Hall School, my alma mater. So that was pretty exciting. Do you have the clicker? I do. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Great. All right. Um, and so we uh, we have some different options. I think the many of you who've come to visit have gotten to see that in action. Um, so we do five texts throughout the year that are whole class texts. And then we do three texts or three units um, where students have a choice. Um, and we think of those as mild, medium, spicy. There's, there's more nuance than that, but I think it sort of simplifies it a little bit. 
Um, and we have students choosing at every level, as you can see up here. Um, it's not always the same students in the groups. There's a lot of fluidity. One of the things that we read about was important in a heterogeneous model was that students had flexible groupings so that um, sometimes they're with peers who maybe have a similar academic background. Sometimes they're with peers who are interested in a similar genre. It's very flexible. And so it's never like the same group of kids in the, those, those groups. Um, there's some sample texts at the bottom. I'm not going to run through them all, and some of them have been mentioned. So one of our goals was to get the students out in the literary community of Boston and to create a literary community at Brookline High School. And we're just continuing what we've been starting over the years with the Poetry Festival and guest authors and poets. But we've really expanded to go to the ART at Harvard to see performances. We had one that everyone went to, and then we have several more that people go on Sundays with Miss Nardi. Um, <laughs> and then we went on a tour, a historical tour of Chinatown. And then we had a beautiful banquet luncheon at Halo Moon. Thank you, Halo Moon. And we all read maps and we went and found all of those plaques all over the place and learned about the beautiful historical um, you know, experience that people can have when they're in Chinatown. It's not just about food. And Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum is coming up on the 21st, where my friend from high school is going to give us a beautiful tour. And it's part of our mystery unit, where we will be going to, we're not, we're going to be exploring and learning about art using, using um, visual thinking strategy, which is a Boston College protocol, but we'll also be trying to solve the mystery of where's the art from that big art heist, which broke so many people's hearts. Um, and then we'll end the year with food truck festivals um, and a food memoir presentation, which we'll invite the families to, to sort of end our beautiful community-based um, year. Am I next too? Oh yes, sorry, okay. So um, all of our community connections are linked to the themes of the books that we're reading. So when we were in Chinatown, we did our more than ABC unit, which is based on the AAPI unit that I started last year with Ms. Sicaria. And we, in addition with the half god of rainfall, that was a lot of Greek mythology, which will end the year with the Odyssey. So they'll have that prior knowledge. So everything's connected to the themes that we're learning about in literature. And when we go to the museum, I'm sure the kids will be finding connections there as well, looking at the beautiful artwork. And then um, we love parent caregiver involvement, which is a big change because usually I have an eighth grader and a 10th grader. So I know the deal. They go to high school and we're not allowed to contact the teachers anymore. Um, but we love parent involvement. We send an introduction survey about and we ask for information about their children and their goals. Um, we sign, we ask parents to sign off on book selections or at least we tell them about them um, and help their you know, them negotiate with their student, um, sign off on course selections, invitations to chaperone, we love chaperones, um, invitations to 10 minute meetings, and sending out just quarterly emails and newsletters and surveys all throughout the year. So that's been a wonderful change. All right, I've spoken about a few of these things, so we'll just touch real quick here. Um, we paired each of the units this year with um, topics explored in WISP. So that we, we called it a humanities connection, not that we are studying the same place or the same author, but there were power, community, wealth, and identity. Those are the four parts of the year. Um, and I sort of touched on this before, students have a mix of whole class assignments and a mix of self-selected. Um, and there's some variety of text, some variety of writing assignments, some variety of homework. Um, the fluidity is crucial. Uh, what we found about the fluidity is that a lot of students start easy and get harder as the year has gone on. Um, so there's a lot of students, one of the comments we got from the student survey was that I was really nervous at the beginning. I was getting used to having homework for the first time because we didn't have homework in eighth grade. And so it took me a little while to get settled. But once I got settled, I really wanted to try the harder text. And that student was a student in the COTOT section with a COTOT accommodation who went on to uh, request honors for next year. 
Uh, the instruction takes a UDL approach, approach the uni universal design for learning approach, um, and it's supported by training and observations by the landmark school outreach consultants. I cannot express how grateful we are to have that training. I've taught for 18 years, and there's some times where I'm like, there's nothing you could teach me. And then I met Adam Hickey, and I was like, oh my gosh, he blew my mind. So we have been incorporating all kinds of things from Landmark Outreach, and he comes, and Margo comes to observe us all the time and give us feedback and move us forward in our practice. Um, each unit has a connection to a community event, um, field trips, student exhibitions, guest authors and poets. Those are all connected, like interspersed throughout the year, which Ali talked about a lot. All right. This is actually my favorite part. So um, as teachers who've taught honors and teachers who have children, and some of whom whose children who may end up in this course, um, the pilot is really concerned about maintaining rigor. So uh, the pilot includes the whole class instruction of canonical texts that are taught in the ninth grade honors. The team broader than us that planned this said you cannot get rid of the odyssey or much ado about nothing like those are critical students have such great success and it's such great preparation for 10th grade so we kept those we do those all together um, the pilot adds higher challenge texts that go beyond the length and lexile of our honors classes um, so i'm i am in the system with other parents and what i hear is that some eighth graders are bored um, and that makes sense developmentally maybe <laughs> um, so we wanted to say, what could we do that would really make them like feel like they were challenged? And so we do the House of the Spirits, Pachinko, and Crime and Punishment are the, the three of the challenging options. Um, and you would be delighted, and you're welcome to come back to see what kids are experiencing and how proud they are of doing that work. And uh, those are books I would normally teach in 11th or 12th grade if I'm thinking, like, what could all kids do? But we have so many kids, and the number of kids who signed up for crime and punishment, like, I'm so proud of them. Um, so uh, all ninth grade classes have 12 drafted writing pieces. I think uh, Jody mentioned that. Um, it's sca there are scaffolded assignments. There's multiple drafts and revisions. That's a department requirement that has not changed. All ninth grade classes include the same vocabulary and grammar standards. And students in all uh, ninth grade English classes take a common mid-year. Um, which we'll talk about later. Uh, the ninth grade team has been discussing some other common practices, including a common final for the end of the year. Oh, that's, sorry. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to jump in and give these two a break for a second and um, interject with a little more research. So this is a piece that comes from a study um, from the US Department of Education. It is from 1999. However, um, it's somewhat unique in that it was a study that examined bachelor's degree attainment and what are the factors that help students actually finish a bachelor's degree right we do talk a lot about college access and making sure students can enter college successfully however students completing college successfully is incredibly critical um, and so one of the pieces that they looked at and that they um, determined is that the impact of a high school curriculum of high academic intensity and quality quality on degree completion is far more pronounced and positively for and positively for African American and Latino students than any other pre college indicator of academic resources. And so when we think about equity and we think about making sure that students are ready for college and ready to be really successful in college, I think it is our obligation that we make sure that every student has a truly excellent curriculum. And I think the course that we've designed or really that these teachers have designed, I have not designed it um, is critical. We can't let any student not have that access, right? It is, I believe that is our obligation at a public school. And so knowing that there are non-school-based factors that impact student success, of course, but as a school and as a school district, we have power over these school-based factors. OK, so I just want you to look at this picture for a moment, and I want you to just wonder, what are people doing here in this? Um, little table. And these are um, four great friends who chose to work together on a project. And each person is completing their responsibilities for a collaborative um, group project that ended up earning um, an A. They were preparing for a literature circle book club. Um, 
we have pro proven protocols that work. We're using kind of the greatest hits of Brookline High School English Department. Um, we have the Folger Library Shakespeare model with much ado about nothing, which we're studying right now. We use variations of the Socratic seminar method that Margaret Metzger brought to us. We use Brown University's performance cycle, which I learned about at the Matsall conference, and the National Writing Project, which you brought Miss Nardi, thank you so much, to us. And it was so amazing because we ended up getting an honorable mention in a writing contest. And the students learned how to edit their own papers by helping each other edit their writing. So it was a wonderful process. Um, the most exciting thing is continuing my tradition of the daily journaling and note taking habit, which I'm grateful you were willing to try. So we're trying to get students to write 200 or more handwritten pages in their black and white composition books each year. And that was proven at Princeton that students who were handed a notebook and a pencil earned higher grades than and learned more and were happier than students who took notes on laptops. So we're just sort of continuing that using the landmark studies two column notes method and writing in our journals almost every day. So it's pretty inspiring and reflective and I can't wait till the end of the year when they're all looking at their full journals. Um, I think a lot of you have, are familiar with Landmark, but I just wanted to highlight a few of them. I'm not going to read through all of them, but um, as you can see, uh, these are not radical things. These are practices that are considered best teaching, right? For example, like providing an exemplar of what you're looking for or providing a rubric on all assignments. Um, but some of them uh, are ones that maybe were newer, like you know, a schema activation, a schema activator. Uh, he talks about how important it is for if you're going to teach a topic, like showing pictures of where is this? Like if we're talking about Paris, like what are some images of Paris that sort of activate what you know um, about that place? Um, so most of these things, I just wanna emphasize, like these are not things that like take up a lot of class time. Um, many of them are optional for like sentence starters or other things like that. A higher performing student just doesn't use them, but they're in that packet if kids want them. Um, and so the landmark folks come around and, and watch what we're doing, compliment us on what we're doing, and then also say, hey, but you should also try this, and then we move forward. Um, and I feel like they've come maybe four times so far this year. Uh, so they come pretty frequently. Let's see, did I lose Allie? <laughs> okay, all right, uh, hold on, I see the assistant here. All right, so we're gonna go a little bit into the understanding of the population of the levels. Um, I am the numbers person on our team of two here. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, oh, we saw this slide before. Uh, so this is just like who's who's in the who's in each of the levels, including the pilot, which is 112 of our students. Um, I think this one is important just to ground us a little in that we do have a heterogeneous population in the pilot, um, but it is quite different from the other two. Um, and this was an opt-in program this year. And so we took the people who volunteered. Um, and so what that looks like is, you know, I think notably, right, like in, in the uh, exceeds expectations portion, the highest score you could earn on the eighth grade MCAS, 51% um, of students in honors earned that highest level, whereas 20% did in the pilot um, and 7% in college prep. And so you could see like the pilot is sort of circled, like centered around like most the the around 50% of our kids are in meeting expectations, whereas like around 50% are in uh, honors are exceeding expectations. So it's a di little bit different. And we have a pretty you know substantial portion, 17% who are partially meeting expectations coming in um, with their MCAS scores. That's just a, a piece of data that we know about them. I have my water as well. My water bottle behind there. All right, so given that the populations are not similar, I mean, there, there has quite some substantial, substantial differences. Um, hold on. Um, we wanted to try to compare them this, as best we could. One of the questions we had was, what about these kids who are exceeding expectations? Like, is how does the pilot affect those students? And so what you can see here is that um, students who, about half of the students in the ninth grade earn a 525 or higher um, on the MCAS. 
I just we'll just pause there and say go Brookline. That is a very high score. The highest score is a five, like the exceeds is a 530 or higher. Um, so most of our students are in this very high category. Half of our students, sorry, are in this very high category. Um, and when we did the analysis, there was no statistical difference between that top half um, of students, whether they were in the pilot or in honors, it, we couldn't find a difference between those students. Um, so for folks who are wondering like, hey, is it gonna hurt my student to be mixed in with this, this mix, mixed grouping um, if they're a high performer? The answer is no, like the data says no. Um, in the students who are in the uh, lower half of MCAS scores coming in in eighth grade, you can see that they're a little bit all over the place, um, that the students in the lower half, the honors students are closer to that 525 mark, that, that halfway point. Um, and then the other ones are sort of mixed in. So, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. The, that's a really good point. The MCAS is different from our mid-year. So in a really important way that I just want to highlight. Um, so our, I think we're going to talk about the mid-year, the actual structure of it. But our mid-year exam, what we're talking about is, is a writing exam. So it's an exam where you come in and you write for 90 minutes. Uh, you read something very short and write for 90 minutes. It is not a reading exam. And so the MCAS is a combination of a reading and a writing. So again, we're not comparing to exactly the same things here, but we did want to sort of see like, you know, where people's achievement levels fell. Um, we're going to talk just... in more detail about what the mid-year looks like. So we'll get into that in just a second. Could I ask oh. a quick clarification? I'm sorry to interrupt. Could you, do you mind just repeating what you said earlier? If I understood it right, you said participation in the unleveled program is not hurting students who are high in the MCAS scoring. Could you just, did I understand that correctly? And do you mind just explaining yes. that a little bit more? I didn't, yep. I didn't yep. understand how you could be, I didn't understand how those two, how that relationship is being uh, analyzed or, or, uh, sorry, you're making I'm not, that claim. Yes, I'm not speaking uh, holistically. I'm speaking about these two data points. I think that's what Gabe was asking me to clarify. So we're looking at what they came in with with an MCAS, um, an eighth grade MCAS, which I think Ali would agree is like a pretty good predictor of how eighth, ninth grade is going to feel, right? Like we can, if we see a student, their MCAS score tells us a lot about them. Obviously, not everything. Um, so we're comparing that to the midterm, which is our only common assessment that we've done so far this year um, across all of the levels. We do all common assessments within the pilot, but between honors, college prep, and the pilot, that's the only assessment that we've done so far this year. And so what we wanted to see was, do kids who score in the top half of the class, a 525 on the MK, eighth grade ELA MCAS or higher, how does that compare to their mid-year score? And what we saw was that there is no statistical difference between the two groups, uh, the honors and, and uh, the pilot. Does that make sense? <laughs> sure. I'm gonna need to yes, that makes sense. That makes sense. Essentially, you couldn't tell based on their midterm score whether they were in honors or unleveled. Um, is that correct? That's correct. OK, is, thank you. You want me to say it one more time? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, so. Uh, we're comparing two data points, right? The MCAS, the eighth grade ELA MCAS, right? Which is the most recent ELA data that we have about our population. Um, and the score that they got on the, the mid-year, which is a writing assessment, because that is- The mid-year of what? Uh, the mid-year exam. Yeah, why don't we, why don't we, Ali's gonna take a quick detour. We're gonna do this a little later. I'm just gonna quick detour and explain what the mid-year exam looks like. And then I'll come back and say that again now okay um so our mid-year exam is something that we've been doing for several years on the ninth grade team where every ninth grader takes the exact same midterm exam we have the first 50 we have the vocab 100 for the freshman 100 vocab words and we have a multiple choice um you know 25 question multiple choice um vocab test but then we, everyone gets the same short excerpt, a poem or a short story, 
has to read it, annotate it, and then write a beautiful analytical response, all within 90 minutes. Okay, so we timed it ourselves. We do that. We do norming together as a team. But the trick to this, and what's so amazing, is that we spend time norming after everybody's taken the exam. We look at samples from past years, and we all determine what is an A, what is a B, what are we looking for, what does everyone need to teach better next year, and we really use that to inform our teaching. But the best part of it is that we exchange the classes and the teacher who grades the exam is not your student's teacher it's a blind grading of the mid-year and so the scores that come out are the most honest and unbiased that we can possibly get in a valuable experience which is everyone's reading the same poem or story writing a beautiful analytical response and then an anonymous teacher. You never know who read your teacher. We, we never, we cannot tell you. It's like, I even forgot. It's like, done. But they, the students know, no matter who you have as your teacher in ninth grade, no matter which level you're in, no matter where you are, like, you're being evaluated the same as everyone else. You're being assessed, and they love it. It keeps everyone honest. And after that mid-year, when they get a great grade, you should see how much taller people stand. It's beautiful. Okay, so just to make sure I got it. Mm -hmm. Data point one is eighth grade MCAS ELA. Data point two is ninth grade English exam, and it's standard across all all classes. And yes. so this is roughly, Jody. This is as apples to apples as we can get. Yes, Thank it's you. humans. <laughs> okay. Um, chat GPT, another thing. Okay. Um, but yeah. So. It's oh, it's handwritten. It's not tight. Yes. And I just want to clarify that we do a common vocab as well. These numbers are just about the writing. This is just the writing portion of the exam that we're looking at right here. Okay. So can, you, can you say the, the conclusion? So, so now I'm going to draw the conclusion. Thank you. Um, and I do think this is an important one because we are very concerned about the top half of the class. Like how does an unleveled model affect the top half of the class? And what this is showing, so that black line is marking the halfway point. Half of our students are to the right and half of our students are to the left of, across the whole ninth grade. And so on the right side, um, you see students who scored a 525 or higher, which is sort of the middle point of, of MCAS scores for our school. Um, and the, it's, as you look at that graph, you can see it's blue and orange. That's the pilot and that's the honors classes. Um, there's very few kids um, from college prep who even land on that side. Um, and for those students, there was no statistical difference between the pilot and the honors students. I know I keep going back between unleveled and pilot, but that's the same thing. <laughs> so we, from this graph, now this is one data point. So I just, for those of you who are data nerds, you know, this is not to say this is the be all end all, but we found this very promising to indicate that the students at, on the upper end of MCAS scores in eighth grade are doing as well, whether they're in the unleveled section or in the honor section. So um, if I could ask, if I'm understanding sort of your explanation right, um, this scatter plot is being used to argue that for a given MCAS score in the higher range, uh, whether a student is in honors or unleveled doesn't predict their performance on the, on the writing exam. Correct. If you look on the left left hand side, it, it's hard to eyeball maybe, but it also seems that you know for for students who are scoring in the lower half on MCAS, um, whether they're in unleveled or college prep, also doesn't predict. Uh, their it's not a huge on, difference. On the, the the pilot yeah. scores a little higher than college prep, but uh -huh. not that much on on the lower half of school. Okay, I I actually yeah. I, I don't understand how this scatter plot shows that point. Um, so this is this scatter plot is based on uh, a regression analysis, which uh, is a it takes into account a lot of different factors. So any factor that we have in the Aspen portal, like a student's race, a student's gender, a student's IEP status, a student's low income status, it accounts for those and sort of separates out whether they were in the pilot honors or college prep from all those other factors that we have. Those aren't all the factors that make up a student. We know, but those are the ones that we have in Aspen to, to use. No, I'm sorry. 
Okay. I think we should move on, but if you want to come back to this, we can come back to this with more questions. Um, but I want to make sure that we're getting all the other data points in so you know where you want to spend your time. Okay. Uh, oh, I think this one is. Um, so in addition to the mid-year exam and MCAS scores, right, we just have a few other pieces. So um, these are the current ninth grade students first semester grades um, as identified by Grace, race and course. Um, obviously these grades are averaged, right? So um, just in case anyone needs it, um, a 4.0 would be an average of an A, a 3.0 would be an average of a B, right, and so on. Um, numerically and so um, part of what our question was right are how are students doing um, I think and this is maybe part of a larger separate discussion but generally speaking students in honors earn higher grades than students in college prep and this actually cuts across subject areas um, we found that um, and so what we wanted to look at was our students in the pilot how are their grades right and um, you know some of these end sizes are very small Right, particularly in the pilot, but not only in the pilot. Um, and we debated because typically uh, we don't report n sizes smaller than 10, um, but we felt like we wanted to have a complete picture here. Um, and so pilot um, grades are sort of in between, right? Certainly on average at the bottom um, in the totals, they're in between. Um, I think there's a question about our Latina students um, and, oh, sorry, no. Um, no, they're all sort of in between. Never mind. Um, I'm going to keep moving. But Steven, yeah? Sorry. So, Gabe, wouldn't this cut against the hypothesis, though? Wouldn't, wouldn't you expect to see Black and Latinx students overperform in college prep in comparison to their white peers? Why would you say that? Well, if the hypothesis is that they're self-selecting, they're overrepresenting in their self-selection into college prep, then presumably there's there's talent there's there's uh, there's wasted potential in college prep that's overrepresented in college prep that we want to move into honors, but that's not borne out by the by the first semester grades. Well, we have about an equal number of black, well, if we use black students for example, right? We have about an equal number of black students in college prep in the pilot. I think the pilot offered an opportunity for some students, right? And this is hypothesis at this point. Um, I think if we looked at this chart when we from last year, for example, when we had two levels, it's a really good question, um, and we don't have that today. But that's something we can. I, I guess I'm asking because I'm I'm looking actively for equity measures that would that would yeah. confirm the hypothesis. I mean, I think part of my concern, because um, again, lots of things go into a student's grade, right? A student with ability could still not perform, right? Um, they could just choose to not turn in work. That was me as a ninth grade student, frankly. Yeah. Um, and so grades aren't always representative of the student's true capability; it's their production. Okay. Right. And when you think about late penalties and things like that, it can be a lot of different factors. So I think it's can't draw too many conclusions here. That's but so, we so do you know argue that this, in fact, is self-reinforcing still at this stage. Yeah, and we do know that students' grades are a very important part of their overall success. Right. We want students earning credits. We want students in ninth grade to earn full seven credits so that they stay on track. And a high GPA is still very important for college access. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, are the college prep teachers teaching similar with similar um, strategies and similar um, curriculum as the pilot. Uh, speaking for the department, there are core texts and experiences that kids have in college prep and in honors classes, but there's also um, some differences in speed and amount of sh uh, scaffolding and support that needs to go into the college prep versus the honors class. Mm -hmm. um, so yes and no. <laughs> if no, I but I'm thinking of the college prep students who could probably benefit from a lot of the strategies that you're using. And, sure. And I'm wondering if that's happening or not. Y yes. Um, I mean, as Ali has said, the course is pulling from all the work we've been doing in ninth grade in lots of different uh, ways. So we, it's mm -hmm. drawing on things that we've been using in our college prep and our honors classes before. Um, so yes. Thank you. I think um, Ali appropriately covered like the description of the ninth grade mid-year, so we're going to move on a little bit. Yeah, that's what I think we got it. Oh, 
Oh, Anthony wants me to say that all of the core academic courses have a mid-year exam. We've talked about the English one being common, but social studies and math and science all have a mid-year exam as well. Um, so this is um, the mid-year exam results uh, disaggregated by race. Um, so again, by course and race. And so one of the questions was, how are students in the pilot doing right, compared to their peers in other courses? Um, and again, if one of our goals is racial equity, right, we want students to be successful in the new courses. Um, they, they, there's a bit of a range, right? I think, generally speaking, um, students in the pilot are performing better on the mid-year exam than students in college prep and less well than students in honors, right? And we saw that on the scatter plot as well, right? Um, I think- Is this um, the same test? This is the same test for all three, yep. And as Ali was saying, it is, normed and scored blind right um so i think there's a question about um our black students again the end sizes are very small and 76.9 and 75 are quite close um but um again generally speaking students in the pilot are performing better on the mid-year than students in college prep which is promising um so then um the team did a mid-year survey um, so this is something that is different than what was previewed because we didn't have the full data available yet. And so um, there were a number, um, actually let me just back up so folks aren't worrying about it yet. <laughs> um, but um, they surveyed students in all three of the classes, so college prep, honors, and the pilot um, with the same questions and um, kind of ran them together. So um, I think Talmadge and I might tag team these a bit because we just put these in this afternoon because we just got the data back from the other courses. Great. Um, and this is a selection of questions. There are many, but um, these ones felt particularly meaningful in terms of students. It's essentially like student satisfaction with courses. OK, so um, this first one asks a question about building community among uh, different students in your English class. Um, I just want to say, like, our, our we have a team of seven English teachers um, in the ninth grade. Um, and almost all of them, except maybe me, no, I think there's maybe two teachers who don't, but most teachers teach multiple levels, right? So you have, there's no, there's not like honors teachers and college prep teachers, right? There's, te most teachers teach one college prep class and one honors class or one uh, unleveled class and one um, honors class like Allie does. So um, I just, I think our team statement that we sent you uh, speaks to the community we have among with each other and also the community that we can build with our classes. I mean, I will say that the pilot in fours and fives, uh, you know, outranked everybody else. But, um, but I think that like all of these are good results. Like we're happy with all of these. Um, and so yeah, so I just think that's a, a positive slide for our for our team. All right, this is a super interesting one. Um, this asks how easy ask students how easy is it to keep up with the workload or pace in this course? Um, and I think we can see that the pilot is a very challenging course for students um, in terms of pace and workload. Um, obviously, there's a mix of students in there, and so what it means to, you know, what kind of work they're doing and how challenging it is differs a little bit. Um, but I also am seeing some stuff uh, on the other end, on the opposite end, around college prep students feeling like that class is too easy for them. Um, and that makes me wonder if the pilot might be a good choice for them. Feel free to jump in if you feel like there's, I'm missing something here. Um, all right, let's see. Um, this one it asks, how does ninth grade English compare to eighth grade English? And I think I speak for uh, Allie and also our colleague Marissa, who is at home with her infant, um, who's the, the special ed teacher who works on the pilot as well. Um, I, we're just so proud to see that, uh, that our, our curriculum is much harder than eighth grade English as it should be, right? Um, but it's actually uh, the results that we're seeing are that there's very few kids um, in the pilot who feel that the work that we're giving them um, is, is easier than their eighth grade class. Most of them are, think, are saying that it's in the threes and fours, and that's what we want. It doesn't need to be much harder, right? It needs to be like appropriately harder. Um, so I think that was also felt positive to us. All right, this is another point where I think we have a lot of pride. One of the goals, the promises we made to students, our 112 students, we said, when you come to this course, you will get choices. 
Um, and that's the part that's different. I think there's been a lot of talk about like what is different about the pilot and the choice point is, is really important. Um, we wanted students to feel like that they had some choices and we're seeing that the pilot um, is clearly doing very well on that promise. Did you want to say something? Or you, you're just helping me. What? <laughs> okay, you want to jump in? Yeah, just one more quick point on the choice question, right? Because we heard, we've heard a lot about choice, right? And I think Brookline High, again, prides itself on choice to a degree that was surprising to me when I first came to the district, um, that a high school offers this level of choice. And I think one of the, the things that this shows, right, and one of the, the goals of this class is that even when students are in the same class, we can still provide that choice that is in some ways defining of Brookline High. Right? This is still is a Brookline High course. This still has a lot of options for students and um, one class can still contain choice. Okay. Um, and this is kind of a funny question in that the students in all of these courses have not taken the other course. Um, so bear that in mind. Um, but we just wanted to know because we, we had you know, we promised them this would be a good experience for them. We wanted to know if it really was. Um, and uh, most of our students said that they would take the pilot again. Um, a few said that they would uh, prefer honors, and a very small number said they would have chosen college prep. I also just have, this is, you know, newish data. We just got this back from the end of the quarter. Um, but the, those number of kids in college prep who really want to take honors is really interesting, or take the pilot. Um, and so I think, I, I, I guess I personally, I'll speak for myself, feel like we could maybe better serve those students. And I'll just add, um, in case folks can't read the numbers, like fewer than half of students currently in college prep say they would want to take college prep again next year, or if they had to do it all over again, right? Fewer than half. Um, so again, um, just a quick interjection. Um, one of the things that we have been talking about is building community, right? And one of the comments that um, John Hattie references in in discussing tracking rate or, or leveling or um, what's sometimes called streaming as well, um, is that ability grouping fosters friendship networks linked to students' group membership. And these peer groups may contribute to polarized track-related attitudes among high school students, with high school students becoming more enthusiastic, with high track students becoming more enthusiastic and low track students more alienated. And so a little bit to the question about lower grades in college prep, if you're feeling alienated in a class, you're less likely to perform, right? Um, and part of the hope of this, right, this is, was also part of the hope of WISP, is that by bringing everyone into the same community without a label, we can build deep friendships. Students make friends with the people they are in class with. That's where we spend the most time as students is in class. And there are certainly other places where students engage. There are clubs, right? Our clubs meet once a week. There are sports teams, but sports teams are built in a totally different way, right? School is not competitive. Sports are competitive. And I love sports. It's not a knock on sports at all. They're just saying they're different things. Um, and so I think, again, in ninth grade, when we were bringing eight feeder schools into the same building and into the same space, we have a unique opportunity, and this course takes advantage of that opportunity. Um, so this is also kind of brand new. These are the current ninth graders and the courses they are recommended for for next year. I just did. I, I think Allie and I uh, are just super proud of our students and also the work that um, they've done in the class and the work we've done to support them um, on this slide that you can see. So I just want to give you a little uh, explanation of course recommendations because not everybody maybe has been through that recently. Um, uh, so course recommendations at Brookline High School typically happen in starting in February, February. So right after that course catalog gets released. Um, then teachers have about a month to put in a course recommendation for a course and a level um, for all of their students. Um, and then after March 13th, there's a period where parents have a chance to override the teacher recommendation if they don't agree with it. Um, that's a highlight out there for any parents watching, like make sure that you use that period. Um, and uh, we, Teachers do this in a few different ways. So it's not a completely, uh, you know, just like Brookline loves its autonomy. So teachers have their own sort of systems of doing this. Um, I think most teachers have some kind of conversation or form that students fill out where they say what they want to do the next year. Um, and then they have a conversation around that. 
Um, the pilot took a slightly different approach. We had gotten feedback from our BIPOC students that uh, that in the past, and I think uh, many of you were here when Azavia presented um, a few years ago, that they felt like it was very disempowering for them and it actually really stuck with them a long time if a teacher recommended them for a course that was lower than they expected of themselves. And so we took that to heart and we did not want to ever have a situation where we recommended a kid lower initially, you know, like before we, they had even had a chance to say what they wanted. So this is sort of a student's first, parent first approach that the pilot took. So what we did was we explained all of the courses to all of our students. Um, and then we had a form that explained them in great detail. And they brought that form, form home and they got a parent signature on it. So the parent could say what, which of the courses and levels they wanted. Um, they could also check a box that said, I'm not sure and I want teacher advice. And they could also check a box that said, I want a 10 minute meeting with the teacher to talk about my student's course selection. And so um, I think there's a, I think that the process was a good one. I just want to say, like, I think I would recommend this process. Um, in most cases, and I think Ali would agree, that our recommendations were almost uniformly the same as the parent and the student decided together. There were one or two instances where we had a question, like that seems a little high or a little low, in which case we called the parents and had that conversation and came to an agreement together. Um, and we used, I mean, I think we both do the same thing. We look at their eighth grade MCAS score, we look at their grades in the class, we look at their behavior in the class, and we look at uh, their grade on the mid-year. Um, and and the, the, yeah, I think the skills parts of the, the, yeah. the grades, yes. Um, and so I think that it's a, it's a pretty robust process. So if a parent did have a question or they didn't, you know, they disagreed or a lot, most often, which I thought was super interesting, I had more parent, the most common question I had from parents was, my student wants to take honors. Uh, I'm wondering if they can handle it. And in most cases, those were students who had A's in class, A's or B's on the mid-year, and an MCAS score of meets or exceeds. So I was just surprised. I think parents often don't fully like understand how the levels play out at Brookline High School. Um, and also maybe don't have a full understanding of their students' skills, because a lot of times the students had lots of data points to show that they were very highly skilled. Thomas, yeah. can, can I ask you to, uh, to slow down with that description of the process and, sure. and just go through it a little bit more step by step? I would Because love I to. think that's really critical, yep. because if one measure of equity gains is that this ninth grade unlevel class is materially affecting um, whether students are selecting their tr their their level differently? Yes. Then this, I think, is really critical for us to understand it. And I think I missed some of that. So, what exactly is the process for student selection of their English language of their English class level after this course? Do do is there first a recommendation that's that no so no. what can so you, you mean do that again? pilot what's the pilot process the, or what's the school process what for kids who take the pilot yes. course okay yep what's the process by which kids determine or teachers determine or kids and teachers collaboratively determine yes. what level they take next yes yeah. so uh the process is that their teacher me or ali gives a presentation on all the different courses that are available, including ACE and SWS, like any option that's available to them. We and we also I we bring students over if they want to visit one of those programs. Um, so we give a presentation in class and that was around February 6th or 7th, whenever um, they made the presentation to parents right after that. Um, so we uh, we make the presentation and then we give the students a piece of paper and the piece of paper lists every single course and a course description and the levels and all the information about the courses. And we say, why don't you go home with this piece of paper and talk to your family about what level and what course you think is right for you. And in addition to all the courses on that uh, worksheet, there is a box that says, I don't know and I would like uh, teacher support, the student can check that box. And there's another box that says, for, for the parent, I would like to talk to the teacher about the course selection. So if they want to schedule a 10 minute meeting with us, they can do that. And it also requires the parent to sign off and say, uh, I approve my student selection. So if the student, if the student, if the student and parent have made a choice together, 
um, they have to sign off on that to, to indicate to us that they have had that conversation. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And so then um, when we get all those 112 forms back, we go through them and we call all the parents that had a question. Um, or if it was just the student had a question, then we meet with the student. Um, and then we put in a course recommendation based on all of those conversations. I see. So is there a slide that has the data from those 112 recommendations? Yes, I think this is the this is it. This is okay. pretty much the slide. Yeah. So what? Yeah. Okay. So what we're seeing here is uh, this only looks at honors. Okay. Because one, uh, what Anthony was talking about before was that one of the goals of the pilot is to expand access to our most rigorous courses. So if you look at the y-axis there, you've got percent recommended for honors. This is only honors. Um, what you have at the bottom are all uh, broken down by race, because that was one of the other uh, things that the pilot was aiming to uh, be more representative for each level according to race, or for honors according to race. Just a moment. Mariah, you have a question? Yeah, just a, another clarification on the data. In an earlier slide, there was, I think it was on the midterm results, you had a total of 41 black students, for example, um, just as one category. Here you have only 15. So where did the other 26 students go? Um, I'm not sure what slide. It's slide, the first semester grades by race and course, which is, I think. Um, okay. <laughs> So Mariah, I'm pretty sure I, I get where you're going here. Um, I think the key here is that this slide is only showing the students being recommended for honors. So any student who is being recommended for the college prep level course or standard level course in 10th grade is not represented on this slide. The colors tell us what course they are currently enrolled in. So for example, if we're looking at Asian students, of Asian students enrolled currently in college prep, only three of those students are being recommended for college prep in 10th grade, or being recommended for honors in 10th grade. The remaining Asian students who are currently in college prep are being recommended again for college prep in 10th grade. For Asian students currently enrolled in honors, 64 of those students, approximately 90% of those students, are being recommended again for honors. And then in the pilot, of the Asian students in the pilot, approximately 75% of them, or 13, are, are being recommended for honors, so from the pilot into honors. And so, um, you know, I think tellingly, right, we know that students in honors tend to stay in honors, we know that students in standard tend to stay in standard, um, and the pilot is an open question, right? And so we're seeing across racial groups approximately 75% of students in the pilot being recommended for honors next year, when when they entered, they were about 50-50 recommended for honors or standard in ninth grade. So just is to follow on that though, there's 16, this is only showing just again, focusing just on the black students, 16 out of 41 are being recommended for honors. Does that mean that 25 out of 41 or almost two thirds are not being recommended for honors? Yes. Like are we should, so 60, only 20 or, or a third roughly of our black students are being recommended for honors. Yes, which is unfortunately an improvement. Um, it, it, historically, it's been about 25%. And do you show that data of by race of fraction of students being represented for honors anywhere in this presentation? Uh, we, had that early, by ratio? we had that earlier with course enrollment. Um, so like the, and, um, and that's been presented to the committee multiple times. Um, the 2016 On 10th grade, no, I'm talking about this upcoming year's 10th grade course recommendations. That's what these are. These are the current ninth graders. I understand. I guess my point is, can we see how many by race, what fraction of them are being rep recommended for honors versus another level for the 10th grade course recommendations for next year? Oh, got it. For the aggregate. Um, we just crunched these in this afternoon, but we can make that chart. You Please. don't. We don't have that the chart the way you're describing it, but we can make it without trouble. Thank you. 
Why are you why are you asking that though, Mariah? What are you looking for? Because I'm trying to understand if the goal is to address racial dispor disproportionality, and what we're seeing is that when we convert, if what we're seeing is when we convert the numbers like that, we still see that there is um, significant gaps in how students by racial group are being recommended for honors, then are we achieving the goal? But I think Gabe's point is that you could still see the gain in this slide from the pilot from this one data point. I think an important piece to remember is that only 117 of our students are taking the pilot because it was an opt-in. Right, twenty approximately twenty percent of our ninth grade class is taking the pilot. So, if the pilot is creating benefits, it is only creating that for twenty percent of our students right now. Can I mean, just... I'm not sure I'm following this, and I'm still, and I'm, and it's. I think that if we were looking at historical data, having an apples and oranges historical data against the twenty seventeen data versus this new data would be very helpful. David, I, I, if I, oh, I think the challenge there is we didn't have a pilot in 2017. So this, because we have inter created a new intervention, we we don't have the exact same data set. Maria, so that's the whole jump point in. of interventions is to be able to compare before versus after. Maria, can I can I share a little bit of what I'm reading and what to me is promising is that the pilot is the most equitable across races. So we're seeing 75 percent of every, whereas in the other groups like. In the honors classes, we're seeing almost 100% of the Asian students, but closer to 80% of the black students. So to me, there's a discrepancy. And it may be what Stephen was talking to, that it might be your process that is leading to this, or it might be that the pilot is serving kids in a more equitable way. So to me, that is the what I'm seeing as, a, as an equity dimension to this graph. Like the blues and the reds are less equal than the yellows in terms of the range. Um, you know what I'm saying? I think I would appreciate seeing the other data view as well to be able to understand those comparisons. Helen, did you have something or should we yeah, move in? Um, We're so close I to the end. I just wanted to clarify something. Recommendations and choices. So these are the choices that the kids made, or these are the recommendations that were made. Can I can I just say that? Um, I mean, we've all we've taught multiple levels, and it's uh, usually the choices that that kids and parents make, and the teachers' choices are very much aligned. There's very few cases. I think all of our colleagues have said this when we asked them about course recs. Like, how many of your kids did you say one thing and the parent then overrode you? I don't have the exact statistic, maybe John does, but um, it's a very small percent, yeah? Sorry, just addressing recommendations and choices. Um, the process for most English classes in my 20 years here has been that we start with what the student's interested in and then we have a conversation with them before we put in a recommendation for them okay. ends with a choice and it becomes a recommendation um how mason and the recommendation becomes what they get that's what gets put in initially okay. and then the parents have access to the portal mariah i hope you have access to it next time you need it um to <laughs> make overrides if they want to on their on the recommendations at the teacher center how mason reminds us all the time that 90 percent or 95 percent of those recommendations are usually in line with what the students ask for most of the time and then we have to have a few difficult challenging conversations with some students about we think you could do more we think you could maybe take an easier class and that would help you mm -hmm. um, but often more often than not um, the choice that the student brings to the teacher is the recommendation that the teacher uh, implements in english what this group has done has made it a little more in intensive a process including parental engagement uh, and phone calls and check boxes which i love um, and uh, one of the challenges we faced when we talked about why this program, um, when students were placed in college prep at the beginning of ninth grade, there was less mobility than we hoped for them in grades 10, 11, and 12. What we're hoping to establish is a uniform process that we can be in charge of for levels in grades 10, 11, and 12, that we can implement evenly for all ninth graders through a course like this, um, so that the teachers who know the kids so well can work with them on helping them make their initial choice and then talk with them about the recommendation that's going to get put in. So this is part of the whole goal of how do we help make sure kids have access 
to our most challenging engaging curriculum uh, for all kids, not um, kids who are placed in a class uh, before they get to us. Thank you. It, can I say, just is just a comment. Um, I was really struck by when you said that you asked the kids first to choose which course. And I'm wondering if we do that in eighth grade. And I'm looking at you, Jody, because I, because that seems to me a really simple thing to do. I think that's a good example of something that is different at the eight schools. There are some schools. No, but there we are some can say you need to. <laughs> I mean, that is a possibility that you know when that all kids will first and parents will be asked to choose, and then the conversation can happen. Yeah, I'm just identifying that as not current practice. Just to keep us honest, though, let's say that it is a thought that's been thought of before, right? We don't want to, like for the years and years and years that eighth grade teachers have been recommending students, um, it has been discussed. Yeah, no, I, I mean, you're I'm aware. I'm discussing yeah. it with my kids, but, but not all parents do that. No, no, and sorry. So, I, I'm saying that we, when we were talking about whether students end up in the right classes for them at the high school, this is something that's come up year after year of what the process should look like. Yeah. And there have been a lot of um, times where that has been followed. But what Gabe is saying, not consistently. Uniformly. Yeah. So to this end, I'm going to move us a little bit. Um, we're very close. Um, but I think while this is disaggregated by race, um, we also have the same. So the y-axis is the same. These are the students being recommended for honors next year. Again, the current ninth graders. And this is now disaggregated by IEP status, right? So students who have an active IEP. Um, so again, um, you know, we see that students in the pilot with an IEP are about 50-50 being recommended for honors next year, right? Current students in the current pilot in the IEP. Um, students without an IEP, 75% are being recommended for honors next year or again, have selected, and then it's entered at a recommendation. Um, I think most notably, students in college prep with an IEP, only three of those students, when, if we remember, college prep, right, is about 100 students, it's 96 students, 41% of those students have an IEP, and only three of them are being recommended for honors next year. Whereas of the 22 students with an IEP in the pilot, half of them are being recommended for honors next year. So in addition, there have been some unexpected exciting surprises that Ali is going to say more about. OK, so um, one thing I keep hearing is that students appreciate being in an unlabeled class. And um, there's just a positive community building experience that happens. It's collaborative. And if you could just see everyone sitting around the table when we went, had our banquet at Halo Moon, um, the just everyone being together. And it's just the best of Brookline High School. It's like everyone's represented from every corner of the school. Um, the students love having choice and they love being able to move up and down according to, and it's not really up and down, but according to learning work-life balance earlier than usual. So they can say, well, I'm in the play now, so I'm going to do the medium, but next time I promise I'll do the spicy and that's okay. Um, they love the choices of all of the different texts. Thank you, PTO. Um, and socially um, and emotionally the social emotional learning benefits were really exciting surprises people just seem happier i haven't had as many students feeling so stressed out about everything it's just the overall energy is just good and i know it's really hard to measure but um you know with numbers but the overall feeling is pretty wonderful and watching the students take care of each other and bring, everyone brings um, their own um, skills to the teams. And people, several times they said, I learned so much from you. I love hearing that. And lastly, all students benefit from the supports. I had a really wonderful conversation. I just want to leave you with this, is that I have some really strong readers in, a, in both of um, my pilot sections. And we talked about how, you know, the strong readers when they're younger, Nobody worries about you because you know how to read. But you know what? The strong readers have bad habits too. And this year, we've really worked on metacognition and figuring out where do I need help? And you might need help 
getting along with all different kinds of people and motivating people and not doing all of the work. You know what I'm saying? Like finding a way to delegate or, or you might need to figure out why am I switching words? Um, and so the, all students benefit from the reading supports and the writing supports. And students throughout the year are learning to use um, what they need and to offer um, support to themselves in a way that's kind of beautiful and to, and to feel proud of themselves when they're like, I don't really need that anymore. I've, I, that's ingrained in my habit now. So I'm gonna move on to the next level. And it's been pretty inspiring to watch. So thank you for the opportunity and thanks to the students. Great job. Thank you, Allie. Thank you, Talmadge. Thank you, Gabe. Um, these might be called the two final slides, uh, which I think will be uh, welcome for you so that you can ask questions, have discussion. Um, so I think before um, sharing these steps, I want to be clear as the principal of the high school, I hire leaders who I trust, I support them. I hired John Andrews several years ago because I trust his judgment as an English teacher and as a leader and the direction that his ninth grade team wants to move is for full implementation for 24 25 and i unequivocally support that decision by john uh, and want to be clear that it is not just talmadge nardi and ali whitebone though they are the ones teaching the five sections in the pilot they are meeting weekly with the entire ninth grade team bringing them along. And I think that's incredible progress for our department, um, for our English ninth grade team. They are ready to make this move, uh, and thus so am I. So we would like to move to full implementation. Uh, we are also working on further ninth grade common assessments. So uh, a common final exam. Uh, and common reading assessments or tools that more model um, MCAS-like exercises. So let's see. I want to see whether there's anything more. Um, you know, right. I think we've got it. So I'm going to now step back. And one, I want to just acknowledge you have a very difficult decision to make. And I appreciate and respect the work that you do always to support our schools. Uh, this is something that I care a great deal about. Um, and I feel for you because I think it's a difficult decision to make given the history of inequity that we have um, within our K-8 to schools, within our high school. Um, and we believe that we can support all students to be incredibly successful. And I just want to quickly co-sign everything Andy, Anthony just said. Sorry, I just called you by dad's name. Um, uh, but um, in addition, I want to extend my appreciation to all of you on the school committee for coming to the classes, visiting the classes, taking your time to see all levels of classes, multiple classes, not just English classes. And I appreciate your seriousness, your thoughtfulness, and your deliberation. And thank you. All right, thank you for the presentation, very thorough and quite thought-provoking. So we will begin with a discussion. Who would like to go first? And I'd like to give everyone an opportunity to speak at least once before we have second rounds. Natalia. I'll try and be as brief as I can with my first round. So I want to start by saying that I'm in support of full implementation as has been requested because I believe that this hasn't been that this is thoughtful and i believe that the you know that a lot of the concerns that have been raised tonight i want us to follow through and i want you to fully implement deliberately listening to some of the concerns so one concern i heard tonight and is very important is that we need to think about this you know it's if we're only putting a band-aid and then we're going to see the same distribution in the future this is a failure so this has to be accompanied with a deliberate i think um it was uh, Mr. Krul who talked about really about how do we build that out. And it sounds like the pilot team has already been thinking about it, the recommendations. I don't think deleveling is going to solve everything. And so we need to be honest with ourselves also that we're not going to see this overnight. I heard a lot of parents asking for data. And you know I am a data person myself, but I think it's important to highlight that um, our choice to stay in this system also requires data. And the data that I've seen is that this system is failing many of our kids. And I'll give you a personal narrative. You know, 
I'm dyslexic, I would have been tracked into a not rigorous English class by senior year. I did the IB, I got a seven. I was a very, you know, I was top of my class, but in ninth grade, I was still struggling with the technicalities of, you know, how do you read? And I think we know that we have failed a lot of our students from K through eight who are struggling readers and they might need another year or two. And yes, I probably still, and in you know, college read less of the materials. Like I couldn't get through the full textbooks as my peers, but in the courses, if the teacher is expected and they lectured at a certain level, I could still participate in the discussion. So I do think this point about the IEP that 50% of your kids is something that we really need to highlight because there are kids who are able to function and think and you're sort of setting them, tracking them in a way that is really detrimental. Now, I also am very concerned about you know, English versus math because of something that was raised tonight, which is what Mr. I think Paradise said about Russian math. I have seen that. Um, kids are opting out. I don't think that it's happening with ELA. I think parents who choose to supplement, it's usually to support their struggling readers. But I would be concerned that if we deleveled math or we deleveled physics or biology or where there was a curriculum outside of the school, we would see that uh, widening in equity. So beyond not knowing, I do think that if there is a curriculum outside of the school system that parents are already using, we should be much more cautious. So I'd be much more cautious with math because I think a lot of parents would simply, and that would widen inequities. And then the mental health piece, I hadn't thought about it, but I really wanna thank you for raising that. You know, we have seen, as a public health person, we're seeing high rates of suicidality in our teenagers. We're seeing a lot of stress. So I definitely believe that we need to take that seriously. Finally, the point that has been said many times is that if right now 75% of the kids are in honors classes, these are already heterogeneous classes. By definition, a large percentage are performing below average if you did the whole, you know, the all 100%. So I, I feel that this argument that the few students, and there will be a few students who will lose out, who will be bored, but they're probably already bored. Like they probably are already in a heterogeneous classroom in honors and still doing much beyond. So I do think in that humility that I'm asking you is to pay attention really and and the comment i think one of the students here said is that you know do not teach to the bottom do not only show up to support the students who have you know be intentional in showing up to the kids that have tr picked the spicy and you know show us that you're you're doing that intentionally because i think that demand for rigor i share uh, with others and finally i do, I do want to say that you know this idea that teachers can't do it the teachers are telling us that they can and if we think about early grades i have a first first graders twins and they're barely able to read, and their kindergarten, my niece, is reading chapter books. Like, I do think the first and second grader English teachers are probably struggling with much more heterogeneous classrooms than in ninth grade, because you do have this really diversity. And, you know, we trust that they can do it. We are calling for our kindergartens and first graders to be inclusive, to include kids on IEPs. Why are we saying that in ninth grade we don't want that anymore? So for all those reasons, <laughs> sorry, I went for longer, David. Uh, I do, I, and I trust, I trust the teachers and I, you know, I want us to do it, but to do it with humility that we need to be continuously monitoring it. Thanks. All right, who would like to go next? Helen. I, I agree with you, I respect our staff. I know all of you and I respect you. I, I sat in on your class, Talmadge. Um, I think you've worked really hard on this, and I think it's, it's important for many students to have this option. For me, I feel that it's really also important to have data that shows, first of all, to have an hypothesis of what we plan this course to produce, why we think it's better, and then to, to measure it against the kids who aren't in that course and see what happens. Is there a difference? You know, what are the goals that we want to set before us and measure those. Um, I think with I, I would continue with the pilot. I have no problem with that. I think it's a choice. Um, I, from what I hear, I would almost eliminate the the college prep and do pilot or honors. And you have two choices, um, and see what happens with that. Um, I, to me, it was heartening to hear that you know you had five classes this year when you really expected only three of students who would choose to do it. Um, so that, for me, that, that's sort of where I come down. I think, you know, 
If we're trying something new, we need to know that what we're trying makes sense and works. And I don't, I'm not convinced, I guess, just yet. I was short. <laughs> Who would like to go next? Suzanne? Sure. Thank you for the presentation, all those, all those slides. We got through them fairly quickly. <laughs> um, I'm in full support of the program next year. Uh, I think that we actually do have a lot of data if we look at SWS. I know it's not the same program, but it is a program that we've had for 50 years. Our students have done very well in ungraded and unleveled classes uh, in SWS. So I know the English department knows how to do this. And I really have faith and trust in the English department. And um, I think it's the right thing for our students. I'm looking at, at the whole child. I think it allows them to make choices that work for them. I think I really like the idea that they can have a strong a uh, heavy semester, and then maybe have a lighter one if they're doing theater or sports or something. I mean, they're, it's, they're not off the hook, but they can make these choices. And I think a choice is the one thing that we said we're going to be committed to. We have, we're trying to do that for our middle grades. I think jo choice is so important in terms of engagement and having our students wanting to be there. And I think that this program does that. It does that for all our students. And I do think it's important for all our students to be in a mixed group of student with mixed group of students. They hear different voices. They hear about different cultures. They hear about different experiences. I just think it's critical for our, our students to feel that they're part of the whole community and that they meet students other than the 50 or 90 that they went through for 13 years at the K to eights, and now that's a chance to really mix it up and. Ninth grade is a perfect time to do that. They've got plenty of time to do AP honors in 10th, 11th, and 12th. That's just another whole conversation. But I am in full support of this for next year. Who would like to go next? Sarah? I'm going to ask a question that's just really heartfelt. So it's, it's, don't read anything into it. I really enjoyed hearing from the English teachers tonight. So I've been thinking about when there is this choice, so you have different people reading different texts, could you tell me what it looks like a little bit when, how you do the direct instruction to the text when you've got, you know, a group and they're in different, you know, in different places. And part of the reason why I'm asking this is because I thought that this was taught as a co-taught class. There's two teachers in it right now. And so if it goes forward with just one teacher, I'm a little bit worried about that. Um, yeah, so two of the five sections are co-taught, and so uh, that offers some awesome opportunities for what you're talking about. Um, so all of, we do a seminar model, like a Socratic seminar style, um, where students are using evidence from the text and forming their own opinions and building on each other's conversation. Um, so we lead those, the teachers lead those discussions in many cases. And we do have a model where we teach students to do it by themselves. We call it recorded book talk. So we train them and then they record it. And then we listen to each and every minute of it and write them feedback on that. Um, and so when we have those multiple groups, um, it's certainly easier to do with um, the co-taught model like when there's two teachers in the room. Um, but we also each teach sections by ourselves. And so um, in those sections, we structure the class so that there's an independent work component while we're doing those conversations. Um, did you want to yeah, jump in? Sure. Other so if you can imagine, you'll have different groups of students having small book discussions, and then I'll travel around and sit with each group, and I'll have my list of things that I want to make sure that they're covering. We also have a lot of homework that they have to complete ahead of time to prepare, and I check that. And I create slides with the key points as well that they they must use. And the recorded book talks work really well. And the, the funny time with, I wonder if she's listening, you know, on the <laughs> recording is always enjoying, enjoyable to catch. But um, the thing that's um, most um, wonderful is that we are alternating between a full class text and then they get to model what we did all together in smaller groups. And so that's also a benefit, that they're modeling what we've already practiced as a full class. 
I mean, there's there's other things like um, a lot of the first unit that we did had a lot of um, historical context for a lot of the books. Um, so we had designed different little modules where students could go onto Canvas and, and work through with their group different activities that were geared towards the background. Um, that's actually a lot of work. And so that's the work that we're doing this year um, so that other teachers can implement this by themselves. Um, so we, we each have a course release as yeah. well as a special education. You anticipated what I wanted to know. So I wanted to know how much of that is in place already and ready to go. You're creating it now. Yeah. Yeah, uh, when we asked our team at the beginning of the year, what do you want, what do you want to use these meetings for? That's what they said that we want to, we want you to have a curriculum in place that we can use. We want to retain our creativity if there's units we want to design on our own, but we want to have a, a, a curriculum in place. And so after each unit, we put together all of the resources and all of the assessments and all the supplementary materials so that if a teacher is walking in and they want to uh, not spend their whole summer designing curriculum that that fits those three units that have choice in the book choices, um, that they have something um, that's fully in place for them. Sure. All right. Um, they're doing amazing work organizing the curriculum, and we've budgeted for two weeks of summer work for teachers coming into this program, if we can go to full implementation, to um, have a chance to sit with that curriculum and do some work on it over the summer. Um, hopefully the budget will go through, we'll see. Uh, and then we also, um, they had time over last summer to do some of this planning. They had a course release this year to do it. They've been meeting with the ninth grade team uh, weekly. We're working very hard to make sure that all the teachers who jump into this model, if we go to full implementation, have a curriculum in hand and support from experts to, uh, to get there. So the support from experts is PD well, or these two. Is, these okay. two are experts. So, but is is there but like a the, model? Like, are we talking? In addition to the experts of these two, um, we've talked about the Landmark School and some training that we received from the Landmark School. These teachers received from the Landmark School last summer. Um, a man named Adam Hickey has been doing ongoing professional development at Brookline High School all this year, and we'll do it again next year. Um, he's come in and observed the class, uh, given feedback to the teachers. We're hoping to get new teachers who are interested in the implementation of this heterogeneous model for next year to attend some of that summer work. So we're, yes, we're trying to connect them to the research that out, that's out there, the experts out there on teaching differentiated instruction in a heterogeneous class. Um, and we've been working on it for a year and a half. Sarah, did you have anything further with, no? Okay, Andy? Um, yeah, if I could just ask a question that's based off of uh, one of Helen's comments. So what do you think would happen if um, we kept the pilot, kept honors, but got rid of college prep? Uh, could that work? Could the um, could could the unleveled course still function as intended? So the long term effect, I think, would be disappointing because we would end up with three levels, which is something we decided not to do in 2005. We used to have three levels of English in in 2005. Oh, I'm sorry, I miss. Yeah, oh, it was college, I, was like, I see. Get rid, oh. get rid of college prep, keep honors. You'll end up. And keep I the suspect unleveled. you'll end up with a repetition of what we have now, which is seventy-five percent of kids taking honors classes, and then twenty-five percent taking the 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 pilot. Which will, you, so you oh, think that only twenty-five would choose? The I don't. Pilot I don't know if it would be only, case. but um, I would be nervous that we would have a repetition of what we have now if we keep the honors class and only one other option that's not the honors class. Uh, I, I worry that we'll end up with the, the same structure that we have at this point. I don't know that. I can't promise you that one way or the other, but that, that would be my fear, that we would recreate the, the problem that we're hopefully doing some work to get away from. Can, Gabe, can I follow on that as well? I think it's related. Uh, so Lexington went with an honors for all model rather than an unleveled course. Um, similarly, why, why not an honors for all model rather than an unleveled? I'll stay up for a few seconds. Um, so we are committed to the levels that we have in grades 10 through 12. And I do hear what people have said about um, sports teams where kids want to play sports with other kids who can play sports at the level that they can play sports. I think that's true for English as well. And so in grades 10 through 12, I believe that we need to have an honors and a non-honors path for English. I think if we offered ninth grade honors for all and then tried to tell kids, okay, now we're going to tell you that you need to be in a non-honors class in 10th grade, we would have a, a much worse effect uh, than, than what we currently have. I think that would be problematic. Um, I'm, we have some courses in the school in the English department that are exploring earned honors credit, and that's a conversation that we um, are thinking about and talking about whether that would make sense for this class. It felt like too much to take on in the first year, and so we're still doing some reading and thinking and talking about that. 
Um, but I think honors for all would create us a, a different mess that that wouldn't solve the problem that we're trying to solve because I don't want to de-level the school. I don't want to de-level grades 10 through 12 in literature. I want kids arriving at Brookline High to have a soft place to land in ninth grade to learn what they need to learn to practice and try out different types of things. And then we're going to help them navigate as best they can to the right course for them in grades 10, 11 and 12 consistently with the same process and, and, and uh, procedures for all. Uh, so I think that's what that's why I'm thinking about this just for ninth grade uh, in English. Does it help? Great. Mariah? Thank you, and thank you for the presentation by the team. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, the first one is, and this is bringing this back to um, WISP and sort of the connection between um, whether the courses as they're being designed are achieving the outcomes that are intended. And it's my understanding, and feel free to correct me, but this is what I've understood, although I, I'm not sure it's been presented um, in any public venue, um, that WISP has not had the outcomes that were expected um, in terms of addressing disproportionality. And I, if people are nodding or shaking their heads, I can't see because of the angle of the camera, just FYI. Um, but that's my understanding. And when we were looking at this data right now, I saw that the first semester grades show what looks to be a 0.8 GPA swing by racial category. Um, and as far as I could, um, I guess so I'll, I'll say that there's a 0.8 GPA swing by the racial category. I wasn't sure on some other areas. So what happens if or when the end of year results continue to show broad racial disproportionality as the middle of the year grade results do. Um, so what are the next steps when that's not achieved, if that's not achieved? Um, so I'll start with WISP um, and then the GPA question in a second and other folks feel free to tap in. Um, I think as was discussed at the last committee meeting, um, I, I believe it was Hal Mason who said it, <clears throat> The decision for WISP came very organically from the team. It wasn't a district mandate. It wasn't a district, it's certainly district supported, but it was really from the social studies team uh, with Gary and a couple of teachers in some collaboration with eighth grade teachers. And their primary goal was to get all the kids in the same room. Um, they were certainly concerned about the, the disparities and they were concerned about the disproportionality, but the way, the way that I've heard Gary talk about it a number of times is he didn't want to label kids before they walked in the door. And WISP does that. And WISP successfully does that. And I think the question about, you know, fixing the challenges of the school, one of the things that the WISP teachers have talked about regularly is that the leveling in other classes impacts their class. And so there are cohorts or sections, right? So, you know, if I'm teaching it like my E block section, for example, if that is heavily um, heavily enrolled by students who are taking advanced math, that changes the section. So WISP being the only unleveled class in ninth grade actually can't be totally heterogeneous. Um, and the, so the classes, the student population is not evenly distributed because of how the choices they make with the rest of their schedule. Um, but I would, I would argue that for the social studies teachers, WISP has achieved a lot of its results. Um, I think, WISP, when it was first originally designed, was never asked and scrutinized at the rigorous level that we're scrutinizing this right now. And I'm not saying that as a, I welcome the scrutiny, right? I, I think it's important, right? Um, and we've, we know that WISP's first year was impacted by the shutdown for COVID. WISP's second year was impacted by um, being remote and hybrid, right? And the high school's uh, decisions about course leveling and course switching were a little bit different during those two years. Um, and as Gary described tonight, um, they added a global studies course, they added a third course. And so um, we don't have easy numbers um, because of that. Um, anything else on WISP? Yeah. Um, I think in the grades question, right, um, 
as we said, students in honors tend to earn higher grades and students in, in college prep are not earning as high of grades, right? And that uh, while we didn't present data from other subject areas, because um, we're talking about English, um, that does cut across subject areas. Um, sorry, Mariah, can you repeat your question about GPAs? My question on GPAs was, and I, I, I was trying to find a slide, but I can't find it easily right now, but it was the, um, the slide where you presented the mid-year goals um, or the mid-year grades, I'm sorry. And if you look in the racial categories of the, oh, maybe I found it. If you look at the racial categories, I believe there was a, um, in the pilot, um, the grades go from, maybe it's not 0.8, maybe, it, no, it is. The uh, black students have a, in the pilot course, have a GPA of 2.8 and multi multiracial students, and those are just the, the minimum and maximum, have a GPA of 3.6 and the average is a 3.1. So there's a 0.8 GPA within a uh, swing within the pilot itself. Um, and so my question is, you know, if we're, if that middle of the year grades show that level of um, disparity across racial categories, um, and then we get to the end of the year and that's continued to be represented, what are you going to do to what are the next steps that you're going to have to to act on that? So if I understand correctly, um, you're identifying that student race is students' grades are varied by student race, right? That's that's the key. And that our black students are earning the lowest grades as identified here. Just want to Correct. confirm. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, that's not new. That's not unique to ninth grade English. Um, as we I mean, as has been presented yearly to the school committee, right, we see that on MCAS. Um, we've seen that on enrollment. Um, these grades, um, as uh, Matt Dubois and I kind of presented about the shift of a course recommendation um, being kind of setting a grade floor, right? Um, when we looked at grades for students in middle school, we saw similar things. Um, one ninth grade class is not going to ameliorate the grade disparities of students. Um, we also know from previous presentations that our Black and Latina students, but particularly our Black students, are highly identified as having IEPs, right? And we know that students with IEPs tend to earn lower grades in our district. Um, there's a lot of work for us to do. Um, we have talked a few times around this committee, right, um, and tonight that this one course is not going to fix everything. Right? There are other supports that students need. Um, there are some shifts in student support that the high school is working on in addition, um, but that's a bigger wraparound project, frankly. Um, it's not going to show up in just one course, and I think we have more to add. Um, Anthony has deferred to me. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add that um, the, the, the pilot has worked very closely with the METCO um, tutorial program, and um, so I am very concerned about the, the two uh, not hard to see for 2.8 that you're talking about. Um, and this was our first, you know, we're, we're in the first half of the year, we got this first data, and we do what all good teachers do with data is say, wait, oh, my, like, what can we do now? Um, so I serve on the a, a monthly Metco uh, meeting where we talk about all of our students um, on Metco. And I also uh, have even in the past week, like, reached out to all of those students, met with all those students. One of our recommendations is actually try to make uh, the office hours model more mandatory or more accessible to our students. Um, and so I just want to highlight that, that there's some great work being done by that program that would specifically um, affect Black students. Um, and we will improve those numbers, I am confident. Mariah, thank thanks you. for the question. Oh, sorry. Uh, and thank you no, for thanking you, Talmadge. Um, I just, I think I was worried that I was going to give such a general answer that it would sound patronizing. Um, and now that Talmadge has talked more specifically, I think it is about really good teachers looking at performance data, various uh, types of data, and then in revising their practice, identifying students who need more support, determining where those supports happen within the classroom, where they happen from the teachers directly out of the outside of the classroom, and how we use the many other tools. And I think that's what Gabe was alluding to. Um, so, and I hope that 
uh, every member of the school committee has heard the team's openness, and now I'll make clear my openness to uh, the potential move to an earned honors model or another model for next year. Our plan would be to have a heterogeneously grouped uh, unleveled model. But thank you for the question. Thank you. I have, David, I have a couple more questions just to clarify things, if that's okay. Sure, go ahead. My next question, and this is a follow up on Helen's question and someone else, I can't remember who, who was asking about, oh, Andy, about removing standard. And John's answer was that we would end up in the same honor standard model. But isn't the point that the curriculum of the unleveled course is significantly different? So I guess I want to push back on this idea that we would end up still in the 7525 if the offering of the unleveled course is meaningfully different. Doesn't that get us out of that 7525 dynamic? I think part of the point is we're not 100% sure. We obviously don't know. Um, if we go back to the 2016, 2017 data, we had a 60, 30, or a, a two thirds, one third, right? A 66, 33 split. So more and more students have been taking honors since 2017. Um, a few more, at least. Um, but there is something about the inherent separation. Um, and that when you have kids arriving in ninth grade, as, as we've talked about, that is the only school transition for almost every kid in our district, right? We don't have a middle school. We go straight to ninth grade. Um, it is a new experience. The expectations in ninth grade are different. The responsibilities in ninth grade are different. Um, and so I think it's fair to say that students are still finding their identity and finding who they are as a student and who they are as a person in ninth grade. And it's a chance for new opportunities. Um, when there are two levels, there's always an option if you're teaching, there's always going to be a stratification of a higher level and a lower level. And the label of honors, I think, adds to that, right? Adding honors to the transcript. And whether the course itself, whether the academics of it, whether the challenge of it are the same or different, or as we've heard in the current pilot class, there are more challenging texts than are in honors. And yet, there is a name, right? And that matters. Um, and so that opportunity also means that when a student is struggling, there's the opportunity to counsel them down to a lower level, right? Um, and we've heard from students, we've spoken about this over time, I've, I've spoken about this before in front of the committee, that moving up a level is extremely difficult, moving down a level is much easier, right? And so it, there will always be an opportunity, right? And I think the other piece is that, um, well, I'll just stop there. Uh, Thank Steven? you, Gabe. I have two more questions, David. I'm sorry. All right, go ahead, Mariah. My third question is, um, we heard from students both tonight and privately um, about concerns about not being challenged. And um, I was wondering uh, if you could talk a little bit about um, any movement that you might be making to extend or to address those students' needs. Um, and then my last question, I'll just say it now, is I'd like to hear from the superintendent about um, his thoughts on this. I think we'll address the challenge question first and then give Dr. Gillier a chance. Um, do you want to talk to me? Yeah. Um, so because it's a pilot, it's very interesting to hear that people don't feel challenged. I don't, I think that people are overly challenged and that I've had to say, well, this is a pilot, so we need to communicate when something is too challenging for you to have this project going on and I have to read this many pages and I need to do this work. So I think that the excitement of it being a pilot has allowed us to really keep pushing the envelope to challenge beyond anyone's idea. And you should see some of the work we've gotten. Other students have tried to avoid challenge. And that's been fun too, fun for me. And have you enjoyed, we've enjoyed that conversations about how do we challenge um, other people. But I think that I hear um, the idea of challenging in a different way, uh, um, avoiding labels and having people using metacognition to have students understand 
what am I challenged by specifically? What would challenge me and where do I need help? That's what we, that's the toolkit that we're working with here. So it's not, we're not looking at things in the same box of I need the challenge of honors. It's more, what do I need to be the best student I can be? Um, I just want to also just highlight the the student mid-year survey, and I wish I had the slide number for you, but it's how does ninth grade English compare to eighth grade English? The pilot had the most fewest students who said that uh, ninth grade was easier than tenth grade. Uh, we were the highest out of all three of the levels. Well, we're talking about students who feel challenged. Perhaps we can go to our student representative who would like to opine. Go ahead, Ms. Clevis. Yeah, thank you so much, Chair Perlman, and uh, thank you to um, Ms. Nardi and uh, Ms. Whitebone and uh, uh, Mr. Andrews and Mr. Meyer and uh, Mr. McCormick. I uh, really appreciate your presentation. Um, I have my own thoughts about it, but I, I just want to speak to um, students who may not feel challenged in honors um, English classes. I, I can personally identify as one of those students, I think, in ninth grade. Um, I didn't feel challenged enough, even though it was I, I was in an honors level class. I think for most of my life, I've been pretty. I've been a pretty strong humanities student. I've always taken honors history, and I've always taken honors English courses. And um, I think that if this course had been offered to me when I was in ninth grade, I would have. I would have taken it. You know, because I. I mean, I, I loved read, reading the Odyssey, and I loved reading *Raisin in the Sun* when I was um, in my honors English class. But quite frankly, having the opportunity to read a novel like *The House of the Spirits* or or, or something like crime and punishment, I, I, I would have eaten that up. You know, I would have absolutely just gone crazy. And, and I think that I, I, I really like that, that in a school that really values freedom of choice, that we're still preserving that to some extent. I think it, it really, it's beneficial for students social, so, socio-emotionally, I think, um, to, to not have that label assigned to them. I think that um, what Dr. Schiffman was talking about earlier, he left, but uh, that's that's pretty important, right? It's the fact that when you come in, and I experienced this when I was in eighth grade, when when people, when they would get their course recommendations, they they would start buzzing about them. You know, they they would get all worked up about them because it was it was a discussion of who got into standard and who who was recommended for honors, and that did create a, a great deal of pressure for me, even though I was recommended for higher honor higher level courses, and, and quite frankly, I've never liked that hierarchy. You know, I have friends. Who, who are in standard level classes. And quite frankly, um, even though there is that idea that, that they might, might not be fast enough for honor level courses, I think their insights are great. And I think that they're very capable, very intelligent students who, who may be on IEPs, who may have other factors in their lives that, that may prevent them from, from taking an honors course simply because, not that they aren't smart enough, but, but that opportunity just wasn't presented to them maybe when they were in ninth grade. Maybe they were recommended for standards because their eighth grade teacher just didn't see that, that capacity within them. But I mean, if you tell a kid that they're not going to be able to do something, they're probably not going to think or, or have it within themselves to, to really go beyond the expectations that people place on them. You know, they're, they're incredibly damaging, I think, to some extent. It, the, what, the what the presenter said was absolutely correct. Um, if you tell a kid that they're, they're going to be a level lower than they than they think of self, of themselves as they're, they're not going to feel that incentive to to perform better and and my final point before i bow out because my dad is in the back and i feel really bad it's almost 10 p.m <laughs> and i'm really sorry but um i'm in an unlevel class this year um climate science um which, which is an incredible course and the reason why i'm bringing that up is because it, it's a senior year course and it's unleveled and i am in a class with students who are ap students students who have taken college prep probably for their entire high school careers people who have taken a mix of both and um that course is pretty challenging it's work intensive um i think that a course like um the pilot program would also be work intensive and, and it could count for an honors credit, but I mean, it, it's really bringing everyone together. It's telling them, you can do this honor level work. You don't have to have this label pinned to you forever. And it teaches the honors level students that, that this hierarchy that you have been placed atop of is completely false. You know, just because you have been designated an honors student doesn't necessarily mean that you are smarter than or more capable than students who are at a standard level. I think it really teaches humility. And I think that if, if a core part of what we are trying to do here is to teach students and, and, and to 
help them become the leaders of tomorrow, to help them become more educated, more compassionate, more empathetic people, then this is the way to do that in, in large part. And, and I do understand the concerns, quite frankly, when I saw that data on, on, on the GPA, I, I, I did feel a little bit of concern because, I mean, I don't want my black peers overall to, to be falling behind. That, that is concerning to me. But I, I also know that data is incredibly important to teachers and that they do take it into account. And that with the right intentions, which I completely feel are here, we can, we can start working towards, towards making sure that, that our students of color can, can be in these more rigorous classes, which I mean, it is pretty rigorous, like crime and punishment. No one's reading crime and punishment when they're in ninth grade, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, when, when we're offering these options and when we're allowing um, students to really choose for themselves and to show that they are capable of doing something, I, I think everyone benefits. And um, I have to leave. And that's all, that's all I have to say for now. Um, I'm really, I, I am eagerly anticipating the decision that, that the school committee will make. But um, as a student who, who is so just excited to, to just to learn and, and to, to really experience the world around them, whether that be through talking to people who, oh, who are in honors or who are in standard, um, I support this. At least um, let's move cautiously, you know? Maybe math is not the move right now, but I think through the humanities, I think we can do a lot. And uh, yeah, that, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Can I just say, Mr. Clevis, you really raised an incredible kid. I, I, <clears throat> Dr. Getter, I think you were called on to uh, speak at some point, so go ahead. I think Laura did a nice job of, of really, I can't speak more eloquently to, to the points um, beyond what she shared, but I do have a question for the high school that I think is important, uh, at least in the messages that I read through, is what impact uh, what's the impact of um, the honors um, in terms of college admiss admissions and those types of things? I think that's a real concern that our community has there. And I think I didn't hear that part addressed in the presentation. Sure, happy to speak to that. So I reached out to Lenny Libenson, who is our college counselor, uh, and Darby Nefvier, who's our guidance coordinator with this specific question, Dr. Guillory. What is the impact of having not having an honors designation in ninth grade? And what both Lenny uh, or Mr. Libenson and Ms. Nefvier responded was that there is no impact that they know of that um, students at Brookline High are, are compared against um, the rigor offered. And so they're not, it's not counted against them if they're not taking a class that they don't have access to. Um, I, I know I, I can speak less um, from experience, and I didn't ask the specific question about merit aid that was raised in one of the public comments, so I don't have as much information about that. But my understanding is there has not been an impact due to WISP, and there's not an impact um, from our college counselor, from, from where they sit, the guidance coordinator and college counselor. Thank you. Okay. Stephen? All right. So, sorry, Doctor. I'm sorry. My question, Linus. Do you mind actually? Do you mind responding to the question? I don't think it was really answered about where you stand on this and what your. No, no. I'm happy to do. Happy to do. Thank so. you. Um, so I do think that this is a unique opportunity um, that we have here. I think the the staff have done a nice job of explaining um, the rationale behind the course. I think the notions of high expectations for all students uh, is super critical. Uh, but I do think that we still have uh, some bodies of work to do around um, making sure that all of our students that are, are in these courses are actually um, um, getting the full benefit. And, I, and that's always my wondering as not just looking at the ninth grade course, but looking at across our courses in general where some of our, our students that we, our marginalized students are still struggling. And so they, you know, I, I do think this is a unique opportunity. Uh, I think we have an opportunity as a district to be a leader 
uh, in this, not only for Massachusetts, but an opportunity uh, to do this in the nation with the right supports. And I think that um, there's still some more exploration. Um, I'm uh, intrigued by this notion of the earned honors uh, as well, what opportunities lie there. Um, so that's, that's where I presently stand at the moment, um, Mariah. So I hope that's helpful to your, your question. Can I just follow up? So in that case, it sounds like you're interested in exploring more data, particularly for this pilot. Is that accurate? Uh, now that's a, that's a harder one. Um, I mean, I think the, the staff have made a compelling case uh, to move forward, um, but I do also know that um, this, you know, the, the real question is, uh, for me, is um, where the real question for me is this notion of um, ensuring that we have all, are there additional supports that may be required for students that we've not contemplated as of yet? Uh, but I do think that the team is committed to figuring that out. I love the notion of uh, the approach that they're taking for recommendations for uh, classes, uh, courses that follow uh, this as well. So I would be, I would be um, committed to supporting them in their work uh, in moving this forward. Thank you. Okay, um, I just want to start by saying um, we're definitely failing some black and Latinx kids in eighth grade by by not uh, recommending them for honors class where they should be recommended for honors class. But that's not where we're sorry to go on this rant, Jody. Uh, <laughs> that's not where we're failing our our kids of color. We're failing them in the early grades. We're we're failing them because 44% of our black kids who are not low income are not reading at proficiency level in third grade. The, among the low income, that's 40%. Among the low income black kids, that's 44%. Among the low income Hispanic kids, that number rise, rises to 66%. And we know those deficiencies compound over time. So by the time they get to eighth grade, they're carrying all that with them. There's only so much that recommendation is gonna mitigate at that point. So all of this work that you're doing, and this is incredible work, this is innovative work, this is real work that you're doing, and, and this is real work towards equity. It's, it's a little piece, it's a little lever that you're trying to pull towards equity, and I respect it and I appreciate it. And at the same time, I'm gonna vote against it for, for scaling up from five to 23 and for another year of pilot data. And I'm gonna do it for a few reasons. And I do it with, with genuine respect for the work that you've done so far. I, I had three concerns that I emailed you about. One is, do we have enough data showing that, that we're advancing equity through this lever? I think the data that you showed today shows that it's promising. Um, I, I reached out to three other school committees that have been taking actions like these in Lexington, Arlington, and Winchester. I think Arlington shows, they, they've, they've gone through a two-year pilot doing this. They're at the end of year two, and they've been, they've been reviewing their data periodically with the school committee and with the community. And I think it's a good model for showing um, how a process can deliver multiple data points and in so doing, really uh, communicate frequently with the community with its school committee and uh, gain a lot of buy-in in so doing um, and demonstrate the potential for equity gains. That's the first point. I think promising is a good start. The second point is, um, are we ensuring that there's, that there isn't any uh, drop off in academic rigor? When I talked to other school committees, I heard the same thing from all three. There were concerns about teaching to the middle. Now, I visited, when I visited the class, there was no teaching to the middle happening. All those kids were super engaged. I, 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 I believe that's happening all the time. It was clear that the kids were engaged. The teacher was, Allison was amazing. Like, I, I believe, are you still here? You were great. Like, I mean, I, I know I just saw for a little while, but like, you, you were like super charismatic. All the, all the kids were like watching you. Like, I believe that that's the norm, you know? It's not hard to make that jump. 
but but I that's what you hear over and over among among districts that are doing unleveled pilots and that are deep into their experiment with unleveling. And so they're tinkering to see how do you maintain academic rigor. And and in the presentation, I, I didn't think that the the scatter plot um, slide was sufficient to show I mean, showing that MCAS scores, high MCAS scoring kids do well on their exam isn't a demonstration of academic rigor. It just shows that they do well on their test. Maybe they're bored. I mean, maybe, or, or maybe they're not bored. But I think that that requires more robust inquiry because it's a serious concern. I mean, and I think um, Catherine's comment shows that, that, that it's a serious concern and we need to investigate it seriously. And the, my third area of concern is professional development. Scaling from five to 23 sections is a pretty big lift and we would be doing it in a pretty short period of time. And I think we need to know more about how we would roll out professional development to, to make sure that we were doing it at the quality level we want in such a short period of time. So I, I vote against it, not as any lack of faith in the English department, and I, I really do dislike voting against something that's proposed by the high school. I kind of feel like it feels to me a little bit like an overstep on my part because I, you're the experts and I'm not. But I do it because I think that the pilot should be extended. We should have more data, more communication, and more discussion on it before it scales to, to the full grade. Thank you. Can I respond quickly um, and quickly? I think the scale from five sections to 23 might be misleading. It's a scale from two teachers to seven. Right, which is similar, understandably. Um, and there are teachers who have been getting engaged weekly with this team since the beginning and have been engaged in some of the same professional development already. And we do have plans rolling forward um, that we talked about. Um, and I think a question, because I'm less familiar off the top of my head, with the Arlington pilot, is that a school-wide pilot or is it a few sections? That one was a school-wide. It's school-wide. Oh, is the pilot school-wide? Is it, are all their ninth graders in an unleveled class for those two years of the pilot? I don't think so. I just, can I just offer one thing? So my children attend Lincoln Sudbury High School and until my daughter, my daughter's a sophomore now, until my daughter was in a ninth grade unleveled English class, I didn't believe in this. But every ninth grader at Lincoln Sudbury Regional High School for years has been an unleveled, just it's a nice soft landing into this. And this year she's in a top level class. The thing that's interesting at Lincoln Sudbury is the 10th, 11th and 12th graders all take classes together. You choose the level and the format of the class. So I just wanted to say that I was asking the same questions as you um, are now, but after witnessing my own child who's pretty language rich, I, I, I really, it sold me, it really did. So um, not just from my professional experience, but I just wanna let you know, Lincoln Sudbury, they have a lot of our teacher, former teachers over there. So we share a lot of commonalities. Um, so I just wanted to share that. Just a, a question I have, uh, is the main goal of deleveling to have a more diverse student body and it's not and it's not so much about student performance because the studies that have been cited seem to almost all agree that any impact on academic performance is negligible both for high achievers as well as for those who are on the lower end of the performance spectrum um, when we started talking about this a couple of years ago, the two main goals that we focused on were access for all students to our, our rich uh, advanced courses, grades 10 through 12. We think de uh, heterogeneous ninth grade class gives more kids access to those uh, more challenging, more rigorous options that we offer at the high school. And then the second goal is community building, that we are reimagining ninth grade to make sure that we're creating a space that is welcoming and inclusive of all students. And we think that this new class does that. Um, there are also issues around the demographics of our classes that we've been think talking about for years in this district. But the two things that made us uh, sort of drive towards this new class or design the class or how do we make sure that all kids aren't arriving at us on a track that they're going to be stuck on for a long time, um, but are instead landing in a class where we can help them figure out uh, what their options are, give them the best launch pad for the rest of their time at Brookline High School, and how can we 
uh, enrich the sense of community that we, we are after at Brookline High School and that this heterogeneous class will help us get to there. Um, so I think those, those are the two goals that we've said at the start of our slide deck. We talked about the, uh, two years ago when we began this. Um, there's a lot of talk about uh, are we creating classes that are exactly demographically representative of our school? Sure, that's a thing that's that we're also thinking about, but I would argue that the two main points are the, the ones I just said. We hear a lot about the importance of having many options for our students. The high school is renowned for statewide, even nationally, for its very thick course catalog and for being able to find all students where they're at. And I worry that in deleveling, we're actually taking options away. Now, I do appreciate that this pilot class in particular has multiple options within it. And I really do like the idea of having elasticity within a class where for one particular assignment, you might go with the more challenging uh, work and then maybe you're having a rough time in your personal life or very busy with something else and you go with less challenging. I like that, but I see it more as a potential substitute for college prep rather than as an instead of honors. So I would somewhat endorse what Helen and Andy were alluding to about the potential for uh, this unleveled class to possibly replace standard precisely because I think this idea of being able to move up and down within the same class uh, is it's quite novel and I think that would benefit a lot of students. But by the same token, we have a lot of students in our community who are very focused on the most challenging material that they can find. And uh, they, I, I'm somewhat concerned that they might be a bit held back if they lose that opportunity. And we heard even from Dr. Schiffman earlier that uh, in the WISP example, are the honors level students really being fully challenged by D-leveled? And he felt not necessarily that that's not the best for them. And I want to be the best for all of our students. So I think that potentially it's a win-win to have both the unleveled class as well as honors, because our students who always want to have rigor throughout will still have that opportunity. And for our other students who need a little bit of that back and forth, but also exposure to more challenging material and that confidence that they can handle it and then maybe move up to honors the following year, and they'll still have that opportunity. Uh, so that's where I'm leaning here, uh, and for that reason, I'm going to be voting no, but it's not because I see a flaw in the course itself. I really like it. I just don't want it to be the sole option. Natalia? Just a point to that. I mean, I hear what everybody's saying. We see that the standard level kids don't even want to be there. If they could repeat it, like, we can... What if it was an earned honors and an honors? So you got away from that debate of like, oh, all the kids, so that it really was about a decision of like the model and you give a little bit more flexibility, then I would say it's a little, we're less likely to fall into the same pattern of 75-25. So if they were both potentially honors classes for some kids, I could see that working. And I don't know what we're voting on tonight. Like, can we get rid of standard? <laughs> like, can we do that? Or are we only voting on that? You know, like what? But I do think, you know, I, I want us to be creative. I definitely am comfortable with moving with one model. And I, I don't quite understand the concern with the data because I worry that even if we say we need more data on the pilot, then the critique will be, well, the kids self-selected into the pilot so the data isn't representative. And, you know, like there's so much problematic with that self-selection. And if we did need, if we didn't, if we weren't concerned about self-selection, then this SWS data should be on the table, no? <laughs> no, I, I disagree. SWS is a, a different, what word can I use? It's a different, the kids who choose to go to SWS are different children. They're not the, the mainstream children in the rest of the building. And they tend to be more uh, honors kids that go there so that you're, you know, it's, I, I, I would wonder how many kids from college prep in ninth grade go to SWS. And I would venture to say it wouldn't be a lot. It's uh, changed it's a lot. Changed. No, it's I, changed. It has changed. It's, it's and, a much more diverse well, I guess group. We need that. It's my understanding. I don't. Uh, it it really has a whole range of learners. 
it's well, quite different from what it used to be. If you're picking randomly, <laughs> and you know, then it's uh, and those students have done very well because it and it's a rigorous program. Yeah, I I know what it. Yeah, I've yeah, yeah. To but it's it's a wide range of learners. All right, I'd like to give Valerie a chance to jump in. We haven't heard from you yet. If if you want to, Valerie, you don't have to. Um, I, I had the benefit of visiting today, so I had the benefit of visiting after hearing a lot of um, feedback from um, community members with diverse opinions. And I want to I want to thank Gabe and Allison for the for the time today. I I had a slightly different question. So the, the text that they, maybe just the day that I was there, but the text that they were reading in the um, pilot were in fact more challenging than what was being read or picked today in honors. And so the question is a little bit to the side of, of the pilot, but it, I guess, why are we not adding those more challenging texts, crime and punishment to the honors level? If, if in fact, there is also some concern about um, rigor. I, I, I know it's to the side of the question tonight, but it is a little bit of... It, so we have uh, added to our book room. All the books that we're teaching in the pilot have been added to our ninth grade book room and other teachers are welcome to use them as, as well. Um, I think one of the challenges, not challenges, one of the things to think about is the difference between whole text instruction and then the sort of small group instruction that's available in the, in the model that the teachers are using in this heterogeneous class. So they can say, um, we're going to read a book together and everyone will read this and now you're going to read a book in some small groups and you'll have five or six or seven kids who might choose to read crime and punishment and those kids i think are making good choices for themselves um, i'm not sure they could say uh, all 26 kids or all 24 kids in the in the pilot class or all 26 kids in the honors class are ready to read crime and punishment i think that would be an overstep so um, the model that they've designed in this class with the flexibility and the choice points and the small groups and the differentiated instruction is a different approach to uh, ninth grade than what we've done when we say all students are able to do honors work so we're going to go into a room and do honors work and all kids are not able to do honors work and you're going to go into a room with college prep kids um, so they're they're shaking up the model a little bit um, i hear what you're saying there may be some thinking to do um, about uh, what we're offering in our honors classes and yet part of the discussion tonight has been how 70 percent or 75 percent depending on which slide you look at of our students are taking honors credit and what does that mean um, and what has what does that mean in terms of whether it's a heterogeneous or a hom homogeneous class um, there's some more thinking for us to do around that i hope that helps a little bit but i appreciate the question mariah um I, pre I, I I'm hoping that the vote tonight will not be voting no on something, but the opportunity to vote to continue to support the pilot and to collect more data um, and to allow students to opt into this. And particularly for students who are rising ninth graders now to look at that data from their peers this year, their one year ahead of them peers, um, who may be thinking about college prep, who those students said, you know what, maybe this wasn't the best choice for me and to think about how they want to perhaps evaluate their own choices next year. I, I hear what um, John and and his colleagues are saying about um, about all the different issues and, and options. Um, I'm excited for you to think about the earned honors model and, and how you're gonna continue to, to do this. Um, and so I don't want to say, oh, well, we should definitely like, the, yes, you should definitely go away from the standard model or, or um, any of these things. But again, I guess I would like to support this idea of continuing to collect data, continuing to allow um, this choice and perhaps considering how we could structure, if possible, for the data collection um, data that's a true, um, would allow us to actually see, like, for example, if 100 students chose or 200 students chose next year, could we have some of them, could we set up the the experiment in a way that would actually allow us to compare outcomes um, of different populations? I guess the way the pilot was structured, as we say, there's selection bias and it has um, corrupted the ability to do some analysis. Um, in, any sense, in any way, I want to just support this idea of continuing to do the pilot, continuing to support the work of 
um, the team and continuing to see how this develops and the outcomes that come from it and um, any tweaks that may arise at the end of this year and throughout next year as they continue to um, hone what's a really exciting project and what I have I saw um, in my visit and really enjoyed um, and appreciated the work that is being done. Thank is you. Is that a motion? It's a motion. I'll second it. Thank you. <laughs> Any further discussion? Can, right. can you clarify what the motion is? It's a positive motion to continue with the pilot and do research. And actually, could I add to that uh, friendly amendment? Oh, I can make it. Yeah. All right. Um, I would like to make the motion that we continue with the pilot, learn from the pilot by doing some research and making sure that we're accomplishing the goals that we want to have on it. And um, to also look at WISP uh, during this same time and see what, goal, what it has accomplished. And then come back to the school committee with some, some information. I actually, just as an aside, did ask when we were first proposed WISP, I said to uh, uh, Gary, we, you know, come back to us because we want to hear, you know, it was a pilot at the time. We said, yeah, it was a pilot. It wasn't for everybody. It was supposed to be a pilot. It went all, all ninth grade year one. It's never been a pilot. Oh, I didn't. There was a planning year, but there were no courses taught that year. I and then it went full implementation straight ahead. Pilot, but I may be wrong. I, I'll go back and look at the approval. But anyway, um, but we did, I did ask, this I do know, for, for you know, follow-up data on it to see are we really doing what we need to do and what we want to do and what's good for, for children uh, in terms of their education. So. I, make I accept Helen's friendly amendment as my own and incorporate it. I, I, I think just the wording might be a bit complicated, so I'm, I'm going to <laughs> I'm going to offer an alternative one. Yeah. But I appreciate the the context that you provided, Helen, for uh, the impetus for this formulation. May I, may I make an alternative motion to continue the ninth grade English uh, pilot course? Period. I'd, I'd like to add a little more to that. So. Okay. I would. I move that we continue the ninth grade uh, ELA pilot course while simultaneously retaining honors English for ninth grade. Can we add the WISP data as part of that? Not, not about WISP. This is just about ELA. Okay. So say that again. And retaining that there's English that there's still ninth grade English that the pilot's not the only option. Mm -hmm. if they would like but that's not part of our vote right now i'm confused david so you're are you removing i i just want to make clear that there will be ninth grade honors english next year i want to include that in our vote so that it's everyone has a transparent understanding of what will take place that the pilot's not ending the pilot continues but there's also still the honors english option should they Does have this college honors also continue I don't think that's up to us to decide at this moment. There are a lot of nuances around that that the administration would have to work on. So I'm, I'm hearing we they would continue the pilot, and it could include an earned honors that may replace the honors. No, that isn't. That's what not what you're saying. No. Okay. If I can um, <laughs> help us out, what I'm hearing is do this year again. Yes. A voluntary pilot. We fill it with students as they enroll. We continue to offer the other two courses like this here. Exactly. That's what I'm hearing. Correct. And, and do data collection uh, research on this, whether it's really accomplishing what can we I want ask, it to accomplish. Can I just ask a question? Was the pilot in any ways um, limited? Like somebody has taught, so it could be any number of students. So, mm -hmm. so there yeah, was never a, a self-imposed, as many who applied got in. Essentially, yes. Um, I think we would have to look at class size and how sections break down. So we had a hundred and what is it, hundred and seventeen students. Yeah. We, thank you. Sorry. Excuse me. Sorry. Um, I think the only there were a couple of limitations. One was we had two teachers who were ready to take this on, so that made us think we were going to have three or four sections max. We also wanted to make sure that it was a. a it represented kids of different um, 
kids who might have gone to honors or kids who might have gone to college prep. So that was a limitation. So I think we ended up having more kids express interest than we expected. We were able to offer five sections. We still had to turn some kids away because if we'd taken all the kids who requested it, we wouldn't have had that balance of about 50-50. So I think that was the not a huge number that we turned away, maybe 20 or 30. 15. Um, but there, that was one of the, those were the constraints. So we would try to use similar constraints, I think, to have a, a mix of kids uh, in the class uh, based on eighth grade course recommendations as backups um, for next year. And I would love to see how many kids after this are interested. And hopefully we'd have more than five sections. So you wouldn't, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Is it important for us to also say that we've changed the way that we're recommending for honors next year? Um, that the just so that everybody knows it would be I, I think it would be the same process as we used last year where we would say um select what course oh i'm about to be signed out <laughs> sorry um well we asked betsy anybody <laughs> I'm can Big still hear us? Not sure. Yeah. Betsy, can you hear us? Mm. <laughs> we might be the only thing that Big can hear. <laughs> Maybe we're the only thing on the live st stream. Linus is asking me if I'm still here. Yep, Mariah and I are here. <laughs> Um, I'm being told that we are live on big and that the room cut out. Okay. Um, yeah, me too, but I'm going to get back into the. Well, for everybody who's watching, I'm sure that we'll just hold tight and it'll be back in a minute. I'm getting a message that the computer restarted there and they're asking if we can hear them. The number of texts that I'm getting. <laughs> saying we're still live okay well i'm gonna be quiet now and wait for the computer and everything to Getting a message that the big, big computer shut down. Oh, they brought us back. We're, we're, uh, we're having to bring. Oh, we're having to bring you're you coming back. On okay, bye. All right, so we're all back. We're all back. Okay, I have a motion on the table, <laughs> and I think that my motion can allow the staff to do as they think is appropriate and what they can do. And let's let's move on. Well, I just want the the motion to be very clear about what's yeah. happening for next year. So, as I, I think I was formulating before, the pilot extends into next year, and there will still be a ninth grade honors ELA and there will be a ninth grade standard ELA and so it's essentially status quo for next year but with more data gathering and with more adjustments as we heard as we see more data come in. The, the only thing it, and what I'm not clear about is why anybody who wants to take it couldn't take it, the pilot. Well they almost can. The, the answer was it depends on class sizes but for the most part you can if if students would like to be in the pilot, they can be, and that's what actually happened for this year. Initially, they were looking at three sections, ended up being five. I think 
to elaborate a little bit and just to kind of build on what John said a moment ago, if the class had been populated only by students who would have otherwise been in college prep, that is not a mixed class. If the class had been populated only by students who would otherwise have been in honors, it is not a mixed class, mm -hmm. right? And so we wanted, in order to see, like this year the pilot was designing curriculum, delivering this instruction in a different way, right? We're really appreciative that the pilot was so popular and it's gone so well. Um, but if it's gonna be a test of a mixed community, it has to be a mixed community. So right? and, last year, were you turning away kids who would have been, who would, were recommended for college prep or turning away kids who were recommended for honors? We only turned away about 15 or 20 kids who would have been in honors. In honors. We, we designed, we built off the number of kids who would have been in college prep and then combined, matched them with honors. Too. But so that ended up with a 50 50 ratio, I mean, 50 -50. But, but which actually doesn't reflect yeah, what, would ha what would have happened if, if that's this right. became the only option. So there's no reason, maybe, why you can't let everybody in and have more, a, and a different mix of honors. You and, can play with the percentages for this year. Yeah. yeah. And we think we'll be able to maintain sort of that level of co-teaching that you've had this year if, if that turned out to be appropriate. I think the key is co-teaching is linked to students' IEPs. Right. Um, so if, if that became necessary, do you have the, do you have the resources to, to do that? Yeah, yes. They had to. They okay. Um, I think a, another distinction, right, because I don't, any class, we, we may turn students away from all sorts of classes at Brooklyn High, right? Um, and so when, if we're going to build classes, um, we're going to try to avoid to build very large classes and again hopefully the budget helps us make that even better um but sometimes when we're doing sectioning the math just doesn't divide cleanly right and so um, we have to be we have to consider how many students create classes of an appropriate size i mean that is as an aside a benefit of having only one course right you can divide students into 23 different sections it's a scheduling ease as well but um it's beside the point right now said to Andy's point, I think you should feel comfortable to go up to a 25-75 split. Um, yeah. All right. So do we all understand what we're voting on? We are voting to continue the ninth grade ELA pilot without removing honors for ninth grade and college prep for ninth grade. So essentially it's status quo for next year, but with additional data gathering. David, can I just add though, even if it's not part of the formal vote, that I also would endorse Helen's request to get data on WISP presented. As can I make a point of order on that? Okay. Uh, WISP is not docketed for tonight. I'm not right. making it a vote. Okay, so is there a second? Second. Helen seconds. Natalia, your vote. I am voting no. Stephen? Yes. Suzanne? No. Andy? Yes. Helen? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Mariah? Yes. Valerie? Yes. And I also vote yes. So I know you all want to move on. I have a really important question that may not be answerable tonight. It may be something we have to take up in curriculum subcommittee. Um, what additional data are you interested in so that we can start now? The class is still ongoing, right? We will continue to do this work. This is really important to the school. And so we need to get a lot of clarity on what you are looking for. We think we brought a lot of really strong points. Obviously, they were not convincing, and I understand that, and I respect that. Um, but that is a thing that we need to address. So I think, at least for me, academic performance is very important. And uh, the studies seem to indicate that there's a negligible impact, and maybe that's just how it always is. But of course, uh, there is nothing more um, telling than what's actually taking place in a specific pilot. But we need more time in order to see what those different achievement levels look like. In particular, I think of the scatter plot graph and I was a bit concerned that performance for those in the lower 50, in the bottom 50% seemed to be indistinguishable between college prep and the pilot. But again, it's, it's very early. And so with more time, I wonder if we'll see a shift in those types of numbers. I would hope to, because uh, while certainly 
having uh, more representative demographics in our classes is important to me. So is academic excellence and improvement. And so I would want to be able to see what that looks like. So for, for me, Gabe, oh, sorry. I was just going to say the data for me would be that it doesn't do harm. So if you have 10th grade MCAS, or I don't know what there is, that we're not seeing a drop. Because for me, walking into those classrooms and seeing such a you know, segregated classroom, like that is harm to me. So as long, I don't think we need to prove that it's better for academics, but that it doesn't harm the academic achievement. So as long as it's equal or, or you know, not worse, I would say that's good enough for me, given that the uh, socio-emotional and the sort of segregation is by there. Well, at least for me, I think it's, I, I have, I partially agree. I wouldn't want to see our uh, higher achievers being hurt, but I would like to see those who are, of course, but I'm saying that in terms of growth, I would like to see growth from those who are currently struggling. Isn't that ultimately how we're going to try to address the achievement gap? We need to see improvement one way or another. I mean, my answer to that is going back to Stephen's point that we're not going to see it through one course. Like that eventually as a school system, we need to see that. And I think it's investments in all of the early education. Like that is, of course, what we all want. But for a course like this, a decision like this, having a more diverse classroom setting has benefits that are just not measurable academically. And, and so I would, I would say as long as it doesn't harm any of our groupings, I would be happy with a more uh, diverse classroom. I, I would right. like to refer to the curriculum subcommittee yeah. to discuss this. I think that's where it needs to be and get some of our staff to, who have experience in doing research on, uh, on, on different types of programs to, to help us to think through what, what, what's doable, first of all, and, and what, what, what's important here. Val is on the verge of making a and point. And the teachers who are in the program now, too, because they've started to look at some of that. So, Go ahead, Valerie. Thank you. Um, I, I do think it's really promising, but um, I, I would like to see not just the 10th grade recommendations, which, which look really promising coming out of the pilot, but how those students do in 10th grade and you know whether they stay in their honors class and just a little bit more um, longitudinal data on how the students from the pilot are faring in their um, 10th grade class. I, I would second Val's point because if all we're doing is delaying a return to sort of that stratification, then I'm not sure how successful this is. So I, I do think that's an important metric to look at. Mr. Perlman, may I offer a couple of thoughts? Go right ahead. Um, so I agree with David. I understand and respect uh, the vote. It's clear to me. I think I'm not asking for a response now. I do need us to think as district leaders, as school committee members. Um, I know as a school leader, I need to think about the message that I'm bringing back to my staff about innovating to address outcome gaps and opportunity gaps. And I understand the need for more information. I also own and understand some of the shortcomings in our process in terms of bringing along parents, guardians, and caregivers. As you can hear in my voice, I'm upset. I'm upset because I have a wonderful faculty that is trying to think about the best ways to serve all students, particularly those who need it most. And I welcome energy, frustration, anger from parents who feel like they were blindsided by the work that we've been doing over the last several years. I have been concerned that in some of those organized communications, the word moratorium was used over and over again. And I think as an English teacher about where that word comes from, and I think that to me, it feels like killing equity work. And I know that's not what you're trying to do. I am worried about the message that I'm carrying back to my faculty and staff about really important work that we need to do. And I want to be really clear that I respect you all as individuals, as a body. You are trying to do right by the entire district. This is not an easy decision. Um, and so 
uh, want us to do some thinking together in whatever way is appropriate. It sounds like curriculum subcommittee, as Helen suggested, to think about data that we want and need. Uh, and I think there are lar larger conversations to have about um, how to best support our faculty and staff in doing what we all see as super critical work. So thank you. Adelia? Can I make a recommendation to Linus to meet with all the principals of the eighth grade class and really speak about the pilot? And I feel like the word pilot is maybe misleading to say this is a new model, like to really explain it to them. So encourage more recommendations into the pilot, like really put effort into the eighth graders to know about it, to understand it, to understand that it is more choice, to show them some of the data and really discourage parents from sending kids to standard if you know if the kids themselves are saying like i really think we need to given this really try to by choice not by force um expand this as much as we can and i think linus this is up to you to sort of help and you know um, I, I mean i will add natalia that anthony has done that with his group uh in the what, what were your sessions for rising ninth graders because i've heard from many parents saying they were excited about the project, the, the pilot. They understood what you were trying to say. They had faith, even if they didn't understand it all, that it was going to be a good program. So, yeah, the eighth grade, yeah, yeah. But I, I, but I, do, I do want to give you credit. I know that you have been out there talking to the families of the rising ninth graders, and they have been hearing you, so. Well, and part of the important process, right, in course selection is also eighth grade course selection. And so all of our departments, the curriculum coordinators talk, and they work with the, the eighth grade teams to the best of their ability. So I know that John will be working with Kristen. He already has to some extent. Um, we have put them in a bit of a holding pattern waiting for this vote, right? So now we know how to go forward. And I know we'll do a lot of communication that way. All right, anyone else? I do just want to reiterate that not one of us, I don't think, uh, questioned the value of this pilot class. I think all of us are excited about the potential that it offers and some of the gains it's already showing. It sounds to me like it's more a question of we're only a half year into it and, it, and it's a little early. I think that's where most of us are. Uh, and so I, I really do hope that uh, your staff and the administration are not taking this as a sharp rebuke. It's just perhaps we, we want to be a little more cautious on our end and make sure that we're really looking at all of the data very comprehensively and understand what some of the other potential options are and what adjustments uh, your staff might make as more time passes and you gain more data points. Uh, for instance, you heard some discussion that there's some interest in potentially unleveled replacing college prep. Maybe that could be something that's looked at. Another consideration we heard is perhaps honors credit being offered within uh, this pilot class. So there's a lot of excitement for it, and there's still a lot of variations to consider. I think that just for some of us, it was a little premature because a half year seemed quick. So uh, we're not trying to offend anyone, and we really appreciate the very hard work and the novel approach that you're taking to developing this class. All right, so with that, we will move to our next agenda item. And, Mar and Mariah, hopefully you can get through this pretty quick. Um, I think it's principally Susan who will be presenting. So I will All right. defer to her and So maybe you can say, hopefully, Susan, you can make it through very quick. I would just remind the committee that it takes two to tango, as we just saw in our prior presentation. So to whatever extent we can streamline our own questions and such, then that will all help us get through. All right. Good evening. That was a lot. 
Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm going to make this as stealth for you as I can. I know you're fried. Um, and I'm going to offer a suggestion for how to move forward because asking you to take a vote at this hour after such an intense meeting, um, I don't feel serves you or 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 any of us. So, unless Mariah feels differently, um, so uh, tonight, if you can uh, go to the first slide, I'll just review quickly. Uh, what we hope to accomplish. Uh, so I'm going to give you a quick update on the town school partnership thumbnail. Um, and then uh, I'll go into uh, some information that was shared that's part of the financial plan that was brought forward by the town before the um, vacation break. Then I'm just going to talk for a second about the enrollment forecast. There was a significant presentation last night, and I'm not going to get into it on any high level. Um, I just want to share a few highlight highlights for us because it 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 may help inform data that may help inform some of the choices we want to make. Um, and then um, I, Betsy has handed out um, some additional information. For the budget, one is the revolving funds, which I had not uh, been able to provide earlier. Uh, so you got the grants a couple of weeks ago. Now you have the revolving funds, so you have all funds now. Um, and then in addition to that, there have been a whole host of questions asked by uh, members of this committee and advisory and perhaps citizens. I don't know everybody yet, so I don't recognize all names. Um, and so each meeting we have, uh, chosen three or four um, to discuss in depth um, at these meetings. Uh, we've covered the ones that the school committee um, seem to have the most energy around. And so these ones are just additional ones, uh, you know, for, for the record, um, for you to read and peruse at your leisure, and we will post them on the website. Much of the information in the questions is also information that's in the narratives, but sometimes people can get overwhelmed, so chunking them and answering specific questions that people have is sometimes easier for folks to digest. And then uh, we're going to talk about some budget changes and then some potential additions. So uh, that's our agenda, and I'm going to um, make this as clear and simple as I can. Um, so first we're going to talk about the, um, if you can do the other slide first, Dr. Guillory. Um, there we go. Okay, so uh, this information, and certainly I can um, print it and put it in a PDF because it's, it's small. Um, there isn't, um, I'm not going to get into detail here, I'll just share again what you're looking at is what I'm referring to as the town's budget thumbnail. Um, in December on the 13th, they, they gave us their first estimate or forecast of, um, of the budget, both revenues and expenses, and that's in the blue. So that kind of grounds us. That's where we began. And then on February the 6th, we were provided uh, with additional updates, and that was after um, the governor's budget was released. And then um, on the 15th of February, that is the date, I guess, in, in the bylaws that um, the town um, is to publish their financial plan. And uh, there was some updated information shared uh, because cash was free cash was certified. And we've been waiting quite some time to get free cash certified. That's really the big change here. Um, but it also includes a lot of detailed information um, to help better explain what's in each of these little subcategories. I'm not going to go through it tonight. You are uh, highly intelligent um, and very literate human beings, and you can read that at your leisure as well. Um, but I, I wanted you to have that so that you were aware that there is about $5 million in unanticipated free cash. And as a result of that, the town in their financial plan included a pretty significant increase for capital projects for us, which is the next slide. Um, I'm, again, I'm not going to get into great depth on the individual deferred maintenance projects. We'll do that at the capital subcommittee meeting 
next week. But I just wanted to give you some highlights um, because it's important and it's good news. And at this hour, I think some good news would help. Um, so uh, classroom capacity is for the leases, um, really for BEEP, um, for a BEEP program. And uh, we had originally requested 640,000, and then we had to go through the process of negotiating leases for the extended, um, um, extended day for BEEP. And so it, it uh, will require us to pay an additional 77,000 for our leases over what we had originally requested and that has been funded. So that's the good news. Our leases are funded for next year. Um, in terms of uh, furniture and fixtures, last year you didn't get any money for furniture. Um, this year we requested 200,000 and thankfully they're giving us the 200,000. 125,000 of this is for um, cafeteria tables for the high school and 75 is for all other uh, furniture needs we may have uh, based on wear and tell. So Baldwin might be an example if we need some additional furniture there. Um, um, IEP accommodations, that's a new ask on our part. We were asking for $50,000 on an annual basis, similar to what they're doing at the towns. Um, and they front loaded us 200,000. And, and so what this money is, is um, from time to time, uh, there is an IEP accommodation that's made that requires us to modify our facility in some way. And uh, should that occur, of course, we don't budget for those. We don't know those in advance. This gives us the ability to address those issues that may arise um, when they do arise. And, um, and then deferred maintenance, they front loaded us about three years worth of deferred maintenance in our plan. So that's wonderful news. And what, what this will allow us to do over the next couple of years is to finish up the Lincoln um, project. So the Lincoln will be completely refurbished um, uh, using this money, not all this year. Again, this is a multi-year plan. Um, Sorry, um, Susan, also, do you mean Lincoln or Baldwin? Lincoln, at Lincoln first I was saying, Baldwin also will be oh, able to okay. complete. Yeah, it, it includes money for both of those. Um, so that's really exciting. We'll be able to finish both of those. And then there's other projects in the other schools that, you know, we, we can talk about maybe at another time, but it's really good news and it allows us to be able to um, think um, and plan over the next couple of years um, without having to wonder what our money situation is going to be. And then the last item was the long-term capital plan. They funded that as well. So um, over the next year or so, We'll, we'll do some uh, a study to really evaluate now that we have the enrollment projections, capacity of our buildings, condition of our buildings, and be able to um, have that to inform future capital improvement plans. So that's kind of the good news. Um, and we'll talk more about that after we... The, the building department um, in some areas got um, level funded in some areas they reduced. And I don't know the particulars around what the, you know, the 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 thinking was around that. I didn't spend a lot of time with Melissa on that, but I did, since we've always presented that, I thought I would share the update on that um, as well. And, and it's important to note that a lot of these aren't just for town projects. Some of these are set asides for either school or town. So ADA renovations, HVAC roofs and all of that. Some of that money is, is available um, for renovations um, and improvements and maintenance in our schools. So. Uh, so that was that was that. Um, no, no, no big heavy lift there. Hopefully, uh, you find that helpful. So again, there's a there's a you know the Cropper report is out there. You all have access to that. The presentation I thought was uh, well done uh, by Cropper and his team. And uh, I just wanted to to touch on a few hi highlights. So um, in essence, uh, you know what what they're telling us is that. District-wide, our enrollments are going to be going down, not, not dropping off, you know, but, but declining um, over the next uh, four or five years. And then they're going to start to um, increase again, but they're not going to ever get to the level in the next 10 years anyways um, to uh, the pre-pandemic numbers. So that's really helpful to know as we're planning, um, both for um, classes and um, any future uh, renovation and or expansion work. So that's 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 really uh, the highlight here. 
Um, when we look at it at the elementary school, it looks a little bit different than it does at the high school, so I thought I would make note of that. Um, this looks to me like it is the elementary. Um, so in, at the K-8 level, um, the, the numbers are declining slightly, but they're going to um, start to creep back up um, in a consistent, um, steady fashion um, after about three years. And so um, uh, that's important for us to know. The good news is, is we have Driscoll that you expanded. We have Pierce, you know, Pierce will come back online by the time the enrollments start to inch their way up a bit. Um, overall, um, by the end of the overall increase, it will be about an additional 500 students um, at the end of the 10 year period. The high school looks a little bit differently. Um, you can see a little bit you know, more uh, variation there. And so the high school is going to be on a decline uh, for about five years. And then it's going to start uh, moving up a bit. And then it'll recede a little bit um, towards the end of the 10 years. Um, when it when it goes back up, it will it will peak out. They're estimating it will peak out about what the enrollment is right now. So it's not going to go higher than what we have in this current year, as as they're expecting. And I would suggest that you know perhaps in another three years we do a refresh and really see, you know what, how that's trending. Um, but I I, I felt uh, pretty confident, especially when we have two independent. Um, studies done that are done using different methodologies and I thought the most interesting thing to me and validating thing is that the pattern is similar like the numbers might vary a little but when you're looking at the pattern the pattern's similar um, so uh, that's all I wanted to highlight um, so that uh, any concern about you know oh my gosh you know the class sizes are going to you know be significantly higher next year they're not um, they're going to be lower next year um, both at the in fact the original information that I sh had shared on the NESDEQ um, Cropper is saying it's going to be lower than what the NESDEQ estimates were so we should be uh, perfectly um, you know fine with you know what, what we've been using for estimates in our budget in terms of class size so I don't see anything that's going to alter um, the class size information we've already shared um, Susan, can I make one comment on K-8? If you don't mind, Linus, pulling that one chart up on K-8 again. I think one thing that's important, and this has to do with the Cropper versus the NESDAQ methodology, and just contextualizing this for Brookline, is that NESDAQ, as I recall, uses a um, focuses on birth cohorts and carries those forwards. And Cropper very intentionally also considers in-migration from other places. And one of the things we know about the Brookline situation is that very few of our kindergartners are born in Brookline. And so that additional consideration of in-migration, that's the Cropper forecast, which is the red dots that are shown, is very important. And, and you can really see the difference that that makes as you consider the gray line, which is just considering birth cohorts versus the red line that's the considering the Brookline specific um, other pat patterns of in-migration into the district. So just as we look at this, I think people might, their eyes might carry to just the blue line or give the red line and the gray line equal weight. But I think in my opinion, the fact that Cropper makes this very specific Brookline consideration leads me to have greater faith in the red dot as opposed to the gray line. Based on what I could understand of their methodologies, um, the NESDEQ uh, version seems more like a projection of current trends, um, whereas the, um, the Cropper one really involves a model and a forecast. Um, and I would concur with uh, Mariah on that. It was much more involved study and they did take and we spent a lot of time with them the planning department as well as our data team myself we've been meeting with them and sharing data and going over the data and then we've had uh, mariah and uh, uh, cliff also look at it with a fresh set of eyes to see if they saw anything so it's really been a a great collaboration and i feel uh that uh, and a lot of work went into it um, a lot of conversation was had and the factors that really affect us here in Brookline have been taken into consideration to the extent that you can in a model. Um, 
in in the Cropper report. So I, I, I agree with that, and thank you for saying that, Mariah. Okay, so we'll we'll move along. Um, again, I'm not going to spend any time on on this slide. Just to say that I've handed out the information for you to read. Um, again, if I missed a question, if I, I think I've gotten them all, but if certainly if I've missed something, send send an email, and uh, we, we can we can continue on with providing as much data as we can. Um, but I think that this uh, concludes all of the everything on the list um, of questions that we had received. So that's that's all I really was going to share on that uh, slide tonight. So next, we're going to move into the budget changes. So this first slide here are our budget shifts. And so uh, if you recall at the last meeting when we were talking about contracted services and I said, I, you know, when I was digging into the contracted services, I learned that something was labeled contracted services, but it was transportation. And so I'm just really what I'm calling out here are things that are going to shift when I do your final budget after we make all our decisions. I'm going to give you a fresh document with everything in it, and you're going to see some money moving from one place to another. It has no impact on the bottom line. I'm just calling it out, and I'm not really going to spend a whole lot of time on it, just to say that um, there's a few of these uh, adjustments from the high school to the revolving, from the base revolving to OTL. So you'll see some chunks of money moving as I went through and reconciled everything. And, and, um, and like I said, the high school and the transportation, if there's more of these, I, I'll highlight them for you so that we can kind of track them. So that's all uh, I was gonna share on that, just to, just to record it, just to acknowledge it, so you have that. The next slide is really um, a lot of the work that has taken place since. So. Um, we continue to look and um, have conversations about, you know, um, you know, things like the the cleaning contract. And I've spent some time with the operations team, and in reviewing um, our needs school by school again, um, what we learned in the process of of tying all of that and and identifying where we have staff versus where we're contracting for staff. Um, what we found in that analysis was that uh, we had some funds sitting in both sides. So this 134,000 we can reduce on the contracted services side because I'm holding vacant positions on the salary side. So we don't need to hold them in both places, which means that we can just reduce without changing any of the uh, delivery of services, $134,000 off of that line. And then in addition, as I went through um, the work of reconciling the grants and preparing that for you, um, you know, Jody and I sat down uh, and started looking at the professional development. We know how important it is to have that ELA program move forward. Um, so all of the PD for, for the ELA program, of course, is sitting at that 58,000, but there was more money. So we were moving more of the professional development that we had proposed in this budget off the budget and over to the grant. So here's a few more uh, examples of where we're going to re we we're reducing the budget because we're going to fund it um, through the Title II grant. So the total reductions right now are a little over two hundred thousand dollars. So there's nothing we need to to really do other than I'm acknowledging you know that the delta that we have is a little bit smaller than when we began. Okay. I'm getting to that. I, on the last slide, I'll summarize all of it so you have that. I'll, I'll summarize everything for you there. So then there's the potential additions. So we've talked about the ELA program. And, um, and so between what we have in the operating budget and what we funded through grants, the, the, all we need to fund that isn't currently funded is this 19000 Now, Jody and I both feel like you know, we can do some negotiating. If you remember on the um, shipping costs, we're really super high. We think we can do better on that. So, um, but the difference between the proposal that Jody had and what we have funded at this particular point, the Delta is just, uh, uh, you know, 19,157. At the last meeting, you had that conversation about adding two additional high school teachers. The cost of that would be 160,000. Um, and then when we first presented the initial budget, we had given you a list of a few things that, you know, we wanted to, uh, that weren't in the budget, but 
you know, we thought was important to have a dialogue with you about. And one of them was the peer school staffing. The cost of that is 138,000. I'll talk in one, one minute on the next slide about what exactly that is. And then OS has expand, expanded service opportunities. So Lisa's here tonight um, and is going to uh, talk about potentially expanding Winthrop House down into the middle school level. So she's going to talk about that. The net um, impact of that, um, if, if that's something that you'd, you'd like to support for this year, would be about 225000 um, Another item on the, on the, uh, um, that we had identified uh, was this um, uh, uh, transportation um, costs. And we all saw how high that had gone up. We're out to bid right now, but the bids aren't due until the 7th. So I can't really tell you what the impact of that will be. Maybe it'll be great news. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, maybe it'll break us even. I don't know, and maybe it'll be a little higher. I just, I just don't know until I won't. We won't know till the seventh. So, when the bids are opened, I can share more on that. And then, last but not least, um, you know, uh, Charlie Simmons has uh, requested an additional one hundred and eighty-seven thousand four hundred ninety dollars for uh, school maintenance and repair. Uh, we're going to talk more about that at the Capitol uh, Subcommittee meeting next week. Um, uh, so he has a base budget that's already funded, um, and uh, this is just additional. So I guess in the, the agreement with the town school partnership, we agreed to build in 2.5%. Um, Charlie's asking for a 4.5% increase, so this represents the difference between what is already funded in the town budget um, and what Charlie's asking for. So altogether, uh, all of these in combination, I'm not saying we're increasing our budget by 730, but I figured somebody would ask, so I put it on the slide. Uh, so all of those together, um, absent you know, information on the transportation is $730,953. So um, for the peers, just you know, more uh, you know, to, to be clear, um, it's to, you know, we're splitting one building into two campuses, and so um, there's some additional staffing resources that Jamie would like us to add to help, um, uh, you know, help in this kind of transitional period. And so some of that is some intermittent administrative support. Um, so we're asking for $40,000 for that. Uh, special education teachers. So as she's explaining it um, right now, when she's in this, um, you know, K K eight setting. You know, she can provide staff are, are working. You know, across all grades. When she splits them, then you know the transition time. If people are going to be running groups, um, they lose time. So to ensure you know uh, service delivery is is um, at the quality we would expect, she's asking for one more special education teacher. And then one one thing that is, is is really nice, and it's it's kind of a really inexpensive way to get some additional um, instructional support, is through the uh, Northeastern Internship uh, Program. And every elementary school has one, and so she's going to have two buildings. And for eighteen thousand five hundred, this allows her to have one in each building. So the total um, all in is one hundred and thirty eight thousand six hundred and eighty. And the next piece. Um, okay, sorry, I, I just ask about that. Is it not possible to fund any of that from the Pierce project budget? It was not included. Staffing was not included. The transportation was included. Mm -hmm. There were there were costs that were included, including moving yeah. um, and all of that. But there was no staffing. No, uh, nothing for planning. Nothing nope. for staffing. Okay. No. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the next uh, item, and you know, Lisa's here, and she can do a far better job explaining the Winthrop House, especially me being new. Um, so she's going to walk you through this expansion of the Winthrop House. So I'll let uh, there's about four slides or so, and uh, Lisa will walk you through that proposal. Thank you, Susan, and good evening, everybody. Good to see you. In the fall of 2022, the OSS leadership team began their targeted work of looking at the continuum of specialized special education programs across our schools. And while we have a range of robust, fantastic programming, the study group identified a gap for middle, middle school students with um, significant emotional vulnerabilities. Next slide, please. 
At the high school, the current Winthrop House program that we all know is a well-established program and it's designed to provide students with unique learning opportunities in an emotionally and physically safe and supportive therapeutic environment. It is one of many uh, specialized programs that PSB offers. And specific to this program in partnership with families, the goal is to help our students acquire and utilize the social, emotional, academic, and life skills needed for future success. And this requires the provision of intensive supports in a small group environment, which is necessary to deliver a wide array of trauma-informed therapeutic and educational services. Next slide, please. Expanding Winthrop House to include students in grades six through eight is our shared commitment at PSB, our philosophy of keeping our students and families connected to their home communities whenever possible. And the goal is to support our students in making those changes that will carry them successfully into their future, continuing whenever possible to matriculate through the PSB school district. Next slide. We can explore this at a deeper level at another time if the committee would like, but um, this is basically a slide that talks about the philosophy of the Winthrop model and the milieu in supporting our very fragile students that would otherwise need to choose a private out of district option to meet their needs. Next slide. Unfortunately, Lisa, can, I ask, can I ask a question? Sorry. Sure. Um, have you done an analysis of students who are out of district and um, how many might fit into this program versus whichever program they are in out of district and what savings that might be in a different line item? Yes. Next slide. <laughs> oh, sorry. 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 No, no. <laughs> quite all right. Um, so from a, and we, and probably to answer your question, Valerie, more specifically, I can, I can uh, add a few comments. What I did hear um, was from a budgetary perspective, I tried to provide a little bit of an analysis on the left that highlights the trajectory and cost of vulnerable students that might ultimately require an out of district placement approximately as an example, and again, I apologize for the small uh, font, but approximately five students each year um, leave our schools for a period of time for a 40-day extended evaluation. That 40-day um, extended eval costs approximately $18,000. There's a cost for the evaluation and the setting. That does not include transportation. When possible, those students will return to highly specialized programs within the district, but a gap does exist for students in grades six through eight who have substantive mental health challenges. So for students with this profile, it's more likely that an out of district program would be recommended. Another scenario, just to show you a few uh, scenarios here on the left side, um, for other students, there are students that may be hospitalized over the course of the year for varying lengths of time, requiring home hospital tutoring and other coordinated supports. Again, the decision has to be made by the team, which certainly includes the family, as to whether the student's needs can be met within the district or is something more intensive required. Again, options for our emotionally fragile middle, middle school age group, uh, the options are limited. Um, 
So on the right, you can see that um, I've costed out what the program would cost in its entirety to get it off the ground. Uh, but I did want to uh, draw your attention to some offsets because the investment costs obviously is that $440,000, but the offsets reduce that delta to the 225,000 that Susan mentioned on the prior slide. First, it's anticipated that the paraprofessional needs of the program can be addressed through realignment of staff. Second, we anticipate being able to use the IDEA 240 entitlement grant to uh, potentially cover the cost of a special educator and or psychologist. And finally, another option for the committee to consider is to phase in the program from a fiscal perspective, not staffing the program in its entirety. And that would require thoughtfully limiting the number of students that we could serve in the first year and then considering the impacts um, on how we provide the general education programming. Right now, we have two students identified in out-of-district schools that the team, including the family, um, might consider a return to the district. We also have uh, several students uh, whose needs can be better met within the Winthrop House model. Um, and several students that potentially would not need to be placed in out-of-district schools. So we're looking at the potential costs of, of, uh, of supporting those students differently. So my last slide is really a restatement of, um, again, different yes, ways. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but how many students then were you thinking of to begin with in this to program? Begin with, yeah, thank you, Helen. I was thinking to begin with, we'd um, if we fully funded the program, we could open with six to eight students. If we were phasing in, um, we would be looking in that first year of limiting the program to four. Our study group has identified the Driscoll School as the best setting for next year. There's a, a suite um, of spaces um, that uh, really are optimal for this program. Um, and then as the peer school is, is renovated, we certainly can consider other options, but um, Principal Euclid has been a very active part of exploring this Winthrop House model at grades six through eight um, and is uh, excited about the possibility of being able to, to offer this programming to our middle schoolers. So Lisa, this would be something just offered to um, Brookline students, or if there's capacity, would you take in students from other districts? We would always consider uh, opening the program. I'll be very honest, uh, In in uh, we're usually at capacity in our highly specialized programs, and we certainly, um, through the IEP process, I would anticipate that um, we will, you know, get to capacity, but we are certainly open to that for a student from another community that would enhance our programming. Just for context, Winthrop House at the high school serves 32 students currently, and that is maximum capacity for the staffing uh, pattern and the location. I'm sorry, question. On the left where you have the fiscal projections for out of district costs, you don't, if I see it correctly, you don't include busing. That's correct. I did not include transportation um, for, for. Um, so that's at least another couple hundred thousand, no? Absolutely. So this is a no brainer. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> Why, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> So that's a good point. So Lisa, would that mean that we would reduce the transport, we could reduce the transportation line accordingly? Or you'd have to analyze it. It's not fair to ask at 11 o'clock at night, 11.30 at night. Yeah. We, Lisa and, and I will never, look at it closer. Unfortunately, it's not a black and white uh, process, obviously, yeah. um, but uh, we could certainly study that. Yeah. What I meant by a no brainer is this is better for kids to be mm -hmm. in their district it's a great program that Winthrop House does, and you know, with the opportunity for the kids then to be somewhat included also in the, the regular program. Mm -hmm. So I, I totally support it. No, it's 11 to 20. Can I ask a quick question about how it works? So, because I see very few FTEs, do they get instruction from regular classes? Like how, how do kids, if there's five kids out at like different sixth, seventh and eighth grade, how, how does it work? Well, you can see, thank you, um, you can see that I um, was requesting a budget of 2.0 FTE. The study group was envisioning at the middle school level um, having one teacher that would focus on um, STEM, so the science and math programming, for the three grades, and the other would focus on the ELA uh, social studies uh, aspect. And we need to do a little bit more work on potential groupings for certain curricular areas because the one commitment of the Winthrop House model is that we um, adhere to the, the rigorous, robust, a Brookline curriculum, um, but we're offering it in a trauma-informed small group setting. Thank you. That was Thank great. you very much. So the last slide is the summary. Um, so this is the answer to Ellen's, Ellen's question that the initial budget proposal was $138,642,989. And as of the February 6th um, um, allocation, running it through the uh, model, um, our, our uh, allotment is $136,413, no, 413421 dollars and it, which means our initial gap was uh, 2229568 with the reductions that were on the previous slide or several slides back of uh, basically 205000 It leaves a new gap of just uh, slightly above $2 million. Susan, that's not with the subsequent seven hundred k worth of proposed additions? The proposed additions are not considered. This is just the new gap that because nothing's been added right so the reductions just, are true right I'm just, yeah yeah just so you'd have to add to that if you were going to add any of those items okay and what and what was the final estimated impact of the Winthrop proposal 200 and if you can go back about including five the FCEs plus the in transportation though I just it's too late uh one more but if you were to one more pump that in. there are 225,000 and and Lisa, is that um, again for the phased in? Is the two the, this net number be, because of the phase in, or or without the phase in? Without the phase in, that's uh, that would uh, with the proposed uh, offsets, uh, that would be to to do the 2.0 Gen Ed, the psychologist, the special educator, um, so we could bring that number down if we were phasing in. But that's not reducing transportation, Lisa. So would this number come down if we were reducing transportation? I I can't answer that right now, Valerie, without really looking at the specific students and the roots, but potentially there might be a small reduction. But that but this is a proposal, so it hasn't happened yet. So the no. two the two hundred and four thousand or so in reductions, that's separate. That's separate. Right. And that's true. 
no matter what happens. That's a reduction. Yeah. David, can I make a comment? Go ahead. Okay, so by the end of tonight, what we want to have happen at this point is for our school committee to give staff direction as to which of these things, wait, go back to that other slide that we were just on. Thank you. Which of these things we want to ask them to add to the budget? Because at our March 14th meeting, staff is go are going to present their recommendations for how we close the gap. So right now, as Susan mentioned, we're at 2 million. There's another 700-ish thousand here on the table. And, and at the end of tonight, we're gonna have an, either we're gonna stick with 2 million or we're gonna adjust that in some way. That's gonna be the number that staff is then aiming for presenting offsets to on the 14th. So at so least for me, I, I'm not really comfortable adding anything uh, until we've actually made cuts first. So if it turns out that we're able to cut more than the two, the current two million gap, uh, then I think we can talk about additions. I agree. Well, I I would say two things if I could. Uh, the school maintenance and repair, I don't think we need to put in there, especially if there's more in the maintenance and repair in in our CIP. I think that we could work that one out. So I would take that out of the 730. If if you find that the OSS one is a wash or close to a wash. I think that's a good investment because it will save us money in the long term. So those would be two that I would attempt to, to keep. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Is that? Well, those would be my two suggestions. Um, I tried to, to Move, <laughs> move and keep, <laughs> let's put it that way. What would you uh, need from the committee in terms of endorsing this Winthrop House extension to grade six through eight proposal? It seems like a win-win and that it's great for students and it's also good financially. So how would you suggest that we proceed with that? Do you want a vote on it? Do you want a uh, opportunity, an opportunity for a more detailed presentation that would incorporate the transportation numbers so we know fully? That probably makes sense. I, I, I guess at this point, again, it's 1130 at night, so it's hard to do our best thinking at this hour for all of us. Um, so perhaps what we, you know, to your point, we can certainly give you a proposal to close the $2 million gap and then um, other reasonable proposals uh, beyond that that might um, allow you some wiggle room on some of the other items. I'll give Lisa and I a chance to kind of dig in a little bit more on what options, um, you know, or levers we might have um, to make the Winthrop House um, viable, you know, at a, as much of a cost neutral, um, in, in a cost neutral way. Um, and, but we can't do that, you know, at this hour, if that if that's what I'm hearing, and we won't worry so much about um, trying to find proposals that would allow us to to cover the 187,000. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. But I I just want to add though. I mean, there's another three hundred thousand dollars between the second and third bullet that are on the table, um, and I think David and Stephen, while I understand that you want to see them cut the first two million. The point is that they need to be able to know where they're aiming for. And so if we're asking them to cut 2 million, they might make different choices than if we're asking them to cut 2.3. And so I think that um, we should be specific at this point. I'm gonna push people to be specific at this point as to whether or not you want them to find room for those two proposals. It feels like people are gonna take Helen's, take Helen's direction on the last bullet and that there's a relatively clear um, action on the fourth bullet re regarding OSS um, and Winthrop House. And well, the ELA, the ELA a curriculum, really 20,000 doesn't change the direction of things particularly anyway. Um, so I presume, given that if 20,000 is what's between us and implementing curriculum fully, we probably want to pull the trigger on that. But again, there's the second and third bullet that are 300,000 that I feel we should give direction tonight. At, at least speaking for myself, I think what would be helpful would be if we see, if we have different identified buckets of money 
that add up to more than two million. Maybe it adds up to three million, maybe even four million, but at least we have all the options laid out for us. Uh, and then we can have a discussion about what our priorities are for those pools of money. David, I'm going to push back against that a little bit in that every single group or program that gets identified on the 14th um, has staff members associated and constituencies who care about it, almost certainly. And so the idea of proposing well beyond the 2.0 the or the 2.3 um, is just causing more, I think, consternation and angst among staff in the community. So proposing well past that to me doesn't seem like a feasible or appropriate approach. But Mariah, the approach that you're proposing seems to leave the school committee with no actual influence on um, on the budget. No, because the 14th is when staff will provide this. We will provide some feedback on whether or not we feel it will achieve our goals. And then we're still going to have another meeting on the 28th. That's why we had asked everyone for their schedules to try and schedule two meetings. But 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 if but given that we do have to make these cuts, then we, we would be presented simply with like, you know, what would barely get us there and there's really no wiggle room and we would have to accept them or not. And we would just have to accept them. Right. Like there's nothing so left you, for us to do. That's true. But are you going to start making cuts on the fly? Like, are you going to start making cuts well beyond what is going to be there? Or are you going to make cuts that the staff don't agree with and, and that, for example, Susan and Linus don't recommend? It's, it's just to know what our options are. Yeah, I mean, it, they would, it would mean that the process was basically entirely up to staff, and we would have to rubber stamp it, which might be all right, but that, that is what you're outlining. No, I don't agree with that characterization, but I can appreciate well, it. How, how would we actually, how would we actually uh, influence anything under your I think uh, between the 14th, I think between the 14th and the 28th, you will be able to provide feedback separately to staff. Um, is individuals, it doesn't have any issue with open meeting law. And if they come back on the 28th, they can again provide a, a moderated as needed um, perspective. Okay, but so I there would be we'll basically be no public, feedback. there would be no public discussion though that would actually That's influence That's not true anything. because the 28th is an ideal for a vote and it would be hopeful that we would get there, but if needed, we could extend it past that. I just don't feel comfortable with a process where um, any influence we might exert has to happen behind the scenes rather than in an open discussion. Right. I, I agree with Andy and Stephen on this. I, I understand what you're saying, Mariah, about not wanting to instill fear and panic, uh, and, and that's certainly a, an important consideration, but also is the transparency of open deliberation, also is our role as um, managers of the budget, essentially, in knowing what the options are, because otherwise we're in a position where it's either accept or reject what staff comes up with. And if we reject it in whole or in part, then essentially we're back to the drawing board of identifying other buckets. So to me, it's just cleaner to get it done and look at everything in one shot. I feel very uncomfortable with the idea of school committee. And we discussed this at finance last week, essentially shooting from the hip with suggestions of um, what they want to see cut. I, well, I, I still would want suggestions from staff. I'm not saying that we make up our minds solely without any direction at all. I still think there would be a specific proposal uh, from central office, and then we might suggest certain fine tuning fine tunings of it. Uh, so, how but large think, is the pool that you want them to go to aim for? Do you? Andy said three million, and then four million. What is the what is the size of the Scope I, I was being so, somewhat hyperbolic. I don't think it needs to be four million, but no. <laughs> may, maybe let's see. So we're looking at proposed additions of seven about seven hundred and thirty thousand. We have a gap no. of about. No, we're talking about. I think we've narrowed it down to three hundred ish plus whatever the OSS refined numbers are. So it's the two million plus possibly the first three bullets plus whatever the modification on the fourth bullet is. So maybe two two point five million. Maybe there may be two ways of doing this. One could be okay. This is the two point two million that we need to reduce, and if we get money back, this is the way we're going to start putting it back. So that certainly gives us some input into it. 
And uh, in addition to looking at some of the items, I mean, we might, you know, the ones that are being cut, we may not want, but that may be another way of, of trying to, to balance it. Also, when, two questions. When does, um, because this is going to be painful, um, when does the health care come in? Before the and 14th. Eat, the 14th. Yeah. So before are we doing this after the 14th? Yes, we're doing this the 14th. It's before. We'll have um, both the bids for the OSS transportation. At the end of the week, we should have the, the health insurance. So that will give us kind of the last two data points. And if the health insurance comes in better, then of course that automatically will close the gap. So right. help, and then it doesn't have to be as painful to close the two million um, there. And also, when does house two come in? We don't, my understanding is that uh, historically, you, we've gone with house one through the entire process. That's what I was told. Well, but if we're, house two is always higher. And, you know, in these times when things are really difficult and it's more likely that, you know, if the house goes for the set somewhere between that, what the house and the governor wants is what will come out. Helen, so, are you talking about the house budget? House two, uh, is yeah. the house two is the governor's budget, which is already out. Um, I meant the other one. The, yeah, the, that's the, the week of April 8th. The house budget will be out. Okay. Uh, Mariah, I'm confused about the exercise you're suggesting. I, I'm coming around on what you're suggesting, though, but I'm confused about the actual mechanics of it. So presumably, if we submit a $2.5 million budget that they have to cut, if, if that administration has to cut, I, I have no idea where they're going to cut. Presumably, it's going to be a pretty deep offering. Since so, you've already cut, I mean, right? Two point uh, five is a lot to cut. Already or not? Hang on, Helen. So, so if we put on some potential additions, I'm just going to assume that's going to be on the chopping block as well. So, I, I'm happy to say yes. Let's put the first three bullets into our ask and move this up to two point five million, with the assumption that that would be among the first things to go if you're going to balance the budget again, along with some significant offering of PSB. I mean, sure, 2.5. That sounds like a great number. Let's 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 chop off that 2.5 and those first three bullets would be among the things that could go. Is is that the is that what you're looking for? I I mean, I feel comfortable with that, but I think the point is Andy and David um say that they don't they want to have more uh discretion on the school committee set. I'll, I'll just give a very tangible example. So we've had discussions about classroom consolidations. We know that if we reduce FTEs so that everything matches up with our classroom size guidelines, we could realize about 900 something thousand dollars, and that would be 12 positions. And we had some debate here about whether that is a line item that we could uh, live with reducing or not. And some felt, no, let's not touch that. And others said, yes. So if my concern is if we limit our, ourselves just to that gap, then we don't really have anywhere else to turn if the committee decided that, well, we don't want to go with classroom consolidations. And now all of a sudden we don't have any other buckets of money that have been identified because we asked staff to just be somewhat minimal in terms of targeting potential cuts. So I think that whatever number we land on, it needs to be at least somewhat larger than the amount that actually has to be cut. Because that's what will give us some flexibility in our discussion. And if we know what our alternatives are, that helps inform the debate. Because, for instance, discussing classroom consolidations in a vacuum without knowing what the alternative is, then how can we really weigh competing priorities? So how big do you want, how much of a buffer do you want? I would think it needs to be at least a half million. Is that the sense of the committee? So you're asking for three million dollars worth of cuts, or two point five? Three. Sorry, three, three million dollars worth of cuts. Well, well, given it, it sounds like Stephen and some others would like to add in about half of these potential additions, so if we're doing that, then I think we would need to go to three million. So we want whatever it is plus five hundred-ish thousand. Right. So, but it's really, you're saying the first four 
four bullets is what you want. Us yes. To right. You're talking about the first four, four bullets plus a half a million. Right. And then identify potential cuts that could go a half a million beyond that which is not to say we're automatically going to cut that, of course. It's just so that we can have a, a more meaningful discussion with potential options. Okay, so it's like $3 million. Yeah. You want us to bring a proposal on the 14th showing you what $3 million worth of, of cuts might look like. And right. Okay. I was just going to add that like, if you're going to be suggesting cutting teachers then obviously like high school teachers we obviously won't add the two so there might be some obvious things that you know we're not going to add to if you're going to be cutting to but Most of our money is in staff, in so staff exactly so staff so in some ways i think some of the like yeah some of that may play out that a two you know but i i agree with david but i wonder if we can do it in a way that doesn't scare people like could you give us a model without cutting teachers that's not possible right i'm just asking for the big parameters so we know that at two million, we're going to have to be cutting teachers. I mean, it doesn't mean teachers, staff. Staff. Okay, I just want to know what we're talking about. And I'm I'm not sure I agree with you, Natalia, that um, classroom consolidation, like David's talking about, means that we don't add two high school teachers. It's a no. I'm saying if if I don't want them to suggest we cut two high school teachers and add two high school teachers, that's the, what I'm saying. Like, okay, got it. Yeah. <laughs> Susan, do you feel like you have an, um, a sense of the committee's direction and you can proceed for the 14th? Yes. Yes. Perfect. I think we're all done then, right? With this section? Yes, we are. With this section, but not for the night. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't start it. We, we're, going to, we're, we're going to have it very abbreviated, but we did have some earlier questions about current superintendent priorities, and Dr. Guillory is ready to answer that. So we'll, we'll go through it quickly. We're getting there, almost there, Helen. Remember, David, a few years ago, make... we used to regularly go this late. <laughs> David, could I withdraw my question and could we put this on next week instead? I don't think that, that I don't feel sure. like, I don't feel like yeah. my questions are gonna be, that I'm gonna absorb the question, the answer to the question at 11.45 at night, nor do I expect anyone else will be as engaged. I really hope I we can we, push this it, to next week. Let's leave it, to, we're meeting next week, right? Mm -hmm. Or the week after. Or whatever it is, the weekend. I don't know. All right. Uh, so Dr. Gettery is fine with pushing it out to our next meeting. Are you okay with that, Lance? You yeah, sure? Okay. All right. That brings us to subcommittee and liaison reports. Unless someone has something really urgent, I suggest we move through that quickly. All right. Any new business? I don't see any new business. And we do not have need for executive session. So we are adjourned. Recording stopped.